Book Eight, Chapters One through Six, Volume One of Le Morte d'Arthur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Catherine Fitz. Le Morte d'Arthur, Volume One, by Sir Thomas Mallory. Book Eight, Chapters One through Six. Chapter One. It was a king that hight Meliodas, and he was lord and king of the country of Leonis. And this Meliodas was a likely knight, as was any that time living. And by fortune he wedded King Mark's sister of Cornwall, and she was called Elizabeth, that was called both good and fair. And at that time King Arthur reigned, and he was whole king of England, Wales, and Scotland, and of many other realms. Howbeit there were many kings that were lords of many countries, but all they held their lands of King Arthur. For in Wales were two kings, and in the north were many kings, and in Cornwall and in the west were two kings. Also in Ireland were two or three kings, and all were under the obeisance of King Arthur. So was the king of France, and the king of Brittany, and all the lordships unto Rome. So when this king Meliodas had been with his wife, within a while she waxed great with child, and she was a full meek lady, and well she loved her lord, and he her again, so there was great joy betwixt them. Then there was a lady in that country that had loved King Meliodas long, and by no means she could never get his love. Therefore she let ordain upon a day, as King Meliodas rode a-hunting, for he was a great chaser, and thereby an enchantment she made him chase and hart by himself alone, till that he came to an old castle, and there anon he was taken prisoner by that lady that him loved. When Elizabeth, King Meliodas' wife, missed her lord, and she was nigh out of her wit, and also as great with child as she was, she took a gentlewoman with her, and ran into the forest to seek her lord. And when she was far in the forest she might know further, for she began to travail fast of her child. And she had many grimly throes, her gentlewoman helped her all that she might, and so by miracle of Our Lady of Heaven she was delivered with great pains. But she had taken such cold for the default of help that deep draughts of death took her, that she must need die and depart out of this world. There was none other boat. And when this Queen Elizabeth saw that there was none other boat, then she made great dole, and said unto her gentlewoman, When ye see my lord King Meliodas, recommend me unto him, and tell him what pains I endure here for his love, and how I must die here for his sake for default of good help and let him wit that I am full sorry to depart out of this world from him. Therefore pray him to be friend to my soul. Now let me see my little child, for whom I have had all this sorrow. And when she saw him, she said thus, Ah, my little son, thou hast murdered thy mother, and therefore I suppose that thou art a murderer so young, thou art full likely to be a manly man in thine age. And because I shall die of the birth of thee, I charge thee, gentlewoman, that thou pray my lord, King Meliodas, that when he is christened, let call him Tristram, that is as much to say as a sorrowful birth. And therewith this queen gave up the ghost and died. Then the gentlewoman laid her under an umber of a great tree, and then she lapped the child as well as she might for cold. Right so there came the barons, following after the queen, and when they saw that she was dead, and understood none other but the king was destroyed, then certain of them would have slain the child, because they would have been lords of the country of Leonis. Chapter 2 But then through the fair speech of the gentlewoman, and by the means that she made, the most part of the barons would not assent thereto, and then they let carry home the dead queen, and much dole was made for her. Then this meanwhile Merlin delivered King Meliodas out of prison, on the morn after his queen was dead. And so when the king was came home, the most part of his barons made great joy, but the sorrow that the king made for his queen that might no tongue tell. So then the king let inter her richly, and after he let christen his child as his wife had commanded afore her death. And then he let call him Tristram, the sorrowful-born child. Then the king Meliodas endured seven years without a wife, and all this time Tristram was nourished well. Then it befell that king Meliodas wedded king Howell's daughter of Brittany, and anon she had children of king Meliodas. Then she was heavy and wroth that her children should not rejoice the country of Leonis. Wherefore this queen ordained for to poison young Tristram. So she let poison be put in a piece of silver in the chamber, whereas Tristram and her children were together, 
unto that intent that when Tristram was thirsty he should drink that drink. And so it fell upon a day, the queen's son, as he was in that chamber, espied the piece with the poison, and he weaned it had been good drink, and because the child was thirsty he took the piece with poison and drank freely, and therewithal suddenly the child brassed and was dead. When the queen of Meliodas wist of the death of her son, wit ye well that she was heavy, but yet the king understood nothing of her treason. Notwithstanding, the queen would not leave this, but eft she let ordain more poison, and put it in a piece. And by fortune, King Meliodas, her husband, found the piece with wine where was the poison. And he that was much thirsty took the piece for to drink thereout. And as he would have drunken thereof, the queen espied him, and then she ran unto him, and pulled the piece from him suddenly. The king marvelled why she did so, and remembered him how her son was suddenly slain with poison. And then he took her by the hand, and said, Thou false traitress, thou shalt tell me what manner of drink this is, or else I shall slay thee. And therewith he pulled out his sword, and swore a great oath that he should slay her, but if she told him truth. Ah, mercy, my lord, said she, and I shall tell you all. And then she told him why she would have slain Tristram, because her children should rejoice his land. Well, said King Meliodas, and therefore shall ye have the law. And so she was condemned by the assent of the barons to be burnt, and then was there made a great fire, and right as she was at the fire to take her execution, young Tristram kneeled afore King Meliodas, and besought him to give him a boon. I will well, said the king again. Then said young Tristram, Give me the life of their queen, my stepmother. That is unrightfully asked, said King Meliodas, for thou art of right to hate her, for she would have slain thee with that poison, and she might have had her will. And for thy sake most is my cause that she should die. Sir, said Tristram, as for that, I beseech you of your mercy that you will forgive it her, and as for my part, God forgive it her, and I do. And so much it liked your highness to grant me my boon, for God's love I require you, hold your promise. Sith and it is so, said the king, I will that ye have her life. Then said the king, I give her to you, and go ye to the fire and take her, and do with her what ye will. So Sir Tristram went to the fire, and by the commandment of the king delivered her from the death. But after that King Meliodas would never have ado with her, as at bed and board. But by the good means of young Tristram he made the king and her accorded. But then the king would not suffer young Tristram to abide no longer in his court. CHAPTER Three, And then he let ordain a gentleman that was well learned and taught. His name was Governail, and then he sent young Tristram with Governail into France to learn the language, and nurture, and deeds of arms. And there was Tristram more than seven years. And then, when he well could speak the language, and had learned all that he might learn in that country, then he came home to his father, King Meliodas, again. And so Tristram learned to be a harper, passing all other that there was none such called in no country, and so on harping and on instruments of music he applied him in his youth for to learn. And after, as he grew in might and strength, he laboured ever in hunting and in hawking, so that never gentleman more that ever we read of. And as the book saith, he began good measures of blowing of beasts of venery, and beasts of chase, and all manner of vermin, and all these terms we have yet of hawking and hunting and therefore the book of venery, of hawking, and hunting, is called the book of Sir Tristram. Wherefore, as me seemeth, all gentlemen that bear old arms ought of right to honour Sir Tristram, for the goodly terms that gentlemen have and use, and shall to the day of doom, that thereby, in a manner all men of worship may dissever a gentleman from a yeoman, and from a yeoman a villain. For he that gentle is will draw him unto gentle tatches, and follow the customs of noble gentlemen." Thus Sir Tristram endured in Cornwall, until he was big and strong, of the age of eighteen years. And then the king Meliodas had great joy of Sir Tristram, and so had the queen, his wife. For ever after in her life, because Sir Tristram saved her from the fire, she did never hate him more after, but loved him ever after, and gave Tristram many great gifts. For every estate loved him, where that he went. CHAPTER Four. Then it befell that King Anguish of Ireland sent unto King Mark of Cornwall for his truage, that Cornwall had paid many winters. And all that time King Mark was behind of the truage for seven years. And King Mark and his barons gave unto the messenger of Ireland these words in answer, that they would none pay, 
and bade the messenger go unto his king Anguish, and tell him, We will pay him no truage, but tell your lord, and he will always have truage of us at Cornwall. Bid him send a trusty knight of his land, that will fight for his right, and we shall find another for to defend our right. With this answers the messengers departed into Ireland. And when King Anguish understood the answer of the messengers, he was wonderly wroth. And then he called unto him Sir Marhaus, the good knight, that was nobly proved, and a knight of the table round. And this Marhaus was brother unto the Queen of Ireland. Then the king said thus, Fair brother, Sir Marhaus, I pray you go into Cornwall for my sake, and do battle for our truage that of right we ought to have. And what ever you spend, ye shall have sufficiently, more than ye shall need. Sir, said Marhaus, wit ye well that I shall not be loath to do battle in the right of you and your land with the best knight of the table round. For I know them, for the most part, what be their deeds. And for to advance my deeds, and to increase my worship, I will right gladly go unto this journey for our right. So in all haste there was made purveyance for Sir Marhaus, and he had all things that to him needed. And so he departed out of Ireland, and arrived up in Cornwall even fast by the castle of Tintagel. And when King Mark understood that he was there arrived to fight for Ireland, then made King Mark great sorrow when he understood that the good and noble knight Sir Marhaus was come. For they knew no knight that durst have ado with him. For at that time Sir Marhaus was called one of the famousest and renowned knights of the world. And thus Sir Marhaus abode in the sea and every day he sent unto King Mark for to pay the truage that was behind of seven year, other else to find a knight to fight with him for the truage. This manner of message Sir Marhaus sent daily unto King Mark. Then they of Cornwall let make cries in every place, that what knight would fight for to save the truage of Cornwall, he should be rewarded so that he should fare the better term of his life. Then some of the barons said to King Mark, and counselled him to send to the court of King Arthur, for to seek Sir Launcelot du Lake, that was at that time named for the marvellous knight of all the world. Then there were some other barons that counselled the king not to do so, and said that it was labour in vain, because Sir Marhaus was a knight of the round table. Therefore any of them will be loath to have ado with other. But if it were any knight at his own request would fight disguised and unknown. So the king and all his barons assented that it was no boat to seek any knight of the round table. This meanwhile came the language and the noises unto King Meliodas, how that Sir Marhaus abode battle fast by Tintagel, and how King Mark could find no manner of knight to fight for him. When young Tristram heard of this, he was wroth, and sore ashamed that there durst no knight in Cornwall to have ado with Sir Marhaus of Ireland. CHAPTER V. Therewithal Tristram went unto his father, King Meliodas, and asked him counsel what was best to do for to recover Cornwall from Truage. For, as me seemeth, said Sir Tristram, it were shame that Sir Marhaus, the queen's brother of Ireland, should go away unless that he were foughten withal. As for that, said King Meliodas, wit ye well, son Tristram, that Sir Marhaus is called one of the best knights of the world, and knight of the table round, and therefore I know no knight in this country that is able to match with him. Alas, said Sir Tristram, that I am not made knight, and if Sir Marhaus should thus depart into Ireland, God let me never have worship, and I were made knight, I should match him. And, sir, said Tristram, I pray you, give me leave to ride to King Mark, and so ye not be displeased, of King Mark will I be made knight. I will well, said King Meliodas, that ye be ruled as your courage will rule you. Then Sir Tristram thanked his father much, and then he made him ready to ride into Cornwall. In the meanwhile there came a messenger with letters of love from F King Faramon of France's daughter unto Sir Tristram. There were full piteous letters, and in them were written many complaints of love. But Sir Tristram had no joy of her letters, nor regard unto her. Also she sent him a little brachet that was passing fair. But when the king's daughter understood that Sir Tristram would not love her, as the book saith, she died for sorrow and then the same squire that brought the letter and the brachet came again unto Sir Tristram, as ye shall after hear in the tale. So this young Sir Tristram rode unto his eme, King Mark of Cornwall, and when he came there, he heard say that there would no knight fight with Sir Marhaus. Then yeed Sir Tristram unto his eme, and said, Sir, 
if ye will give me the order of knighthood, I will do battle with Sir Marhaus. What are ye, said the king, and from whence be ye come? Sir, said Tristram, I come from King Meliodas that wedded your sister, and a gentleman wit ye well I am. King Mark beheld Sir Tristram, and saw that he was but a young man of age, but he was passingly well made and big. Fair sir, said the king, what is your name, and where were ye born? Sir, said he again, my name is Tristram, and in the country of Leonis I was born. Ye say well, said the king, and if ye will do this battle I shall make you knight. Therefore I come to you, said Sir Tristram, and for no other cause. But then King Mark made him knight, and therewithal, anon as he had made him knight, he sent a messenger unto Sir Marhaus with letters that said that he had found a young knight, ready for to take the battle to his uttermost. It may well be, said Sir Marhaus, but tell King Mark I will not fight with no knight, but he be of blood royal, that is to say, other king's son, other queen's son, born of a prince or princess. When King Mark understood that, he sent for Sir Tristram de Leonis, and told him what was the answer of Sir Marhaus. Then said Sir Tristram, Sithen that he say so, let him wit that I am come of father side and mother side, of his noble blood as he is, for, sir, now ye shall know that I am King Meliodas' son, born of your own sister, Dame Elizabeth, that died in the forest in the birth of me. O Jesus, said King Mark, ye are welcome, fair nephew, to me. Then in all the haste the king let horse Sir Tristram, and armed him in the best manner that might be had or gotten for gold or silver. And then King Mark sent unto Sir Marhaus, and did to him wit that a better-born man than he was himself should fight with him and his name is Sir Tristram de Milionis, gotten of King Meliodas, and born of King Mark's sister. Then was Sir Marhaus glad and bleef that he should fight with such a gentleman. And so by the assent of King Mark, and of Sir Marhaus, they let ordain that they should fight within an island, nigh Sir Marhaus' ships. And so was Sir Tristram put into a vessel, both his horse and he, and all that to him longed both for his body and for his horse. Sir Tristram lacked nothing. And when King Mark and his barons of Cornwall beheld how young Sir Tristram departed with such a carriage to fight for the right of Cornwall, there was neither man nor woman of worship, but they wept to see and understand so young a knight to jeopardy himself for their right. CHAPTER six. So, to shorten this tale, when Sir Tristram was arrived within the island, he looked to the farther side and there he saw at anchor six ships nigh to the land, and under the shadow of the ships upon the land there hoved the noble knight, Sir Marhaus of Ireland. Then Sir Tristram commanded his servant, Gouvernail, to bring his horse to the land, and dress his harness at all manner of rites. And then, when he had done so, he mounted upon his horse, and when he was in his saddle well apparelled, and his shield dressed upon his shoulder, Tristram asked Gouvernail, where is this knight that I shall have ado withal? Sir, said Gouvernail, see him not? I weened he had seen him. Yonder he hoveth under the umber of his ships on horseback, with his spear in his hand, and his shield upon his shoulder. That is truth, said the noble knight, Sir Tristram. Now I see him well enough. Then he commanded his servant, Gouvernail, to go to his vessel again, and commend me unto mine eme, King Mark, and pray him, if that I be slain in this battle, for to inter my body as him seemed best. And as for me, let him wit that I will never yield me for cowardice, and if I be slain and flee not, then they have lost no truage for me. And if so be that I flee or yield me as recreant, bid mine eem never to bury me in Christian burials. And upon thy life, said Sir Tristram to Gouvernail, Come thou not nigh this island, till that thou see me overcome or slain, or else that I win yonder knight. So either departed from other, sore weeping. End of Book 8, Chapters 1 through 6 Recording by Catherine Fitz, Davis, California Book Eight, Chapters Seven through Eleven, Volume One of Le Morte d'Arthur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine Fitz. Le Mort d'Arthur, Volume 1, by Sir Thomas Mallory. Book 8, Chapter 7. And then Sir Marhaus advised Sir Tristram, and said thus, Young knight, Sir Tristram, what dost thou here? Me sore repenteth of thy courage, for wit thou well I have been assayed, and the best knights of this land have been assayed of my hand. And also I have matched with the best knights of the world, and therefore by my counsel return again unto thy vessel. And, fair knight, and well-proved knight, said Sir Tristram, thou shalt well wit I may not forsake thee in this quarrel, for I am for thy sake made knight. And thou shalt well wit that I am a king's son born, and gotten upon a queen, and such promise I have made at my uncle's request, and mine own seeking, that I shall fight with thee unto the uttermost, and deliver Cornwall from the old Truish. And also wit thou well, Sir Marhaus, that this is the greatest cause that thou couragest me to have ado with thee, for thou art called one of the most renowned knights of the world, and because of that noise and fame that thou hast, thou givest me courage to have ado with thee, for never yet was I proved with good knight. And sith and I took the order of knighthood this day, I am well pleased that I may have ado with so good a knight as thou art. And now wit thou well, Sir Marhaus, that I cast me to get worship on thy body. And if that I not be proved, I trust to God that I shall be worshipfully proved upon thy body, and to deliver the country of Cornwall for ever from all manner of truish, from Ireland for ever. When Sir Marhaus had heard him say what he would, he said then thus again, Fair knight, sith then it is so that thou castest to win worship of me, I let thee wit worship may thou none lose by me, if thou mayst stand me three strokes. For I let thee wit for my noble deeds, proved and seen, King Arthur made me knight of the table round. Then they began to future their spears, and they met so fiercely together that they smote either other down, both horse and all. But Sir Marhaus smote Sir Tristram a great wound in the side, with his spear. And then they avoided their horses, and pulled out their swords, and threw their shields afore them. And then they lashed together, as men that were wild and courageous. And when they had stricken together so long, then they left their strokes, and foined at their breaths and visors. And when they saw that that might not prevail them, then they hurtled together like rams, to bear either other down. Thus they fought still more than half a day, and either were wounded passing sore, that the blood ran down freshly from them upon the ground. By then Sir Tristram waxed more fresher than Sir Marhaus, and better winded and bigger, and with a mighty stroke he smote Sir Marhaus upon the helm such a buffet that it went through his helm, and through the coif of steel, and through the brain-pan, and the sword stuck so fast in the helm and in his brain-pan that Sir Tristram pulled thrice at his sword, or ever he might pull it out from his head. And there Marhaus fell down upon his knees, the edge of Tristram's sword left in his brain-pan. And suddenly Sir Marhaus rose groveling, and threw his sword and his shield from him, and so ran to his ships and fled his way. And Sir Tristram had ever his shield and sword. And when Sir Tristram saw Sir Marhaus withdraw him, he said, Ah, Sir Knight of the Round Table, why withdrawest thou? Thou dost thyself and thy kin great shame, for I am but a young knight, or now I was never proved, and rather than I should withdraw me from thee, I had rather been hewn in a hundred pieces. Sir Marhaus answered no word, but yeed his way, sore groaning. Well, Sir Knight, said Sir Tristram, I promise thee thy sword and thy shield shall be mine, and thy shield shall I wear in all places where I ride on mine adventures and in the sight of King Arthur, and all the round table. CHAPTER Eight. Anon Sir Marhaus and his fellowship departed into Ireland, and as soon as he came to the king, his brother, he let search his wounds, and when his head was searched, a piece of Sir Tristram's sword was found therein, and might never be had out of his head for no surgeons, and so he died of Sir Tristram's sword. And that piece of sword the queen, his sister, kept it for ever with her, for she thought to be revenged, and she might. Now we turn again unto Sir Tristram, that was sore wounded, and full sore bled that he might not within a little while, when he had taken cold, aneath stir him of his limbs. And then he set him down softly upon a little hill, and bled fast. 
Then anon came Gouvernail, his man, with his vessel, and the king and his barons came with procession against him. And when he was come unto the land, King Mark took him in his arms, and the king and Sir Dinas the seneschal led Sir Tristram into the castle of Tintagil. And then he was searched in the best manner, and laid in his bed. And when King Mark saw his wounds, he wept heartily, and so did all his lords. So God me help, said King Mark, I would not for all my lands that my nephew died. So Sir Tristram lay there a month and more, and ever he was like to die of that stroke that Sir Marhaus smote him first with the spear. For, as the French book saith, the spear's head was envenomed, that Sir Tristram might not be whole. Then was King Mark and all his barons passing heavy, for they deemed none other but that Sir Tristram should not recover. Then the king let send after all manner of leeches and surgeons, both unto men and women, and there was none that would behold him the life. Then came there a lady that was a right wise lady, and she said plainly unto King Mark, and to Sir Tristram, and to all his barons, that he should never be whole, but if Sir Tristram went in the same country that the venom came from, and in that country should he be holpen or else never. Thus said the lady unto the king. When King Mark understood that, he let purvey for Sir Tristram a fair vessel, well victualled, and therein was put Sir Tristram, and Gouvernail with him. And Sir Tristram took his harp with him, and so he was put into the sea to sail into Ireland. And so by good fortune he arrived up in Ireland, even fast by a castle where the king and the queen was. And at his arrival he sat and harped in his bed a merry lay, such a one they heard never none in Ireland before that time. And when it was told the king and queen of such a knight that was such an harper, anon the king sent for him, and let search his wounds, and then asked him his name. Then he answered, I am of the country of Leonis, and my name is Tramtrist, that was thus wounded in a battle as I fought for a lady's right. So God me help, said King Anguish, ye shall have all the help in this land that ye may have here. But I let you wit, in Cornwall I had a great loss as ever had king, for there I lost the best knight of the world. His name was Marhaus, a full noble knight, and knight of the table round. And there he told Sir Tristram wherefore Sir Marhaus was slain. Sir Tristram made semblant as he had been sorry, and better knew he how was it than the king. CHAPTER Nine. Then the king, for great favour, made Tramtris to be put in his daughter's ward in keeping, because she was a noble surgeon. And when she had searched him, she found in the bottom of his wound that therein was poison, and so she healed him within a while, and therefore Tramtrist cast great love to La Belle Isode, for she was at that time the fairest maid and lady of the world. And there Tramtrist learned her to harp, and she began to have a great fantasy unto him. And at that time Sir Palamedes, the Saracen, was in that country, and well cherished with the king and the queen. And every day Sir Palamedes drew unto La Belle Isode, and proffered her many gifts, for he loved her passingly well. All that espied Tramtrist, and full well he knew Sir Palamedes for a noble knight and a mighty man. And wit you well, Sir Tramtrist had great despite at Sir Palamedes, for La Belle Isode told Tramtrist that Palamedes was in will to be christened for her sake. Thus there was great envy betwixt Tramtrist and Sir Palamedes. Then it befell that King Anguish let cry a great jousts, and a great tournament for a lady that was called the Lady of the Lawns, and she was nigh cousin unto the king. And what man won her, three days after he should wed her, and have all her lands. This cry was made in England, Wales, Scotland, and also in France and in Brittany. It befell upon a day La Belle Isode came unto Sir Tramtrist, and told him of this tournament. He answered and said, Fair lady, I am but a feeble knight, and but late I had been dead had not your good ladyship been. Now, fair lady, what would ye I should do in this matter? Well ye wot, my lady, that I may not joust. Ah, Tramtrist, said La Belle Isode, why will ye not have ado at that tournament? Well, I wot Sir Palamedes shall be there, and to do what he may. And therefore, Tramtrist, I pray for you to be there, for else Sir Palamedes is like to win the degree. Madam, said Tramtrist, as for that, it may be so, for he is a proved knight, and I am but a young knight and late maid, and the first battle that I did it mishapped me to be sore wounded as ye see. 
but an I wist you would be my better lady, at that tournament I will be, so that you will keep my counsel, and let no creature have knowledge that I shall joust but yourself. And such as ye will to keep your counsel, my poor person I shall jeopard there for your sake, that peradventure Sir Palamedes shall know when that I come. There too, said La Belle Isode, do your best, and as I can, said La Belle Isode, I shall purvey horse and armour for you at my device. As ye will, so be it, said Sir Tramtrist, I will be at your commandment. So, at the day of jousts, there came Sir Palamedes with a black shield, and he overthrew many knights, that all the people had marvel of him. For he put to the worst Sir Gawain, Geharis, Agravain, Bagdemagus, Kay, Dodinus le Sauvage, Sagramor le Desiris, Gumeret le Petit, and Griflet le Fils de Dieu. All these the first day Sir Palamedes struck down to the earth. And then all manner of knights were adread of Sir Palamedes, and many called him the Knight with the Black Shield. So that day Sir Palamedes had great worship. Then came King Anguish unto Tramtrist, and asked him why he would not joust. Sir, he said, I was but late hurt, and as yet I dare not adventure me. Then came there the same squire that was sent from the king's daughter of France unto Sir Tristram. And when he had espied Sir Tristram, he fell flat to his feet. All that espied La Belle Isolde, what courtesy the squire made unto Sir Tristram. And therewithal, suddenly Sir Tristram ran unto his squire, whose name was Hebes Lyrinomus, and prayed him heartily, in no wise, to tell his name. Sir, said Hebes, I will not discover your name, but if ye command me. CHAPTER Ten. Then Sir Tristram asked him what he did in those countries. Sir, he said, I came hither with Sir Gawain for to be made knight, and if it please you, of your hands that I may be made knight. Await upon me as to mourn secretly, and in the field I shall make you a knight. Then had La Belle Isoud great suspicion unto Tramtrist that he was some man of worship proved, and therewith she comforted herself, and cast more love unto him than she had done to fore. And so, on the morn, Sir Palamedes made him ready to come into the field, as he did at the first day. And there he smote down the king with the hundred knights, and the king of Scots. Then had La Belle Isoud ordained and well arrayed Sir Tristram in white horse and harness. And right so she let put him out at a privy postern. And so he came into the field, as it had been a bright angel. And anon Sir Palamedes espied him. And therewith he futured a spear unto Sir Tramtrist, and he again unto him. And there Sir Tristram smote down Sir Palamedes unto the earth. And then there was a great noise of people. Some said Sir Palamedes had a fall. Some said the knight with the black shield had a fall. And wit ye well, La Belle Isoude was passing glad. And then Sir Gawain and his fellows nine had marvel what knight it might be that had smitten down Sir Palamedes. Then would there none joust with Tramtrist, but all that were there forsook him most and least. Then Sir Tristram made Hebes a knight, and caused him to put himself forth, and did right well that day. So after Sir Hebes held him with Sir Tristram. And when Sir Palamedes had received this fall, wit ye well that he was sore ashamed, and as privily as he might he withdrew him out of the field. All that espied Sir Tristram, and lightly he rode after Sir Palamedes, and overtook him and bade him turn, for better he would assay him, or ever he departed. Then Sir Palamedes turned him, and either lashed out at other with their swords. But at the first stroke Sir Tristram smote down Palamedes, and gave him such a stroke upon the head that he fell to the earth. So then Tristram bade yield him, and do his commandment, or else he would slay him. When Sir Palamedes beheld his countenance, he dread his buffets so that he granted all his askings. Well said, said Sir Tristram, this shall be your charge. First, upon pain of your life, that ye forsake my lady La Belle Isode, and in no manner wise that ye draw not to her. Also, this twelve month and a day, that ye bear none armour nor harness of war. Now promise me this, or here shall thou die. Alas, said Sir Palamedes, for ever I am ashamed. Then he sware as Sir Tristram had commanded him. Then, for despite and anger, Sir Palamedes cut off his harness and threw them away. And so Sir Tristram turned again to the castle where was La Belle Isoude, and by the way he met with a damosel that asked after Sir Launcelot, that won the dolorous guard worshipfully. 
and this damosel asked Sir Tristram what he was. For it was told her that it was he that smote down Sir Palamedes, by whom the ten knights of King Arthur's were smitten down. Then the damosel prayed Sir Tristram to tell her what he was, and whether that he were Sir Launcelot du Lake, for she deemed that there was no knight in the world might do such deeds of arms, but if it were Launcelot. Fair damosel, said Sir Tristram, wit ye well that I am not Sir Launcelot, for I was never of such prowess. But in God is all, that he may make me as good a knight as the good knight Sir Launcelot. Now, gentle knight, said she, put up thy visor. And, when she beheld his visage, she thought she never saw a better man's visage, nor a better faring knight. And then, when the damosel knew certainly that he was not Sir Launcelot, then she took her leave, and departed from him. And then Sir Tristram rode privily unto the postern, where kept him La Belle Isoud, and there she made him good cheer, and thanked God of his good speed. So anon, within a while the king and the queen understood that it was Tramtris that smote down Sir Palamedes. Then he was much made of, more than he was before. CHAPTER Eleven. Thus was Sir Tramtrist long there well cherished with the king and the queen, and namely with La Belle Isoud. So upon a day the queen and La Belle Isoud made a bane for Sir Tramtrist. And when he was in his bane, the queen and Isoud, her daughter, roamed up and down in the chamber. And therewhiles Gouvernail and Habes attended on Sir Tramtrist. And the queen beheld his sword there as it lay on the bed. And then by unhap the queen drew out his sword and beheld it a long while. And they both thought it a passing fair sword, but within a foot and half of the point there was a great piece thereof outbroken of the edge. And when the queen espied that gap in the sword, she remembered her of a piece of a sword that was found in the brain-pan of Sir Marhouse, the good knight that was her brother. Alas, then, she said unto her daughter, La Belle Isoud, this is the same traitor knight that slew my brother, thine eme. When Isoud heard her say so, she was passing sore abashed, for passing well she loved Tramtrist, and full well she knew the cruelness of her mother the queen. Anon therewithal the queen went unto her own chamber, and sought her coffer, and there she took out the piece or the sword that was pulled out of Sir Marhouse's head after that he was dead. And then she ran with that piece of iron to the sword that lay upon the bed. And when she put that piece of steel and iron unto the sword, it was as meet as it might have been when it was new broken. And then the queen gripped that sword in her hand fiercely, and with all her might she ran straight upon Tramtrist, where he sat in his bane. And there she had rived him through, had not Sir Habes gotten her in his arms, and pulled the sword from her, and else she had thrust him through. Then, when she was led of her evil will, she ran to the king Anguish, her husband, and said on her knees, O oh, my lord, here have ye in your house that traitor knight that slew my brother and your servant, that noble knight Sir Marhouse. Who is that? said King Anguish, and where is he? Sir, she said, it is Sir Tramtrist, the same knight that my daughter healed. Alas, said the king, therefore I am right heavy, for he is a full noble knight as ever I saw in field. But I charge you, said the king to the queen, that ye not have ado with that knight, but let me deal with him. Then the king went into the chamber unto Sir Tramtrist, and then was he gone unto his chamber, and the king found him already armed to mount upon his horse. When the king saw him already armed to go unto horseback, the king said, Nay, Tramtrist, it will not avail to compare thee against me. But thus much I shall do for my worship and for thy love, in so much as thou art within my court, it were no worship for me to slay thee. Therefore, upon this condition I will give thee leave for to depart from this court in safety, so thou wilt tell me who was thy father, and what is thy name, and if thou slew Sir Marhaus my brother. End of Book 8 Chapters 7 through 11 Recording by Catherine Fitz, Davis, California Book 8, Chapters 12 through 16, Volume 1, Le Mort d'Arthur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine Fitz. Le Mort d'Arthur, Volume 1, by Sir Thomas Mallory. Book 8, Chapter 12. 
Sir, said Tristram, now I shall tell you all the truth. My father's name is Sir Meliodas, king of Leonis, and my mother hight Elizabeth, that was sister unto Mark of Cornwall. And my mother died of me in the forest, and because thereof she commanded, or she died, that when I were christened they should christen me Tristram. And because I would not be known in this country, I turned my name, and let me call Tramtrist. And for the truage of Cornwall I fought for my eames' sake, and for the right of Cornwall that ye had possessed many years. And wit ye well, said Tristram unto the king, I did the battle for the love of mine uncle, King Mark, and for the love of the country of Cornwall, and for to increase mine honour. For that same day that I fought with Sir Marhaus, I was made knight, and never or then did I battle with no knight, and he from me went alive, and left his shield and his sword behind. So God me help, said the king, I may not say but ye did as a knight should, and it was your part to do so for your quarrel, and to increase your worship as a knight should, howbeit, I may not maintain you in this country with my worship, unless that I should displease my barons, my wife and her kin. Sir, said Tristram, I thank you of your good lordship that I have had with you here, and the great goodness my lady, your daughter, hath showed me. And therefore, said Sir Tristram, it may so happen that ye shall win more by my life than by my death, for in the parts of England it may happen that I would do you service at some season, that ye shall be glad that ye ever shewed me your good lordship. With more I promise you, as I am true knight, that in all places I shall be my lady your daughter's servant, and knight in right and wrong, and I shall never fail her, to do as much as a knight may do. Also I beseech your good grace that I may take my leave at my lady your daughter, and at all the barons and knights. I will well, said the king. Then Sir Tristram went to La Belle Isode, and took his leave of her, and then he told her all, what he was, and how he had changed his name because he would not be known, and how a lady told him that he should never be whole till he came unto this country where the poison was made, wherethrough I was near my death had not your ladyship been. O oh, gentle knight, said La Belle Isode, full woe I am of thy departing, for I never saw man that I owed so good will to. And therewithal she wept heartily. Madam, said Sir Tristram, ye shall understand that my name is Sir Tristram de Leonis, gotten of King Meliodas, and born of his queen. And I promise you faithfully, that I shall be all the days of my life your knight. Gramercy, said La Belle Isode, and I promise you there against that I shall not be married this seven years but by your assent. And to whom that ye will, I shall be married, to him will I have. And he will have me, if he will consent. And then Sir Tristram gave her a ring, and she gave him another. And therewith he departed from her, leaving her making great dole and lamentation. And he straight went unto the court among all the barons, and there he took his leave at most and least, and openly he said among them all, Fair lords, now it is so that I must depart. If there be any man here that I have offended unto, or that any man be with me grieved, let him complain here afore me, or that I ever depart, and I shall amend it unto my power. And if there be any that will proffer me wrong, or say of me wrong or shame behind my back, say it now or never, and here is my body to make it good, body against body. And all they stood still, there was not one that would say one word. Yet there were some knights that were of the queen's blood, and of Sir Marhaus' blood, but they would not meddle with him. CHAPTER Thirteen. So Sir Tristram departed, and took the sea, and with good wind he arrived up at Tintagel in Cornwall. And when King Mark was whole in his prosperity, there came tidings that Sir Tristram was arrived, and whole of his wounds. Thereof was King Mark passing glad, and so were all the barons. And when he saw his time, he rode unto his father, King Meliodas, and there he had all the cheer that the king and queen could make him. And then largely King Meliodas and his queen departed of their lands and goods to Sir Tristram. Then, by the license of King Meliodas, his father, he returned again unto the court of King Mark, and there he lived in great joy a long time, until at last there befell a jealousy and an unkindness betwixt King Mark and Sir Tristram, for they loved both one lady, and she was an earl's wife that hight Sir Seguardus. And this lady loved Sir Tristram passingly well, and he loved her again, for she was a passing fair lady, and that espied Sir Tristram well. Then King Mark understood that, and was jealous, for King Mark loved her passingly well. So it fell upon a day this lady sent a dwarf unto Sir Tristram, and bade him, as he loved her, that he would be with her the night next following. 
Also she charged you that ye come not to her, but if ye be well armed, for her lover was called a good knight. Sir Tristram answered to the dwarf, Recommend me unto my lady, and tell her I will not fail, but I will bid with her the term she has set me. And with this answer the dwarf departed. And King Mark espied that the dwarf was with Sir Tristram, upon message from Siguarda's wife. Then King Mark sent for the dwarf, and when he was come, he made the dwarf by force to tell him all, why and wherefore he came on message from Sir Tristram. Now said King Mark, Go where thou wilt, and upon pain of death that thou say no word that thou spakest with me. So the dwarf departed from the king. And that same night that the steven was set between Sir Guarda's wife and Sir Tristram, King Mark armed him and made him ready, and took two knights of his council with him. And so he rode afore to abide by the way for to wait on Sir Tristram. And as Sir Tristram came riding upon his way with his spear in his hand, King Mark came hurtling upon him with his two knights suddenly, and all three smote him with their spears, and King Mark hurt Sir Tristram on the breast, right sore. And then Sir Tristram froidered his spear, and smote his uncle King Mark so sore that he rashed him to the earth, and bruised him that he lay still in a swoon, and long it was, or he might ever wield himself. And then he ran to the one knight, and eft to the other, and smote them to the cold earth, that they lay still. And therewithal Sir Tristram rode forth sore wounded to the lady, and found her abiding him at a postern. CHAPTER fourteen, And there she welcomed him fair, and either housed each other in arms, and so she let put his horse up in the best wise, and then she unarmed him. And so they supped lightly, and went to bed with great joy and pleasance, and so in his raging he took no keep of his green wound that King Mark had given him. And so Sir Tristram be bled both the oversheet and the nether, and pillows and head-sheet, and within a while there came one afore that warned her that her lord was near hand within a bow-draught. So she made Sir Tristram to arise, and so he armed him, and took his horse, and so departed. By then was come Siguardus, her lord, and when he found her bed troubled and broken, and went near and beheld it by the candlelight, then he saw that there had lain a wounded knight. Ah, false traitress, he said, why hast thou betrayed me? And therewithal he swang out a sword, and said, but if thou tell me who hath been here, here thou shalt die. Ah, my lord, mercy, said the lady, and held up her hands, saying, Slay me not, and I shall tell you all who hath been here. Tell anon, said Sir Gardus, to me all the truth. Anon for dread, she said, Here was Sir Tristram with me, and by the way, as he came to me ward, he was sore wounded. Ah, false traitress, said Sir Gardus, where is he become? Sir, she said, he is armed, and departed on horseback not yet hence a half a mile. Ye say well, said Sir Gardus. Then he armed him lightly, and gat his horse, and rode after Sir Tristram that rode straight away unto Tingtagel. And within a while he overtook Sir Tristram, and then he bade him turn, false traitor knight. And Sir Tristram anon turned him against him, and therewithal Sir Gardus smote Sir Tristram with a spear that it all to brast. And then he swang out his sword, and smote fast at Sir Tristram. Sir knight, said Sir Tristram, I counsel ye that ye smite no more, howbeit for the wrongs that I have done you, I will forbear you as long as I may. Nay, said Sir Guardas, that shall not be, for either thou shalt die or I. Then Sir Tristram drew out his sword, and hurtled his horse unto him fiercely, and through the waist of the body he smote Sir Guardas, that he fell to the earth in a swoon. And so Sir Tristram departed and left him there. And so he rode into Tintagel, and took his lodging secretly, for he would not be known that he was hurt. Also Sir Seguardus men rode after their master, whom they found lying in the field sore wounded, and brought him home on his shield, and there he lay long or that he were whole, but at last he recovered. Also King Mark would not be unknown of that Sir Tristram and he had met that night, and as for Sir Tristram, he knew not that King Mark had met with him. And so the king askance came to Sir Tristram to comfort him as he lay sick on his bed. But as long as King Mark lived, he loved never Sir Tristram after that, though there was fair speech, love there was none. And thus it passed many weeks and days, and all was forgiven and forgotten, for Sir Seguardas durst not have ado with Sir Tristram because of his noble prowess, and also because he was nephew unto King Mark. Therefore he let it overslip, for he that hath a privy hurt is loath to have a shame outward. CHAPTER fifteen. Then it befell upon a day, that the good knight Bleoberis de Ganis, brother to Blamor de Ganis, 
and nigh cousin to the good knight Sir Launcelot du Lake. This Bleobaris came into the court of King Mark, and there he asked of King Mark a boon, to give him what gift that he would ask in his court. When the king heard him ask so, he marvelled of his asking, but because he was a knight of the round table, and of a great renown, King Mark granted him his whole asking. Then said Sir Bleobaris, I will have the fairest lady in your court that me list to choose. I may not say nay, said King Mark, now choose at your adventure. And so Sir Bleobaris did choose Sir Sigwarda's wife, and took her by the hand, and so went his way with her. And so he took his horse, and Gart set her behind his squire, and rode upon his way. When Sir Sigwardus heard tell that his lady was gone with a knight of King Arthur's court, then he armed him and rode after that knight for to rescue his lady. So when Bleobaris was gone with this lady, King Mark and all the court was wroth that she was away. Then there were certain ladies that knew there were great love between Sir Tristram and her, and also that lady loved Sir Tristram above all other knights. Then there was one lady that rebuked Sir Tristram in the horriblest wise, and called him coward knight, that he would for shame of his knighthood see a lady so shamefully taken away from his uncle's court. But she meant that either of them had loved other with entire heart. But Sir Tristram answered her thus, Fair lady, it is not my part to have ado in such matters while her lord and husband is present here. And if it had been that her lord had not been here in this court, then for the worship of this court, peradventure, I would have been her champion. And if so be, Sir Seguardus speed not well, it may happen that I will speak with that good knight, or ever he pass from this country. Then within a while came one of Sir Seguardus' squires, and told in the court that Sir Seguardus was beaten sore and wounded to the point of death. As he would have rescued his lady, Sir Bleobaris overthrew him, and sore hath wounded him. Then was King Mark heavy thereof, and all the court. When Sir Tristram heard of this, he was ashamed and sore grieved. And then he was soon armed and on horseback, and Gouvernail, his servant, bare his shield and spear. And so, as Sir Tristram rode fast, he met with Sir Andred, his cousin, that by the commandment of King Mark was sent to bring forth, and ever it lay in his power, two knights of Arthur's court that rode by the country to seek their adventures. When Sir Tristram saw Sir Andred, he asked him what tidings. So God help me, said Sir Andred, there was never worse with me, for here, by the commandment of King Mark, I was sent to fetch two knights of King Arthur's court, and that one beat me and wounded me, and set not by my message. Fair cousin, said Sir Tristram, ride on your way, and if I may meet them, it may happen I shall revenge you. So Sir Andred rode into Cornwall, and Sir Tristram rode after the two knights, the one which hight Sagramar le Desiris, and the other hight Dodinus le Sauvage. CHAPTER Sixteen. Then, within a while, Sir Tristram saw afore him two likely knights. Sir, said Gouvernail unto his master, Sir, I would counsel you not to have ado with them, for they be two proved knights of Arthur's court. As for that, said Sir Tristram, have ye no doubt, but I will have ado with them to increase my worship. For as many day, Sith and I did any deeds of arms. Do as ye list, said Gouvernail. And therewithal anon Sir Tristram asked them from whence they came, and whither they would, and what they did in these marches. Sir Sagramor looked upon Sir Tristram, and had scorn of his words, and asked him again, Fair knight, be ye a knight of Cornwall? Whereby ask ye it, said Sir Tristram. For it is seldom seen, said Sir Sagramor, that ye Cornish knights be valiant men of arms. For within these two hours there met one of us your Cornish knights. And great words he spake, and anon with little might he was laid to the earth. And as I trow, said Sir Sagramor, ye shall have the same hansel that he had. Fair lord, said Sir Tristram, it may so happen that I may better withstand than he did. And whether ye will or nill, I will have ado with you, because he was my cousin that ye beat. And therefore here do your best, and wit ye well, but if ye quit you the better here upon this ground, one knight of Cornell shall beat you both. When Sir Dorinus le Sauvage heard him say so, he got a spear in his hand, and said, Sir Knight, keep well thyself. And then they departed, and came together as it had been thunder. And Sir Dorinus' spear brast in sunder, but Sir Tristram smote him with a more might, that he smote him clean over the horse croak, that nigh he had broken his neck. When Sir Sagramor saw his fellow have such a fall, he marvelled what knight he might be, and he dressed his spear with all his might, and Sir Tristram against him, and they came together as the thunder. And there Sir Tristram smote Sir Sagramor a strong buffet, that he bare his horse, and him to the earth. 
and in the falling he brake his thigh. When this was done, Sir Tristram asked him, Fair knights, will ye any more? Be there no bigger knights in the court of King Arthur? It is to you shame to say of us knights in Cornwall dishonour, for it may happen a Cornish knight may match you. That is the truth, said Sir Sagramore, that ye have well proved. But I require thee, said Sir Sagramore, tell us your right name, by the faith and troth that ye owe to the high order of knighthood. Ye charge me with a great thing, said Sir Tristram, and sith in ye list to wit it, you shall know and understand that my name is Sir Tristram de Lyonnes, King Meliodas' son, and nephew unto King Mark. Then were they two knights fain that they had met with Tristram, and so they prayed him to abide in their fellowship. Nay, said Sir Tristram, for I must have ado with one of your fellows. His name is Sir Bleoberus de Ganis. God speed you well, said Sir Sagramore and Dodinus. Sir Tristram departed, and rode onward on his way. And then he was where before him in a valley where rode Sir Bleoberus, with Sir Sigwardus' lady, that rode behind his squire on a palfrey. End of Book 8, Chapters 12 through 16「Book Eight, Chapter Seventeen through Twenty Two, Chapter Seventeen. How Sir Tristram fought with Sir Bleoberus for a lady, and how the lady was put to choice to whom she would go. Then Sir Tristram rode more than a pace until that he had overtaken him. Then spake Sir Tristram, "Abide," he said, "Knight of Arthur's court." Bring again that lady, or deliver her to me. I will do neither, said Bleoberus, for I dread no Cornish knight so sore that me list to deliver her. Why, said Sir Tristram, may not a Cornish knight do as well as another knight? This same day two knights of your court within these three mile met with me, and, or ever we departed, they found a Cornish knight good enough for them both. What were their names? said Bleoberus. They told me, said Sir Tristram, that one of them, Height Sir Sagamore, is desirous. What were their names? said Bleoberus. They told me, said Sir Tristram, that one of them, Height Sir Sagamore, Le Desirous, and the other, Height Dodinas Le Sauvage. Ah, said Sir Bleoberus, have ye met with them? So God me help. They were two good knights, and men of great worship, and if ye have beat them both, ye must needs be a good knight. But if it so be ye have beat them both, yet shall ye not fear me, but ye shall beat me, or ever ye have this lady. Then defend you, said Sir Tristram. So they departed, and came together like thunder and either bear other down, horse and all, to the earth. Then they avoided their horses, and lashed together eagerly with swords, and mightily now tracing and traversing on the right hand, and on the left hand more than two hours. And sometime they rushed together with such great a might that they lay both groveling on the ground. Then Sir Bleoberus, Durganis, stirred aback, and said thus, Now, gentle knight, a while hold your hands, and let us speak together. Say what ye will, said Tristram, and I will answer you. Sir, said Bleoberus, I wit of whence ye be, and of whom ye be come, and what is your name? So God me help, said Sir Tristram, I fear not to tell you my name. Wit ye well, I am King Meliodias' son, and my mother is King Mark's sister, and my name is Sir Tristram de Lyonnes, 
and King Mark is mine uncle. Truly, said Leobaris, I am right glad of you, for ye are he that slew Marhaus the knight, hand for hand in an island, for the truage of Cornwall. Also ye overcame Sir Palamedes the good knight at a tournament in an island, where ye beat Sir Gawain and his nine fellows. So God help me, said Sir Tristram, wit ye well that I am the same knight. Now I have told you my name, tell me yours with good will. Wit ye well that my name is Sir Bleobaris de Ganis, and my brother hight Sir Blamor de Ganis. That is called a good knight, and we be sisters' children unto my lord Sir Lancelot de Lac, that we call one of the best knights of the world. That is truth, said Sir Tristram. Sir Lancelot is called peerless of courtesy and of knighthood. And for his sake, said Sir Tristram, I will not with my good will fight no more with you. For the great love I have to Sir Lancelot du Lac. In good faith, said Leobaris, as for me, I will be loath to fight with you. But sithen ye follow me here to have this lady, I shall proffer you kindness, courtesy, and gentleness, right here upon this ground. This lady shall be betwixt us both, and to whom that she will go, let him have her in peace. I will well, said Tristram, for, as I deem, she will leave you and come to me. Ye shall prove it anon, said Leobaris. Chapter 18 how the lady forsook Sir Tristram, and bode with Sir Bleobaris, and how she desired to go to her husband. So when she was set betwixt them both, she said these words unto Sir Tristram, Wit ye well, Sir Tristram de Lyonnes, that but late thou wast the man in the world that I most loved and trusted, and I weened thou hast loved me again above all ladies. But when thou sawest this knight lead me away, thou madest no cheer to rescue me, but suffered my lord, Seguaridus, right after me. But until that time I weened thou hadst loved me, and therefore now I will leave thee, and never love thee more. And therewithal she went to Sir Bleobaris. When Sir Tristram saw her do so, he was wonderly wroth with that lady, and ashamed to come to the court. Sir Tristram, said Sir Bleobaris, ye are in the default. For I hear by this lady's words, she before this day trusted you above all earthly knights. And, as she saith, ye, ye have deceived her, and wit ye well, there nay, therefore wit ye well, there may no man hold that will away. And rather than ye should be heartily pleased with me, I would ye had her, and she would abide with you. Nay, said the lady, so God me help, I will never go with him. For he that I loved most, I weened he had loved me. And therefore, Sir Tristram, she said, ride as thou came, for though thou hadst overcome this night, as ye was likely, with thee never would I have gone. And I shall pray this knight so fair of his knighthood that, or ever he pass this country, that he will lead me to the abbey where my lord, Sir Seguaridus, lieth. So God me help, said Leobaris. I let you wit, good knight, Sir Tristram, because King Mark gave me the choice of a gift in this court. And so this lady liked me best, notwithstanding she is wedded and hath a lord, and I have fulfilled my quest. She shall, be, she shall be sent unto her husband again, and in especial most for your sake, Sir Tristram. And if she would go with you, I would ye had her. I thank you, said Sir Tristram, but for her love I shall beware what manner a lady I shall love or trust. For had her lord, Sir Seguaridus, been away from the court, I should have been the first that should have followed you. But sithen that ye have refused me, as I am true knight, 
I shall her know passingly well, that I shall love or trust. And so they took their leave, one from the other, and departed. And so Sir Tristram rode unto Tintagel, and Sir Bleoberis rode unto the abbey where Sir Seguerides lay sore wounded, and there he delivered his lady and departed as a noble knight. And when Sir Seguerides saw his lady, he was greatly comforted. And then she told him that Sir Tristram had done great battle with Sir Bleoberis and caused him to bring her again. These words pleased Sir Seguerides right well, that Sir Tristram would do so much. And so that lady told all the battle unto King Mark betwixt Sir Tristram and Sir Bleoberis. Chapter 19 How King Mark sent Sir Tristram for La Ville Isou toward Ireland, and how by fortune he arrived into England. Then when this was done, King Mark cast always in his heart how he might destroy Sir Tristram. And then he imagined in himself to send Sir Tristram into Ireland for La Ville Isou. So, for Sir Tristram had so praised her beauty and her goodness that King Mark said that he would wed her. Whereupon he prayed Sir Tristram to take his way into Ireland for him on message. And all this was done to the intent to slay Sir Tristram. Notwithstanding, Sir Tristram would not refuse the message for no danger nor peril that might fall for the pleasure of his uncle, but to go he made him ready in the most goodliest wise that might be devised. For Sir Tristram took with him the most goodliest knights that he might find in the court, and they were arrayed after the guise that was then used in the goodliest manner. So Sir Tristram departed and took the sea with all his fellowship, and anon as he was in the broad sea a tempest took him and his fellowship, and drove them back into the coast of England, and there they arrived fast by Camelot, and full fain they were to take the land. And when they were landed, Sir Tristram set up his pavilion upon the land of Camelot, and there he let hang his shield upon the pavilion. And that same day came two knights of King Arthur's, that one was Sir Ector de Maris and Sir Morganor. And they touched the shield and bade him come out of the pavilion for to joust, and he would joust. Ye shall be answered, said Sir Tristram, and ye will tarry a little while. So he made him ready, and first he smote down Sir Ector de Maris, and after he smote down Sir Morganor, all with one spear, and sore bruised them. And when they lay upon the earth, they asked Sir Tristram what he was, and of what country he was knight. Fair lords, said Sir Tristram, wit ye well that I am of Cornwall. Alas, said Sir Ector, now I am ashamed that ever any Cornish knight should overcome me. And then for despite Sir Ector put off his armor from him, and went on foot, and would not ride. Chapter 20 how King Anguish of Ireland was summoned to come to King Arthur's court for treason. Then it fell that Sir Bleoberis and Sir Blamor Durganis, that were brethren, they had summoned the King Anguish of Ireland for to come to Arthur's court upon pain of forfeiture of King Arthur's good grace. And if the King of Ireland came not in at the day assigned and set, the king should lose his lands. And so it happened that at the day assigned, King Arthur, neither Sir Lancelot might not be there for to give the judgment, for King Arthur was with Sir Lancelot at the castle Joyous Guard. And so King Arthur assigned King Carados and the King of Scots to be there that day as judges. So when the kings were at Camelot, King Anguish of Ireland was come to know his accusers. Then was there Sir Blamor de Ganis, 
and appealed the King of Ireland of treason. That he had slain a cousin of his in his court in Ireland by treason. The king was sore abashed of his accusation, for why he was come at the summons of King Arthur, and or he came at Camelot, wist not wherefore he was sent after. And when the king heard Sir Blamor say his will, he understood well there was none other remedy but for to answer him knightly. For the custom was such in those days, that an any man were appealed of any treason or murder, he should fight body for body, or else to find another knight for him. And all manner of murders in those days were called treason. So, when King Anguish understood his accusing, he was passing heavy, for he knew Sir Blamor de Ganis, that he was a noble knight, and of noble knights come. Then the king of Ireland was simply purveyed of his answer. Therefore the judges gave him respite by the third day to give his answer. So the king departed unto his lodging. The meanwhile there came a lady by Sir Tristram's pavilion, making great dole. What aileth you, said Sir Tristram, that he make such dole? Ah, oh, fair knight, said the lady, I am ashamed unless that some good knight help me. For a great lady of worship sent by me a fair child, and a rich unto Sir Lancelot du Lac, and hereby there met me with a knight, and threw me down from my palfrey, and took away the child from me. Well, my lady, said Sir Tristram, and for my lord Sir Lancelot's sake, I shall get you that child again, or else I shall be beaten for it. And so Sir Tristram took his horse, and asked the lady which way the knight rode, and then she told him. And he rode after him, and within a while he overtook that knight. And then Sir Tristram bade him turn and give again the child. Chapter 21 how Sir Tristram rescued a child from a knight, and how Gouvernail told him of King Anguish. The knight turned his horse and made him ready to fight. And then Sir Tristram smote him with a sword, such a buffet that he tumbled to the earth. And then he yielded him unto Sir Tristram. Then come thy way, said Sir Tristram, and bring the child to the lady again. So he took his horse meekly and rode with Sir Tristram. And then, by the way, Sir Tristram asked him his name. Then he said, My name is Bruce sans -Pite. So when he had delivered that child to the lady, he said, Sir, as in this the child is well remedied. Then Sir Tristram let him go again. That sore repented him after for he was a great foe unto many good knights of King Arthur's court. Then when Sir Tristram was in his pavilion, Gouvernail, his man, came and told him how the King Anguish of Ireland was come thither, and he was put in great distress, and there Gouvernail told Sir Tristram how King Anguish was summoned and appealed of murder. So God me help, said Sir Tristram, these be the best tidings that ever came to me this seven years, for now shall the King of Ireland have need of my help. For I dare say there is no knight in this country that is not of Arthur's court dare do battle with Sir Blamor de Ganis, and for to win the love of the King of Ireland I will take the battle upon me. And therefore, Gouvernail, bring me, I charge thee, to the king. Then Gouvernail went unto King Anguish of Ireland, and saluted him fair. The king welcomed him, and asked him what he would. Sir, said Gouvernail, there is a knight near hand that desireth to speak with you. He bade me say he would do you service. What knight is he? said the king. Sir, said he, it is Sir Tristram, du Leonès, that for your good grace that ye showed him in your lands will reward you in this country. Come on, fellow, said the king, with me and on, and show me unto Sir Tristram. So the king took a little hackney and but a few fellowship with him, until he came unto Sir Tristram's pavilion. 
And when Sir Tristram saw the king, he ran unto him and would have holden his stirrup. But the king leapt from his horse lightly, and either halsed other in their arms. My gracious lord, said Sir Tristram, Gramercy of your great goodness showed unto me in your marches and lands, and at that time I promised you to do service, and ever it lay in my power. And, gentle knight, said the king unto Sir Tristram, now have I great need of you, never had I so great need of no knight's help. How so, my good lord, said Sir Tristram? I shall tell you, said the king, I am summoned and appealed from my country for the death of a knight that was kin unto the good knight Sir Lancelot. Wherefore, Sir Blamor de Ganis, brother to Sir Bleoberis, hath appealed me to fight with him, Uther, to find a knight in my steed. And well I wot, said the king, these that are come of King Ban's blood, as Sir Lancelot and these other are passing good knights, and hard men for to win in battle as any that I know now living. Sir, said Sir Tristram, for the good lordship ye showed me in Ireland, and for my lady, your daughter's sake, La Belle Isou, I take the battle for you upon this condition, that ye shall grant me two things, that one is that ye shall swear to me that ye are in the right, that ye were never consenting to the knight's death. Sir, then said Sir Tristram, when that I have done this battle, if God give me grace that I speed, that ye shall give me a reward, what thing reasonable that I will ask of you. So God me help, said the king, ye shall have whatsoever ye will ask. It is well said, said Sir Tristram, Chapter 22 How Sir Tristram fought for Sir Anguish, and overcame his adversary, and how his adversary would never yield him. Now make your answer that your champion is ready, for I shall die in your quarrel rather than to be recreant. I have no doubt of you, said the king that, and ye should have ado with Sir Lancelot du Lac. Sir, said Sir Tristram, as for Sir Lancelot, he is called the noblest knight of the world, and wit ye well that the knights of his blood are noble men, and dread shame. And as for Bleoberis, brother unto Sir Blamor, I have done battle with him, and therefore upon my head it is no shame to call him a good knight. It is noise, said the king, that Blamor is the hardier knight. Sir, as for that, let him be. He shall never be refused. And as he were the best knight that now beareth shield or spear. So King Anguish departed unto King Carados and the kings that were at that time his judges, and told them that he had found his champion ready. Then by the commandment of the kings, Sir Blamor de Ganis and Sir Tristram were sent for to hear the charge. And when they were come before the judges, there were many kings and knights beheld Sir Tristram, and much speech they had of him, because that he slew Sir Machaus, the good knight, and because he had for jousted Sir Palamides, the good knight. So when they had taken their charge, they withdrew them to make them ready to do battle. Then said Sir Bleoberis unto his brother Sir Blamor, Fair dear brother, remember of what kin we be come of, and what a man is Sir Lancelot du Lac, neither father nor nearer but brother's children, and there was never none of our kin that ever was shamed in battle, and rather suffered death, brother, than to be shamed. Brothers, said Blamor, have ye no doubt of me? For I shall never shame none of my blood. Howbeit I am sure that yonder knight is called a passing good knight, as of his time one of the world. Yet shall I never yield me, nor say the loath word. 
well may he happen to smite me down with his great might of chivalry, but rather shall he slay me than I shall yield me as recreant. God speed you well, said Sir Bleobaris, for ye shall find him the mightiest knight that ever ye had ado withal. For I know him, for I have had ado with him. God me speed, said Sir Blamor de Ganis, and therewith he took his horse at one end of the lists, and Sir Tristram at the other end of the lists. And so they furtered their spears and came together as if it had been thunder. And there Sir Tristram through a great might smote down Sir Blamor and his horse to the earth. Then anon Sir Blamor avoided his horse and pulled out his sword and threw his shield afore him and bade Sir Tristram alight. For though an horse hath failed me, I trust to God the earth will not fail me. And then Sir Tristram alighted and dressed him unto battle. And there they lashed together strongly as racing and tracing, foining and dashing many sad strokes that the kings and the knights had great wonder that they might stand for ever they fought like wood men so that there were never knights seen fight more fiercely than they did for sir blamor was so hasty that he would have no rest that all men wondered that they had breath to stand on their feet and all the place was bloody that they had fought in and at the last Sir Tristram smote Sir Blamor such a buffet upon the helm that he there fell down upon his side, and Sir Tristram stood and beheld him. End of Book 8, Chapters 17 through 22. This has been a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox. Dot org. Read by M. J. The Mortator, Volume One, by Sir Thomas Mallory, Book Eight, Chapter Seventeen through Twenty Two. Chapters Twenty Three through Twenty Eight, Book Eight, Volume One of Le Mort d'Artour. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Vin Riley. Le Mort d'Artour, Volume 1, by Sir Thomas Mallory, Book 8, Chapters 23 through 28. Chapter 23. Then when Sir Le Mort might speak, he said thus, Sir Tristram de Leonis, I require thee, as thou art a noble knight, and the best knight that ever I found, that thou wilt slay me out, for I would not live to be made lord of all the earth, for I have liefer die with worship than live with shame, and needs, Sir Tristram, thou must slay me, or else thou shalt never win the field, for I will never say the loath word. And therefore if thou dare slay me, slay me, I require thee. When Sir Tristram heard him say so knightly, he wist not what to do with him, he remembering him of both parties, of what blood he was come, and for Sir Lancelot's sake he would be loath to slay him. And in the other party, in no wise he might not choose, but that he must make him to say the loath word, or else to slay him. Then Sir Tristram stirred aback, and went to the kings that were judges, and there he kneeled down to fore them, and besought them for their worships, and for King Arthur's and Sir Lancelot's sake, that they would take this matter in their hands. For my fair lords, said Sir Tristram, it were shame and pity that this noble knight that yonder lieth should be slain, for ye hear well, shamed he will not be, and I pray to God that he never be slain nor shamed for me. And as for the king for whom I fight for, I shall require him, as I am his true champion and true knight in this field, that he will have mercy upon this good knight." So God me help, said King Anguish, I will, for your sake, Sir Tristram, be ruled as ye will have me, for I know you for my true knight, and therefore I will heartily pray the kings that be here as judges to take it in their hands. 
and the kings that were judges called Sir Bleoberis to them, and asked him his advice. My lord, said Bleoberis, though my brother be beaten, and hath the worse through might of arms, I dare say, though Sir Tristram hath beaten his body, he hath not beaten his heart. And I thank God he is not shamed this day, and rather than he should be shamed, I require you, said Sir Bleoberis, let Sir Tristram slay him out. It shall not be so, said the kings, for his part adversary, both the king and the champion, have pity of Sir Blamore's knighthood. My lord, said Bleoberis, I will right well as ye will. Then the kings called the king of Ireland, and found him goodly and treatable. And then by all their advices Sir Tristram and Sir Bleoberis took up Sir Blamore, and the two brethren were accorded with King Anguish, and kissed and made friends for ever. And then Sir Blamore and Sir Tristram kissed together, and there they made their oaths that they would never none of them two brethren fight with Sir Tristram, and Sir Tristram made the same oath. And for that gentle battle all the blood of Sir Lancelot loved Sir Tristram for ever. Then King Anguish and Sir Tristram took their leave, and sailed into Ireland with great noblesse and joy. So when they were in Ireland, the king let make it known throughout all the land how and in what manner Sir Tristram had done for him. Then the queen and all that there were made the most of him that they might. But the joy that La Belle Isoude made of Sir Tristram there might no tongue tell, for of all men earthly she loved him most. End of chapter 23 Chapter 24 then upon a day King Anguish asked Sir Tristram why he asked not his boon, for whatsoever he had promised him he should have it without fail. Sir, said Sir Tristram, now is it time. This is all that I will desire, that you will give me La Belle Isoude, your daughter, not for myself, but for mine uncle King Mark, that shall have her to wife, for so have I promised him. Alas, said the king, I had liefer than all the land that I have, you would wed her yourself. Sir, and I did, then I were shamed for ever in this world, and false of my promise. Therefore, said Sir Tristram, I pray you hold your promise that you promised me, for this is my desire, that ye will give me la belle Sud to go with me into Cornwall, for to be wedded to King Mark, mine uncle. As for that, said King Anguish, ye shall have her with you, to do with her what it please you, that is, for to say that if ye list to wed her yourself, that is me liefest, and if ye will give her unto King Mark your uncle, that is, in your choice. So to make short conclusion, La Belle Isoude was made ready to go with Sir Tristram, and Dame Bragwaine went with her, for her chief gentlewoman, with many other. Then the queen, Isoude's mother, gave to her and Dame Bragwaine, her daughter's gentlewoman, and unto Governale, a drink, and charged them that what day King Mark should wed, that same day they should give him that drink, so that King Mark should drink to La Belle Isoude, and then, said the queen, I undertake either shall love other the days of their life. So this drink was given unto Dame Bragwaine, and unto Governale, and then anon, Sir Tristram took the sea, and La Belle Isoude, and when they were in their cabin, it happed so that they were thirsty, and they saw a little flasket of gold stand by them, and it seemed by the colour and the taste that it was noble wine. Then Sir Tristram took the flasket in his hand, and said, Madame Isoude, here is the best drink that ever ye drank, that Dame Bragwaine, your maiden, and Gouvernail, my servant, have kept for themselves. Then they laughed and made good cheer, and either drank to other freely, and they thought never drink that ever they drank to other was so sweet nor so good. But by that their drink was in their bodies, they loved either other so well that never their love departed, for weal neither for woe. And thus it happed, the love first betwixt Sir Tristram and La Belle Isoude, the which love never departed the days of their life. So then they sailed, till by fortune they came nigh a castle that hight Plure, and thereby arrived for to repose them, weaning to them to have had good harbourage. But anon, as Sir Tristram was within the castle, they were taken prisoners. For the custom of the castle was such, who that rode by that castle and brought any lady, 
he must needs fight with the lord, that hight Brunor. And if it were so that Brunor won the field, then should the knight's stranger and his lady be put to death, what that ever they were. And if it were so that the strange knight won the field of Sir Brunor, then should he die and his lady both. This custom was used many winters, for it was called the Castle Plur, that is to say, the Weeping Castle. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 Thus, as Sir Tristram and La Belle Isoud were in prison, it happed a knight and a lady came unto them where they were, to cheer them. I have marvel, said Tristram unto the knight and the lady, what is the cause the lord of this castle holdeth us in prison? It was never the custom of no place of worship that ever I came in, when a knight and a lady asked harbour, and they to receive them, and after to destroy them that be his guests. Sir, said the knight, this is the old custom of this castle, that when a knight cometh here he must needs fight with our lord, and he that is weaker must lose his head. And when that is done, if his lady that he bringeth be fouler than our lord's wife, she must lose her head, and if she be fairer approved than is our lady, then shall the lady of this castle lose her head. So God me help, said Sir Tristram, this is a foul custom and a shameful. But one advantage have I, said Sir Tristram, I have a lady as fair enough, fairer so I never in all my life days, and I doubt not for lack of beauty she shall not lose her head and rather than I should lose my head, I will fight for it on a fair field. Wherefore, Sir Knight, I pray you tell your lord that I will be ready as to morn with my lady and myself to do battle, if it be so I may have my horse and mine armour. Sir, said that knight, I undertake that your desire shall be sped right well. And then he said, Take your rest, and look that ye be up betimes, and make you ready and your lady, for ye shall want no thing that you behoveth and therewith he departed. And on the morn betimes that same knight came to Sir Tristram, and fetched him out and his lady, and brought him horse and armour that was his own, and bade him make him ready to the field. For all the estates and commons of that lordship were there, ready to behold that battle and judgment. Then came Sir Brunor, the lord of that castle, with his lady in his hand, muffled, and asked Sir Tristram where was his lady, for an thy lady be fairer than mine, with thy sword smite off my lady's head, and if my lady be fairer than thine, with my sword I must strike off her head. And if I may win thee, yet shall thy lady be mine, and thou shalt lose thy head. Sir, said Tristram, this is a foul custom and horrible, and rather than my lady should lose her head, yet had I liefer lose my head. Nay, nay, said Sir Brunor. The ladies shall be first showed together, and the one shall have her judgment. Nay, I will not so, said Sir Tristram, for here is none that will give righteous judgment. But I doubt not, said Sir Tristram, my lady is fairer than thine, and that will I prove and make good with my hand. And whomsoever he be that will say the contrary, I will prove it on his head. And therewith Sir Tristram showed La Belle Isoud, and turned her thrice about with his naked sword in his hand. And when Sir Brunor saw that, he did the same wise turn his lady. But when Sir Brunor beheld La Belle Isoud, him thought he saw never a fairer lady, and then he dread his lady's head should be off. And so all the people that were there present gave judgment that La Belle Isoud was the fairer lady and the better maid. How now, said Sir Tristram, meseemeth it were pity that my lady should lose her head, but because thou and she of long time have used this wicked custom, and by you both have many good knights and ladies been destroyed, for that cause it were no loss to destroy you both. So God me help, said Sir Brunor, for to say the sooth, thy lady is fairer than mine, and that me sore repenteth. And so I hear the people privily say, for of all women I saw none so fair, and therefore, and thou wilt slay my lady, I doubt not, but I shall slay thee, and have thy lady. Thou shalt win her, said Sir Tristram, as dear as ever knight won lady. And because of thine own judgment, as thou wouldst have done to my lady, if that she had been fouler, and because of the evil custom, give me thy lady, said Sir Tristram. 
and therewithal Sir Tristram strode unto him and took his lady from him, and with an ox stroke he smote off her head clean. Well, knight, said Sir Brunor, now hast thou done me a despite. Now take thine horse. Sith and I am ladyless, I will win thy lady, and I may. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 Then they took their horses and came together as it had been the thunder, and Sir Tristram smote Sir Brunor clean from his horse, and lightly he rose up. And as Sir Tristram came again by him, he thrust his horse throughout both the shoulders, that his horse hurled here and there and fell dead to the ground. And ever Sir Brunor ran after to have slain Sir Tristram, but Sir Tristram was light and nimble, and voided his horse lightly. And or ever Sir Tristram might dress his shield and his sword, the other gave him three or four sad strokes. Then they rushed together like two boars, tracing and traversing mightily and wisely as two noble knights. For this Sir Bruno was a proved knight, and had been or then the death of many good knights, that it was pity he had so long endured. Thus they fought, hurling here and there nigh two hours, and either were wounded sore. Then at the last Sir Bruno rushed upon Sir Tristram and took him in his arms, for he trusted much in his strength. Then was Sir Tristram called the strongest and the highest knight of the world, for he was called bigger than Sir Lancelot, but Sir Lancelot was better breathed. So anon Sir Tristram thrust Sir Bruno down groveling, and then he unlaced his helm and struck off his head. And then all they that longed to the castle came to him, and did him homage and fealty, praying him that he would abide there still a little while to fordo that foul custom. Sir Tristram granted thereto. The meanwhile one of the knights of the castle rode unto Sir Galahad, the haut prince, the which was Sir Brunor's son, which was a noble knight, and told him what misadventure his father had and his mother. End of chapter 26 Chapter 27 Then came Sir Galahad and the king with the hundred knights with him, and this Sir Galahad proffered to fight with Sir Tristram hand for hand. And so they made them ready to go into battle on horseback with great courage. Then Sir Galahad and Sir Tristram met together so hard that either bare other down, horse and all, to the earth. And then they avoided their horses as noble knights, and dressed their shields, and drew their swords with ire and rancor, and they lashed together many sad strokes, and one while striking, another while foining, tracing and traversing as noble knights, thus they fought long, near half a day, and either were sore wounded. At the last Sir Tristram waxed light and big, and doubled his strokes, and drove Sir Galahad aback on the one side and on the other, so that he was like to have been slain. With that came the king with the hundred knights, and all that fellowship went fiercely upon Sir Tristram. When Sir Tristram saw them coming upon him, then he wist he might not endure. Then, as a wise knight of war, he said to Sir Galahad, the haut prince, Sir, ye show to me no knighthood, for to suffer all your men to have ado with me all at once, and as meseemeth ye be a noble knight of your hands, it is great shame to you. So God me help, said Sir Galahad, there is none other way but thou must yield thee to me, other else to die, said Sir Galahad to Sir Tristram. I will rather yield me to you than die, for that is more for the might of your men than of your hands. And therewithal Sir Tristram took his own sword by the point, and put the pommel in the hand of Sir Galahad. Therewithal came the king with the hundred knights, and hard began to assail Sir Tristram. Let be, said Sir Galahad, be ye not so hardy to touch him, for I have given this knight his life. That is your shame, said the king with the hundred knights. Hath he not slain your father and your mother? As for that, said Sir Galahad, I may not wite him greatly, for my father had him in prison, and enforced him to do battle with him. And my father had such a custom that was a shameful custom, that what knight came there to ask harbour, his lady must needs die, but if she were fairer than my mother. And if my father overcame that knight, he must needs die. This was a shameful custom and usage, a knight for his harbour asking to have such harbourage. And for this custom I would never draw about him. 
"'So God me help,' said the king, "'this was a shameful custom.' Truly, said Sir Galahad, so seemed me, and meseemed it had been great pity that this knight should have been slain, for I dare say he is the noblest man that beareth life, but if it were Sir Lancelot du Lake. Now, fair knight, said Sir Galahad, I require thee, tell me thy name, and of whence thou art, and whither thou wilt. Sir, he said, my name is Sir Tristram de Leonis, and from King Mark of Cornwall I was sent on message unto King Anguish of Ireland, for to fetch his daughter to be his wife, and here she is ready to go with me into Cornwall, and her name is La Belle Isoud. And Sir Tristram, said Sir Galahad, the haut prince, well be ye found in these marches, and so ye will promise me to go unto Sir Lancelot du Lake, and accompany with him, ye shall go where ye will, and your fair lady with you and I shall promise you never in all my days shall such customs be used in this castle as have been used. Sir, said Sir Tristram, now I let you wit, so God me help, I weened ye had been Sir Lancelot du Lake when I saw you first, and therefore I dread you the more. And, sir, I promise you, said Sir Tristram, as soon as I may I will see Sir Lancelot and in fellowship me with him, for of all the knights of the world I most desire his fellowship. End of chapter 27 Chapter 28 And then Sir Tristram took his leave when he saw his time, and took the sea. And in the meanwhile word came unto Sir Lancelot and to Sir Tristram that Sir Carados, the mighty king that was made like a giant, fought with Sir Gawain, and gave him such strokes that he swooned in his saddle, and after that he took him by the collar and pulled him out of his saddle and fast bound him to the saddle-bow, and so rode his way with him toward his castle. And as he rode, by fortune Sir Lancelot met with Sir Carados, and anon he knew Sir Gawain that lay bound after him. Ah, said Sir Lancelot unto Sir Gawain, how stands it with you? Never so hard, said Sir Gawain, unless that ye help me, for so God me help, without ye rescue me I know no knight that may, but other you or Sir Tristram. Wherefore Sir Lancelot was heavy of Sir Gawain's words. And then Sir Lancelot bade Sir Carados, Lay down that knight and fight with me. Thou art but a fool, said Sir Carados, for I will serve you in the same wise. As for that, said Sir Lancelot, spare me not for I warn thee I will not spare thee. And then he bound Sir Gawain hand and foot, and so threw him to the ground. And then he got his spear of his squire, and departed from Sir Launcelot to fetch his course. And so either met with other, and brake their spears to their hands. And then they pulled out swords, and hurtled together on horseback more than an hour. And at the last Sir Launcelot smote Sir Carados such a buffet upon the helm, that it pierced his brain-pan. So then Sir Launcelot took Sir Carados by the collar, and pulled him under his horse's feet, and then he alighted, and pulled off his helm, and struck off his head. And then Sir Launcelot unbound Sir Gawain. So this same tale was told to Sir Galahad and to Sir Tristram. Here may ye hear the nobleness that followeth Sir Launcelot. Alas, said Sir Tristram, and I had not this message in hand with this fair lady, Truly I would never stint, or I had found Sir Launcelot. Then Sir Tristram and La Belle Isoud went to the sea, and came into Cornwall, and there all the barons met them. End of Book 8, Chapters 23 through 28、Chapters 29 to 33, Book 8, Volume 1 of Le Mort d'Arthur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tisto, T Y S T O dot com. Le Mort d'Arthur, Volume 1 by Sir Thomas Mallory. Book 8, Chapters 29 to 33. Chapter 29. Of the wedding of King Mark to La Belle Isoude, and of Bragwain her maid, and of Palamides. And anon 
they were richly wedded with great noblesse. But ever, as the French book saith, Sir Tristram and La Belle Isode loved ever together. Then there was great jousts and great tourneying, and many lords and ladies were at that feast, and Sir Tristram was most praised of all other. Thus dured the feast long, and after the feast was done, within a little while after, by the assent of two ladies that were with Queen Isode, they ordained for hate and envy for to destroy Dame Brogwain, that was maiden and lady unto La Belle Isode. And she was sent into the forest for to fetch herbs, and there she was met and bound feet and hand to a tree, and so she was bounden three days. And by fortune Sir Palamides found Dame Brogwain, and there he delivered her from the death, and brought her to a nunnery there beside, for to be recovered. When Isode the queen missed her maiden, wit ye well she was right heavy as ever was any queen, for of all earthly women she loved her best, the cause was for she came with her out of her country. And so, upon a day, Queen Isode walked into the forest to put away her thoughts, and there she went herself unto a well, and made great moan. And suddenly there came Palamides to her, and had heard all her complaint, and said, Madame Isode, an ye will grant me my boon, I shall bring you Dame Bragwain safe and sound. And the queen was so glad of his proffer, that suddenly unavised she granted all his asking. Well, madame, said Palamides, I trust to your promise, and if you will abide here half an hour, I shall bring her to you. I shall abide you, said La Belle Isode and Sir Palamides rode forth his way to that nunnery, and lightly he came again with Dame Brogwain. But by her good will she would not have come again, because for love of the queen she stood in adventure of her life. Notwithstanding, half against her will, she went with Sir Palamides unto the queen. And when the queen saw her, she was passing glad. Now, madam, said Sir Palamides, Remember upon your promise, for I have fulfilled my promise. Sir Palamides, said the queen, I wot not what is your desire, but I will that we wit, howbeit I promised you largely, I thought none evil, nor I warn you, none evil will I do. Madam, said Sir Palamides, as at this time ye shall not know my desire, but before my lord your husband, there shall ye know that I will have my desire that ye have promised me. And therewith the queen departed, and rode home to the king, and Sir Palamides rode after her. And when Sir Palamides came before the king, he said, Sir king, I require you, as ye be a righteous king, that ye will judge me the right. Tell me your cause, said the king, and ye shall have right. CHAPTER Thirty, HOW PALAMIDES DEMANDED QUEEN ISODE, AND HOW LAMBEGUS RODE AFTER TO RESCUE HER, AND OF THE ESCAPE OF ISODE. Sir, said Palamides, I promised your Queen Isode to bring again Dame Bragwain that she had lost upon this covenant, that she should grant me a boon that I would ask, and without grudging other advisement, she granted me. What say ye, my lady? said the king. It is as he saith, so God me help, said the queen. To say thee sooth, I promised him his asking, for love and joy that I had to see her. Well, madam, said the king, and if ye were hasty to grant him the boon he would ask, I will well that ye perform your promise. Then, said Palamides, I will that ye wit that I will have your queen to lead her and govern her, whereas me list. Therewith the king stood still, and bethought him of Sir Tristram, and deemed that he would rescue her. 
and then hastily the king answered, Take her with the adventures that shall fall of it, for I suppose thou wilt not enjoy her no while. As for that, said Palamides, I dare right well abide the adventure. And so, to make short tale, Sir Palamides took her by the hand, and said, Madam, judge not to go with me, for I desire nothing but your own promise. As for that, said the queen, I fear not greatly to go with thee, howbeit thou hast me at advantage upon my promise, for I doubt not I shall be worshipfully rescued from thee. As for that, said Sir Palamides, be it as it be may. So Queen Isoude was set behind Palamides, and rode his way. Anon the king sent after Sir Tristram, but in no wise he could be found, for he was in the forest a-hunting, for that was always his custom, but if he used arms, to chase and to hunt in the forests. Alas, said the king, now I am shamed for ever, that by mine own assent my lady and my queen shall be devoured. Then came forth a knight, his name was Lambagus, and he was a knight of Sir Tristram. My lord, said this knight, sith ye have trust in my lord Sir Tristram, wit ye well for his sake I will ride after your queen and rescue her, or else I shall be beaten. Gramercy, said the king, as I live, Sir Lambagus, I shall deserve it. And then Sir Lambagus armed him, and rode after as fast as he might. And then within a while he overtook Sir Palamides, and then Sir Palamides left the queen. What art thou? said Palamides. Art thou Tristram? Nay, he said, I am his servant, and my name is Sir Lambagus. That me repenteth, said Palamides. I had liefer thou hast been Sir Tristram. I believe you well, said Lambigus, but when thou meetest with Sir Tristram, thou shalt have thy hands full. And then they hurtled together, and all to brast their spears, and then they pulled out their swords, and hewed on helms and halberks. At the last Sir Palamides gave Sir Lambigus such a wound that he fell down like a dead knight to the earth. Then he looked after La Belle Isode, and then she was gone. He nist where. Wit ye well Sir Palamides was never so heavy. So the queen ran into the forest, and there she found a well, and therein she had thought to have drowned herself. And as good fortune would, there came a knight to her that had a castle nearby. His name was Adtherp. And when he found the queen in that mischief, he rescued her, and brought her to his castle. And when he wist what she was, he armed him, and took his horse, and said he would be avenged upon Palamides. And so he rode on till he met with him, and there Sir Palamides wounded him sore, and by force he made him to tell the cause why he did battle with him, and how he had led the queen unto his castle. Now bring me there, said Palamides, or thou shalt die of my hands. Sir, said Sir Adtherp, I am so wounded I may not follow, but ride you this way, and it shall bring you into my castle, and there within is the queen. Then Sir Palamides rode still till he came to the castle, and at a window La Belle Isode saw Sir Palamides, then she made the gates to be shut strongly, and when he saw he might not come within the castle, he put off his bridle and his saddle, and put his horse to pasture and set himself down at the gate like a man that was out of his wit that recked not of himself. Chapter 31 How Sir Tristram rode after Palamides, and how he found him and fought with him, and by the means of his ode the battle ceased. Now we turn unto Sir Tristram, that when he was come home and wist La Belle Isode was gone with Sir Palamides, wit ye well he was wroth out of measure. Alas, said Sir Tristram, I am this day shamed. Then he cried to Governail, his man, Haste thee that I were armed and on horseback, for well I wot Lambegus hath no might nor strength to withstand Sir Palamides. Alas, that I have not been in his stead. 
So anon, as he was armed and horsed, Sir Tristram and Governail rode after into the forest, and within a while he found his knight Lambegus almost wounded to the death, and Sir Tristram bare him to a forester, and charged him to keep him well. And then he rode forth, and there he found Sir Anthorpe sore wounded, and he told him how the queen would have drowned herself had he not been, and how for her sake and love he had taken upon himself to do battle with Sir Palamides. "'Where is my lady?' said Sir Tristram. "'Sir,' said the knight, "'she is sure enough within my castle, and she can hold her within it.' "'Gramercy,' said Sir Tristram, "'of thy great goodness.' and so he rode till he came nigh to that castle, and then Sir Tristram saw where Sir Palamides sat at the gate sleeping, and his horse pastured fast afore him. "'Now go thou, Governail, said Sir Tristram, "'and bid him awake, and make him ready.' So Governail rode unto him, and said, "'Sir Palamides, arise, and take to thee thine harness.' But he was in such a study he heard not what Governail said. So Governail came again, and told Sir Tristram he slept, or else he was mad. "'Go thou again,' said Sir Tristram, "'and bid him arise, and tell him I am here, his mortal foe.' So Governail rode again, and put upon him the butt of his spear, and said, "'Sir Palamides, make thee ready, for wit ye well Sir Tristram hoveth yonder, and sendeth thee word he is thy mortal foe.' And therewithal Sir Palamides arose stilly, without words, and got his horse, and saddled him, and bridled him, and lightly he leapt upon, and got his spear in his hand, and either footred their spears, and hurtled fast together. And there Tristram smote down Sir Palamides over his horse's tail. Then lightly Sir Palamides put his shield afore him, and drew his sword. And there began strong battle on both parts, for both they fought for the love of one lady. And ever she lay on the walls, and beheld them, how they fought out of measure, and either were wounded passing sore. But Palamides was much sorer wounded. Thus they fought, tracing and traversing more than two hours, that well nigh for dole and sorrow La Belle Isode swooned. Alas, she said, that one I loved and yet do, and the other I love not. Yet it were great pity that I should see Sir Palamides slain, for well I know, by the time the end be done, Sir Palamides is but a dead knight. Because he is not christened, I would be loath that he should die a Saracen. And therewithal she came down and besought Sir Tristram to fight no more. Ah, madam, said he, what mean you? Will ye have me shamed? Well ye know I will be ruled by you. I will not your dishonour, said La Belle Isode, but I would that ye would, for my sake, spare this unhappy Saracen Palamides. Madam, said Sir Tristram, I will leave fighting at this time for your sake. Then she said to Sir Palamides, This shall be your charge, that thou shalt go out of this country while I am therein. I will obey your commandment, said Sir Palamides, the which is sore against my will. Then take thy way, said La Belle Isode, unto the court of King Arthur, and there recommend me unto Queen Guinevere, and tell her that I send her word that there be within this land but four lovers, that is, Sir Launcelot du Lake, and Queen Guinevere, and Sir Tristram de Lyons, and Queen Isode. CHAPTER Thirty Two, HOW SIR TRISTRAM BROUGHT QUEEN Isode HOME, AND OF THE DEBATE OF KING MARK AND SIR TRISTRAM. And so Sir Palamides departed with great heaviness, and Sir Tristram took the queen, and brought her again to King Mark, and then there was made great joy of her homecoming. Who was cherished but Sir Tristram? Then Sir Tristram let fetch Sir Lambegus his knight from the forester's house, and it was long or he was whole, but at the last he was well recovered. Thus they lived with joy and play a long while.
but ever Sir Andred, that was nigh cousin to Sir Tristram, lay in a watch to wait betwixt Sir Tristram and La Belle Isode, for to take them and slander them. So upon a day Sir Tristram talked with La Belle Isode in a window, and that espied Sir Andred, and told it to the king. Then King Mark took a sword in his hand, and came to Sir Tristram, and called him false traitor, and would have stricken him. But Sir Tristram was nigh him, and ran under his sword, and took it out of his hand. And then the king cried, Where are my knights and my men? I charge you, slay this traitor. But at that time there was not one who would move for his words. When Sir Tristram saw that there was not one who would be against him, he shook the sword to the king, and made countenance as though he would have stricken him. And then King Mark fled, and Sir Tristram followed him, and smote upon him five or six strokes, flatling on the neck, that he made him to fall upon the nose. And then Sir Tristram yeed his way, and armed him, and took his horse and his man, and so he rode into that forest. And there upon a day Sir Tristram met with two brethren that were knights with King Mark, and there he struck off the head of the one, and wounded the other to the death, and he made him to bear his brother's head in his helm unto the king, and thirty more there he wounded. And when that knight came before the king to say his message, he there died afore the king and the queen. Then King Mark called his counsel unto him, and asked advice of his barons, what was best to do with Sir Tristram. Sir, said the barons, in especial Sir Dinas, the seneschal, Sir, we will give you counsel for to send for Sir Tristram, for we will that ye wit many men will hold with Sir Tristram, and he were hard bestead. And sir, said Sir Dinas, ye shall understand that Sir Tristram is called peerless and makeless of any Christian knight, and of his might and hardiness we knew none so good a knight, but if it be Sir Launcelot de Lake. And if he depart from your court, and go to King Arthur's court, wit ye well he will get him such friends there, that he will not set by your malice. And therefore, sir, I counsel you to take him to your grace. I will well, said the king, that he be sent for, that we may be friends. Then the baron sent for Sir Tristram under a safe conduct, and so when Sir Tristram came to the king he was welcome, and no rehearsal was made, and there was game and play. And then the king and the queen went a-hunting, and Sir Tristram. Chapter 33 How Sir Lamorak jousted with thirty knights, and how Sir Tristram, at the request of King Mark, smote his horse down. The king and the queen made their pavilions and their tents in that forest beside a river, and there was daily hunting and jousting, for there were ever thirty knights ready to joust unto all them that came in at that time, and there by fortune came Sir Lamorak de Gallus and Sir Driant and there Sir Driant jousted right well, but at the last he had a fall. Then Sir Lamorak proffered to joust, and when he began he fared so with the thirty knights that there was not one of them but that he gave him a fall, and some of them were sore hurt. I marvel, said King Mark, what knight he is that doth such deeds of arms. Sir, said Sir Tristram, I know him well for a noble knight as few now be living, and his name is Sir Lamorak de Gallus. It were great shame, said the king, that he should go thus away, unless that some of you meet with him better. Sir, said Sir Tristram, me seemeth it were no worship for a noble man to have ado with him, and for because at this time he hath done over much for any mean knight living. Therefore, as me seemeth, it were great shame and villainy to tempt him any more at this time, insomuch as he and his horse are weary both, for the deeds of arms that he hath done this day, and they be well considered, it were enough for Sir Launcelot Lake. As for that, said King Mark, 
I require you, as you love me and my lady the queen, La Belle Isode, take your arms and joust with Sir Lamorak de Galles. Sir, said Sir Tristram, you bid me do a thing that is against knighthood, and well I can deem that I shall give him a fall, for it is no mastery, for my horse and I be fresh both, and so is not his horse and he, and wit ye well that he will take it for great unkindness, for ever one good knight is loath to take another at disadvantage. But because I will not displease you, as you require me, so will I do, and obey your commandment. And so Sir Tristram armed him, and took his horse, and put him forth, and there Sir Lamorak met him mightily, and what with the might of his own spear and of Sir Tristram's spear, Sir Lamorak's horse fell to the earth, and he sitting in the saddle. Then anon, as lightly as he might, he avoided the saddle and his horse, and put his shield afore him, and drew his sword. And then he bade Sir Tristram, Alight, thou knight, and thou durst. Nay, said Sir Tristram, I will no more have ado with thee, for I have done to thee overmuch unto my dishonour and to thy worship. As for that, said Sir Lamorak, I can thee no thank. Since thou hast forjousted me on horseback, I require thee, and I beseech thee, and thou be Sir Tristram, fight with me on foot. I will not so, said Sir Tristram, and wit ye well my name is Sir Tristram de Lyons, and well I know ye be Sir Lamorak de Galles and this that I have done to you was against my will, but I was required thereto. But to say that I will do at your request at this time, I will have no more ado with you, for me shameth of that I have done. As for shame, said Sir Lamorak, on thy part or on mine, bear thou it an thou wilt, for though a mare's son hath failed me, now a queen's son shall not fail thee, and therefore and thou be such a knight as men call thee, I require thee a light, and fight with me. Sir Lamorak, said Sir Tristram, I understand your heart is great, and cause why ye have to say thee sooth, for it would grieve me an any knight should keep him fresh, and then to strike down a weary knight, for that knight nor horse was never formed that alway may stand or endure, and therefore, said Sir Tristram, I will not have ado with you, for me forethinketh of that I have done. As for that, said Sir Lamorak, I shall quit you, and ever I see my time. End of Book 8 Chapters 29 to 33「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Vin Riley. Le Mort d'Artour, Volume 1, by Sir Thomas Mallory. Book 8, Chapters 34 through 38. Chapter 34. So he departed from him with Sir Dryant, and by the way they met with a knight that was sent from Morgan le Fay unto King Arthur and this knight had a fair horn harnessed with gold, and the horn had such a virtue that there might no lady nor gentlewoman drink of that horn but if she were true to her husband, and if she were false she should spill all the drink, and if she were true to her lord she might drink peaceable. And because of the Queen Guinevere, and in the despite of Sir Lancelot, this horn was sent unto King Arthur, and by force Sir Lamorak made that knight to tell all the cause why he bare that horn. Now shalt thou bear this horn, said Lamorak, unto King Mark, or else choose thou to die for it. For I tell thee plainly, in despite and reproof of Sir Tristram, thou shalt bear that horn unto King Mark, his uncle. And say thou to him that I sent it him for to assay his lady, and if she be true to him, he shall prove her. So the knight went his way unto King Mark, and brought him that rich horn, and said that Sir Lamorak sent it him, and thereto he told him the virtue of that horn. Then the king made Queen Isoud to drink thereof, and an hundred ladies, and there were but four ladies of all those that drank clean. Alas, said King Mark, this is a great despite, and swear a great oath that she should be burnt and the other ladies. 
Then the barons gathered them together, and said plainly they would not have those ladies burnt for an horn made by sorcery that came from as false a sorceress and witch as then was living, for that horn did never good, but caused strife and debate, and always in her days she had been an enemy to all true lovers. So there were many knights made their avow, and ever they met with Morgan le Fay, that they would show her short courtesy. Also Sir Tristram was passing wroth that Sir Lamorak sent that horn unto King Mark, for well he knew that it was done in the despite of him, and therefore he thought to quiet Sir Lamorak. Then Sir Tristram used daily and nightly to go to Queen Isoude when he might, and ever Sir Andred his cousin watched him night and day for to take him with La Belle Isoude. And so upon a night Sir Andred espied the hour and the time when Sir Tristram went to his lady. Then Sir Andred got unto him twelve knights, and at midnight he set upon Sir Tristram secretly and suddenly, and there Sir Tristram was taken naked a bed with La Belle Isoude and then was he bound hand and foot, and so was he kept until day. And then, by the assent of King Mark, and of Sir Andred, and of some of the barons, Sir Tristram was led unto a chapel that stood upon the sea-rocks, there for to take his judgment. And so he was led bounden with forty knights. And when Sir Tristram saw that there was none other boot but needs that he must die, then said he, Fair lords, Remember what I have done for the country of Cornwall, and in what jeopardy I have been in for the weal of you all. For when I fought for the truage of Cornwall with Sir Marhaus, the good knight, I was promised for to be better rewarded when ye all refused to take the battle. Therefore, as ye be good gentle knights, see me not thus shamefully to die, for it is shame to all knighthood thus to see me die. For I dare say, said Sir Tristram, that I never met with no knight, but I was as good as he, or better. Fie upon thee, said Sir Andred, false traitor that thou art, with thine avaunting, for all thy boast thou shalt die this day. O oh, Andred, Andred, said Sir Tristram, thou shouldst be my kinsman, and now thou art to me full unfriendly, but an there were no more but thou and I, thou wouldst not put me to death. No, said Sir Andred, and therewith he drew his sword, and would have slain him. When Sir Tristram saw him make such countenance, he looked upon both his hands that were fast bounden unto two knights, and suddenly he pulled them both to him, and unrasped his hands, and then he leapt unto his cousin Sir Andred, and wrested his sword out of his hands. Then he smote Sir Andred that he fell to the earth, and so Sir Tristram fought till that he had killed ten knights. So then Sir Tristram got the chapel, and kept it mightily. Then the cry was great, and the people drew fast unto Sir Andred, more than an hundred. When Sir Tristram saw the people draw unto him, he remembered he was naked, and spurred fast the chapel door, and brake the bars of a window, and so he leapt out and fell upon the crags in the sea. And so at that time Sir Andred nor none of his fellows might get to him at that time. End of chapter 34 Chapter 35 So when they were departed, Governail and Sir Lambegus and Sir Centra de Luchon, that were Sir Tristram's men, sought their master. When they heard he was escaped then, they were passing glad, and on the rocks they found him, and with towels they pulled him up. And then Sir Tristram asked them where was La Belle Isoude, for he weened she had been had away of Andred's people. Sir, said Gouvernail, she is put in a lazar coat. Alas, said Sir Tristram, this is a full ungoodly place for such a fair lady, and if I may, she shall not be long there. And so he took his men and went there as was La Belle Isoude, and fetched her away, and brought her into a forest to a fair manor, and Sir Tristram there abode with her. So the good knight bade his men go from him, for at this time I may not help you. So they departed, all save Gouvernail. And so upon a day Sir Tristram yede into the forest for to disport him, and then it happened that there he fell asleep, and there came a man that Sir Tristram aforehand had slain his brother, and when this man had found him, he shot him through the shoulder with an arrow, and Sir Tristram leapt up and killed that man. 
and in the meantime it was told King Mark how Sir Tristram and La Belle Isoude were in that same manner, and as soon as ever he might, thither he came with many knights to slay Sir Tristram. And when he came there he found him gone, and there he took La Belle Isoude home with him, and kept her straight, that by no means never she might wit nor send unto Tristram, nor he unto her. And then when Sir Tristram came toward the old manor, he found the track of many horses, and thereby he wist his lady was gone. And then Sir Tristram took great sorrow, and endured with great pain long time, for the arrow that he was hurt withal was envenomed. Then by the mean of La Belle Isoude she told a lady that was cousin unto Dame Bragwaine, and she came to Sir Tristram, and told him that he might not be whole by no means. For thy lady, La Belle Isoude, may not help thee, therefore she biddeth you hasten to Brittany to King Howell, and there ye shall find his daughter, Isoude la Blancheman, and she shall help thee. Then Sir Tristram and Gouvernail got them shipping, and so sailed into Brittany. And when King Howell wist that it was Sir Tristram, he was full glad of him. Sir, he said, I am come into this country to have help of your daughter, for it is told me that there is none other may heal me but she. And so within a while she healed him. End of chapter 35 Chapter 36 There was an earl that hight Grip, and this earl made great war upon the king, and put the king to the worse, and besieged him. And on a time Sir Kehydius, that was son to King Howell, as he issued out he was sore wounded, nigh to the death. Then Gouvernail went to the king, and said, Sir, I counsel you to desire my lord, Sir Tristram, as in your need, to help you. I will do by your counsel, said the king, and so he yede unto Sir Tristram, and prayed him in his wars to help him. For my son, Sir Kehydius, may not go into the field. Sir, said Sir Tristram, I will go to the field, and do what I may. Then Sir Tristram issued out of the town with such fellowship as he might make, and did such deeds that all Brittany spake of him. And then at the last, by great might and force, he slew the Earl Grip with his own hands, and more than an hundred knights he slew that day. And then Sir Tristram was received worshipfully with procession. Then King Howell embraced him in his arms, and said, Sir Tristram, all my kingdom I will resign to thee. God defend, said Sir Tristram, for I am beholden unto you for your daughter's sake to do for you. Then by the great means of King Howell and Kehydius his son, by great proffers, there grew great love betwixt Isoude and Sir Tristram, for that lady was both good and fair, and a woman of noble blood and fame. And for because Sir Tristram had such cheer and riches, and all other pleasance that he had, almost he had forsaken La Belle Isoude. And so upon a time Sir Tristram agreed to wed Isoude La Blancheman, and at the last they were wedded, and solemnly held their marriage. And so, when they were abed both, Sir Tristram remembered him of his old lady La Belle Isoude, and then he took such a thought suddenly that he was all dismayed, and other cheer made he none but with clipping and kissing, as for other fleshly lusts Sir Tristram never thought nor had ado with her. Such mention maketh the French book, also it maketh mention that the lady weaned there had been no pleasure but kissing and clipping. And in the meantime there was a knight in Brittany, his name was Sir Pinabiles, and he came over the sea into England, and then he came into the court of King Arthur, and there he met with Sir Lancelot du Lake, and told him of the marriage of Sir Tristram. Then said Sir Lancelot, Fie upon him, untrue knight to his lady, that so noble a knight as Sir Tristram is should be found to his first lady false, La Belle Isoude, Queen of Cornwall. But say ye him this, said Sir Launcelot, that of all knights in the world I loved him most, and had most joy of him, and all was for his noble deeds. And let him wit the love between him and me is done for ever, and that I give him warning from this day forth as his mortal enemy. End of chapter 36 Chapter 37 Then departed Sir Supinabiles unto Brittany again, and there he found Sir Tristram, and told him that he had been in King Arthur's court. Then said Sir Tristram, Heard ye anything of me? 
So God me help, said Sir Sipinabiles, there I heard Sir Launcelot speak of you great shame, and that ye be a false knight to your lady, and he bade me do you to wit that he will be your mortal enemy in every place where he may meet you. That me repenteth, said Tristram, for of all knights I loved to be in his fellowship. So Sir Tristram made great moan, and was ashamed that noble knights should defame him for the sake of his lady. And in this meanwhile La Belle Isoud made a letter unto Queen Guinevere, complaining her of the untruth of Sir Tristram, and how he had wedded the king's daughter of Brittany. Queen Guinevere sent her another letter, and bade her be of good cheer, for she should have joy after sorrow, for Sir Tristram was so noble a knight called, that by crafts of sorcery ladies would make such noble men to wed them. But in the end Queen Guinevere said, It shall be thus, that he shall hate her and love you better than ever he did to fore. So leave we Sir Tristram in Brittany, and speak we of Sir Lamorak de Gallus, that as he sailed his ship fell on a rock and perished all, save Sir Lamorak and his squire. And there he swam mightily, and fishers of the Isle of Servage took him up, and his squire was drowned, and the shipmen had great labour to save Sir Lamorak's life for all the comfort they could do. And the lord of that isle hight Sir Nabon le Noir, a great mighty giant. And this Sir Nabon hated all the knights of King Arthur's, and in no wise would he do them favour. And these fishers told Sir Lamorak all the guise of Sir Nabon, how there came never knight of King Arthur's, but he destroyed him. And at the last battle that he did was slain Sir Nanon le Petit, the which he put to a shameful death in despite of King Arthur, for he was drawn limb meal. That forthinketh me, said Sir Lamorak, for that knight's death, for he was my cousin, and if I were at mine ease as well as ever I was, I would revenge his death. Peace, said the fishers, and make here no words, for wherever ye depart from hence, Sir Nabon must know that ye had been here, or else we should die for your sake. So that I be whole, said Lamorak, of my disease that I have taken in the sea, I will that ye tell him that I am a knight of King Arthur's, for I was never afeard to René, my lord. End of chapter 37 Chapter 38 Now turn we unto Sir Tristram, that upon a day he took a little barget, and his wife, Isoud la Blancheman, with Sir Cahideus, her brother, to play them in the coasts. And when they were from the land, there was a wind drove them into the coast of Wales, upon this isle of Servage, whereas was Sir Lamorak, and there the barget all to rove, and there Dame Isoud was hurt, and as well as they might they got into the forest, and there by a well he saw Segwarides and a damosel, and then either saluted other. Sir, said Segwarides, I know you for Sir Tristram de Leonis, the man in the world that I have most cause to hate, because he departed the love between me and my wife. But as for that, said Sir Segwarides, I will never hate a noble knight for a light lady. And therefore I pray you, be my friend, and I will be yours unto my power. For wit ye well ye are hard bestead in this valley, and we shall have enough to do either of us to suck or other. And then Sir Segwarides brought Sir Tristram to a lady thereby that was born in Cornwall, and she told him all the perils of that valley, and how there came never knight there but he were taken prisoner or slain. Wit you well, fair lady, said Sir Tristram, that I slew Sir Marhaus, and delivered Cornwall from the truage of Ireland, and I am he that delivered the king of Ireland from Sir Blamor de Ganis, and I am he that beat Sir Palamides, and wit ye well, I am Sir Tristram de Leonis, that by the grace of God shall deliver this woeful isle of servage. So Sir Tristram was well eased. Then one told him there was a knight of King Arthur's that was wrecked on the rocks. What is his name? said Sir Tristram. We wot not, said the fishers, but he keepeth it no counsel, but that he is a knight of King Arthur's, and by the mighty lord of this isle he setteth naught. I pray you, said Sir Tristram, an ye may, bring him hither that I may see him, and if he be any of the knights of Arthur's, I shall know him. Then the lady prayed the fishers to bring him to her place. So on the morrow they brought him thither in a fisher's raiment, and as soon as Sir Tristram saw him, he smiled upon him and knew him well, but he knew not Sir Tristram. Fair sir, said Sir Tristram, 
Meseemeth by your cheer ye have been diseased but late, and also methinketh I should know you heretofore. I will well, said Sir Lamorak, that ye have seen me and met with me. Fair sir, said Sir Tristram, tell me your name. Upon a covenant I will tell you, said Sir Lamorak, that is, that ye will tell me whether ye be lord of this island or no, that is called Nabon le Noir. Forsooth, said Sir Tristram, I am not he, nor I hold not of him. I am his foe as well as ye be, and so shall I be found, or I depart out of this isle. Well, said Sir Lamorak, since ye have said so largely unto me, my name is Sir Lamorak de Gallus, son unto King Pellinore. Forsooth I trow well, said Sir Tristram, for an ye said other I know the contrary. What are ye, said Sir Lamorak, that knoweth me? I am Sir Tristram de Leonis. Ah, sir, remember ye not of the fall ye did give me once, and after ye refused me to fight on foot. That was not for fear I had of you, said Sir Tristram, but me shamed at that time to have more ado with you, for meseemed ye had enough. But, Sir Lamorak, for my kindness, many ladies ye put to a reproof, when ye sent the horn from Morgan le Fay to King Mark, whereas ye did this in despite of me. Well, said he, an it were to do again, so would I do, for I had liefer strife and debate fell in King Mark's court rather than Arthur's court, for the honour of both courts be not alike. As to that, said Sir Tristram, I know well, but that that was done it was for despite of me, but all your malice, thank God, hurt not greatly. Therefore, said Sir Tristram, ye shall leave all your malice, and so will I, and let us essay how we may win worship between you and me upon this giant Sir Nabon le Noir that is lord of this island, to destroy him. Sir, said Sir Lamorak, now I understand your knighthood. It may not be false that all men say, for of your bounty, noblesse, and worship, of all knights ye are peerless, and for your courtesy and gentleness I showed you ungentleness, and that now me repenteth. End of chapter 38 End of Book 8, Chapters 34 through 38、Chapters 39 to 41, Book 8, Volume 1 of Le Mort d'Arthur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Gesine. Le Mort d'Arthur, Volume 1, by Sir Thomas Mallory. Book 8, Chapters 39 to 41. Chapter 39. In the meantime, there came word that Sir Nabon had made a cry that all the people of that isle should be at his castle the fifth day after and the same day the son of Nabon should be made knight, and all the knights of that valley and thereabout should be there to joust, and all those of the realm of Logris should be there to joust with them of North Wales, and thither came five hundred knights, and they of the country brought thither Sir Lamorak and Sir Tristram and Sir Cahedius and Sir Seguarides, for they durst none otherwise do, and then Sir Nabon lent Sir Lamorak horse and armour at Sir Lamorak's desire, and Sir Lamorak jousted, and did such deeds of arms, that Nabon and all the people said there was never knight that ever they saw do such deeds of arms. For, as the French book says, he forjousted all that were there, for the most part of five hundred knights, that none abode him in his saddle." Then Sir Nabon proffered to play with him his play, for I saw never no knight do so much upon a day. I will well, said Sir Lamorak, play as I may, but I am weary and sore bruised. And there either gat a spear, but Nabon would not encounter with Sir Lamorak, but smote his horse on the forehead, and so slew him. And then Sir Lamorak yeed on foot, and turned his shield and drew his sword, and there began strong battle on foot. But Sir Lamorak was so sore bruised and short-breathed that he traced and traversed somewhat aback. 
"'Fair fellow,' said Sir Nabon, "'hold thy hand, and I shall show thee more courtesy than ever I showed knight, "'because I have seen this day thy noble knighthood, "'and therefore stand thou by, "'and I will wit whether any of thy fellows will have ado with me.' "'Then when Sir Tristram heard that, he stepped forth and said, "'Nabon, lend me horse and sure armour, "'and I will have ado with thee.' "'Well, fellow,' said Sir Nabon, "'go thou to yonder pavilion, "'and arm thee of the best thou findest there, "'and I shall play a marvellous play with thee.' "'Then said Sir Tristram, "'Look ye play well, "'or else, peradventure, "'I shall learn you a new play.' "'That is well said, fellow,' said Sir Nabon. So when Sir Tristram was armed as him liked best, and well shielded and sworded, he dressed to him on foot, for well he knew that Sir Nabon would not abide a stroke with a spear, therefore he would slay all knights' horses. Now, fair fellow, Sir Nabon, let us play. So then they fought long on foot, tracing and traversing, smiting and foining long without any rest. At the last Sir Nabon prayed him to tell him his name. "'Sir Nabon, I tell thee my name is Sir Tristram de Leonis, "'a knight of Cornwall under King Mark.' "'Thou art welcome,' said Sir Nabon, "'for of all knights I have most desired to fight with thee "'or with Sir Launcelot.' "'So then they went eagerly together, "'and Sir Tristram slew Sir Nabon, "'and so forthwith he leapt to his son "'and struck off his head, "'and then all the country said they would hold of Sir Tristram.' Nay, said Sir Tristram, I will not so. Here is a worshipful knight, Sir Lamorak de Gallis, that for me he shall be lord of this country, for he hath done here great deeds of arms. Nay, said Sir Lamorak, I will not be lord of this country, for I have not deserved it as well as ye. Therefore give ye it where ye will, for I will none have. Well, said Sir Tristram, since ye nor I will not have it, let us give it to him that hath not so well deserved it. Do as ye list, said Seguarides, for the gift is yours, for I will none have an I had deserved it. So was it given to Seguarides, whereof he thanked them, and so was he lord, and worshipfully he did govern it. And then Sir Seguarides delivered all prisoners, and set good governance in that valley, and so he returned into Cornwall, and told King Mark and La Belle Isoude how Sir Tristram had advanced him to the Isle of Servage, and here he proclaimed in all Cornwall of all the adventures of these two knights, so was it openly known. But full woe was La Belle Isoude when she had tell that Sir Tristram was wedded to Isoude La Blanchemain. Chapter 40 so turn we unto Sir Lamorak, that rode toward Arthur's court, and Sir Tristram's wife and Kehidius took a vessel and sailed into Brittany, unto King Howell, where he was welcome. And when he heard of these adventures, they marvelled of his noble deeds. Now turn we unto Sir Lamorak, that when he was departed from Sir Tristram, he rode out of the forest till he came to an hermitage, when the hermit saw him, he asked him from whence he came. Sir, said Sir Lamorak, I come from this valley. Sir, said the hermit, thereof I marvel, for this twenty winter I saw never no knight pass this country, but he was either slain or villainously wounded, or pass as a poor prisoner. Those ill customs, said Sir Lamorak, are fordone, for Sir Tristram slew your lord, Sir Nabon, and his son. Then was the hermit glad, and all his brethren, for he said there was never such a tyrant among Christian men. And therefore, said the hermit, this valley and franchise we will hold of Sir Tristram. So on the morrow Sir Lamorak departed, and as he rode he saw four knights fight against one, and that one knight defended him well, but at the last the four knights had him down. And then Sir Lamorak went betwixt them, and asked them why they would slay that one knight, and said it was shame, four against one. Thou shalt well wit, said the four knights, that he is false. That is your tale, said Sir Lamorak, 
and when I hear him also speak, I will say as ye say. Then said Lamorak, Ah, knight, can ye not excuse you, but that ye are a false knight? Sir, said he, yet can I excuse me both with my word and with my hands, that I will make good upon one of the best of them, my body to his body. Then spake they all at once, We will not jeopardy our bodies as for thee. But wit thou well, they said, and King Arthur were here himself, it should not lie in his power to save his life. That is too much said, said Sir Lamorak, but many speak behind a man more than they will say to his face, and because of your words ye shall understand that I am one of the simplest of King Arthur's court. In the worship of my lord now do your best, and in despite of you I shall rescue him. And then they lashed all at once to Sir Lamorak, but anon at two strokes Sir Lamorak had slain two of them, and then the other two fled. So then Sir Lamorak turned again to that knight, and asked him his name. Sir, he said, my name is Sir Frol of the Out Isles. Then he rode with Sir Lamorak, and bare him company. And as they rode by the way, they saw a seemly knight riding against them, and all in white. Ah, said Frol, yonder knight jousted late with me, and smote me down, therefore I will joust with him. Ye shall not do so, said Sir Lamorak, by my counsel, and ye will tell me your quarrel, whether ye jousted at his request, or he at yours. Nay, said Sir Frol, I jousted with him at my request. Sir, said Lamorak, then will I counsel ye deal no more with him, for me seemeth, by his countenance, he should be a noble knight, and no japer, for me thinketh, he should be of the table round. Therefore I will not spare, said Sir Frol, and then he cried and said, Sir Knight, make thee ready to joust. That needeth not, said the White Knight, for I have no lust to joust with thee. But yet they footed their spears, and the White Knight overthrew Sir Frol, and then he rode his way a soft pace. Then Sir Lamorak rode after him, and prayed him to tell him his name. For me seemeth, he should be of the fellowship of the round table. Upon a covenant, said he, I will tell you my name, so that ye will not discover my name, and also that ye will tell me yours. Then, said he, my name is Sir Lamorak de Gallis, and my name is Sir Launcelot du Lake. Then they put up their swords, and kissed heartily together, and either made great joy of other. Sir, said Sir Lamorak, and it please you, I will do you service. God defend, said Launcelot, that any of so noble a blood as ye be should do me service. Then he said, More, I am in a quest that I must do myself alone. Now God speed you, said Sir Lamorak, and so they departed. Then Sir Lamorak came to Sir Frol, and horsed him again. What knight is that? said Sir Frol. Sir, he said, it is not for you to know, nor it is no point of my charge. Ye are the more uncourteous, said Sir Frol, and therefore I will depart from you. Ye may do as ye list, said Sir Lamorak, and yet by my company ye have saved the fairest flower of your garland. So they departed. Chapter 41 then within two or three days Sir Lamorak found a knight at a well sleeping, and his lady sat with him and waked. Right so came Sir Gawain, and took the knight's lady, and set her up behind his squire. So Sir Lamorak rode after Sir Gawain, and said, Sir Gawain, turn again. And then said Sir Gawain, What will ye do with me? For I am nephew unto King Arthur. Sir, said he, for that cause I will spare you else that lady should abide with me, or else ye should joust with me. Then Sir Gawain turned him, and ran to him that ought the lady with his spear, but the knight with pure might smote down Sir Gawain, and took his lady with him. All this Sir Lamorak saw, and said to himself, But I revenge my fellow, he will say of me dishonour in King Arthur's court. Then Sir Lamorak returned, and proffered that knight to joust. Sir, said he, I am ready. And there they came together, 
with all their might. And there Sir Lamorak smote the knight through both sides, that he fell to the earth dead. Then that lady rode to that knight's brother, that hight Bellians Leorgulus, that dwelt fast thereby, and then she told him how his brother was slain. Alas, said he, I will be revenged. And so he horsed him, and armed him, and within a while he overtook Sir Lamorak, and bade him, Turn and leave that lady, for thou and I must play a new play, for thou hast slain my brother, Sir Frol, that was a better knight than ever wert thou. It might well be, said Sir Lamorak, but this day in the field I was found the better. So they rode together, and unhorsed other, and turned their shields, and drew their swords, and fought mightily, as noble knights proved, by the space of two hours. So then Sir Bellians prayed him to tell him his name. Sir, said he, my name is Sir Lamorak de Gallis. Ah, said Sir Bellians, thou art the man in the world that I most hate, for I slew my sons for thy sake, where I saved thy life, and now thou hast slain my brother, Sir Frol. Alas, how should I be accorded with thee? Therefore defend thee, for thou shalt die. There is none other remedy. Alas, said Sir Lamorak, full well me ought to know you, for ye are the man that most have done for me. And therewithal Sir Lamorak kneeled down and besought him of grace. Arise, said Sir Bellians, or else there as thou kneelest I shall slay thee. That shall not need, said Sir Lamorak, for I will yield me unto you, not for fear of you, nor for your strength, but your goodness maketh me full loath to have ado with you. Wherefore I require you for God's sake, and for the honour of knighthood, forgive me all that I have offended unto you. Alas, said Balians, leave thy kneeling, or else I shall slay thee without mercy. Then they yeed again unto battle, and either wounded other, that all the ground was bloody thereas they fought. And at the last Bellians withdrew him aback, and set him down softly upon a little hill, for he was so faint for bleeding that he might not stand. Then Sir Lamorak threw his shield upon his back, and asked him what cheer. Well, said Sir Balians, ah, sir, yet shall I show you favour in your malice. Ah, knight Sir Balians, said Sir Lamorak, thou art a fool, for an I had had thee at such advantage as thou hast done me, I should slay thee. But thy gentleness is so good and so large, that I must needs forgive thee mine evil will. And then Sir Lamorak kneeled down, and unlaced first his umbiriri, and then his own, and then either kissed other with weeping tears. Then Sir Lamorak led Sir Balians into an abbey fast by, and there Sir Lamorak would not depart from Balians till he was whole. And then they swore together that none of them should ever fight against other. So Sir Lamorak departed, and went to the court of King Arthur. Here leave we of Sir Lamorak and of Sir Tristram, and here beginneth the history of La Côte Maltel. End of Book 8, Chapters 39-41 to 41. Recorded by Gesine in December 2007
and within short space ye shall know that I am of good kin. It may well be, said Sir Kay, the seneschal, but in mockage ye shall be called La Cote Maltai, that is as much to say, the evil-shapen coat. It is a great thing thou askest, said the king, and for what cause wearest thou that rich coat? Tell me, for I can well think for some cause it is. Sir, he answered, I had a father, a noble knight, and as he rode a-hunting upon a day, it happed him to lay down to sleep, and there came a knight that had been long his enemy, and when he saw he was fast asleep, he all to hew him, and this same coat had my father on the same time, and that maketh this coat to sit so evil upon me, for the strokes be on it as I found it, and never shall be amended for me. Thus to have my father's death in remembrance I wear this coat till I be revenged, and because ye are called the most noblest king of the world, I came to you that ye should make me knight. Sir, said Sir Lamorak and Sir Gaharis, it were well done to make him knight, for him beseemeth well of person and of countenance, that he shall prove a good man and a good knight, and a mighty. For, sir, an ye be remembered, even such one was Sir Lancelot du Lac, when he came first into this court, and full few of us knew from whence he came, and now is he proved the man of most worship in the world, and all your court, and all your round table, is by Sir Lancelot worshipped and amended, more than by any knight now living. That is truth, said the king, and to-morrow, at your request, I shall make him knight. So, on the morrow, there was an hart found, and thither rode King Arthur, with a company of his knights, to slay the hart. And this young man, that Sir Kay named La Cote Maltai, was there left behind with Queen Guinevere. And by sudden adventure there was an horrible lion kept in a strong tower of stone, and it happened that he at that time brake loose, and came hurling afore the queen and her knights. And when the queen saw the lion she cried and fled, and prayed her knights to rescue her. And there was none of them all but twelve that abode, and all the others fled. Then said La Cote Maltai, Now I see well that all coward knights be not dead and therewithal he drew his sword, and dressed him afore the lion. And that lion gaped wide, and came upon him, ramping to have slain him. And then he smote him in the midst of the head, such a mighty stroke, that it clave his head in sunder, and dashed to the earth. Then was it told the queen how the young man, that Sir Kay named by scorn, La Cote Maltai, had slain the lion. With that the king came home. And when the queen told him of that adventure, he was well pleased, and said, Upon pain of mine head, he shall prove a noble man, and a faithful knight, and true of his promise. Then the king forthwithal made him knight. Now, sir, said this young knight, I require you, and all the knights of your court, that ye call me by none other name but La Cote Maltai and insomuch as Sir Kay hath so named me, so will I be called. I sent me well thereto, said the king. Chapter 2 How a damosel came into the court, and desired a knight to take on him an enquest, which La Cote Maltai emprised. Then that same day there came a damosel into the court, and she brought with her a great black shield with a white hand in the midst, holding a sword. Other picture was there none in that shield. When King Arthur saw her, he asked her from whence she came, and what she would. Sir, she said, I have ridden long and many a day with this shield many ways, and for this cause I am come to your court. There was a good knight that ought this shield, and this knight had undertaken a great deed of arms to enchieve it. And so it misfortuned him, another strong knight met with him by sudden adventure, and there they fought long, and either wounded other, passing sore. And they were so weary that they left that battle even hand. So this knight that ought this shield saw none other way but he must die, and then he commanded me to bear this shield to the court of King Arthur, he requiring and praying some good knight to take this shield, and that he would fulfil the quest that he was in. 
Now what say ye to this quest? said King Arthur. Is there any of you here that will take upon him to wield this shield? Then was there not one that would speak one word. Then Sir Kay took the shield in his hands. Sir Knight, said the damosel, what is your name? Wit ye well, said he, my name is Sir Kay the Seneschal, that wide where is known. Sir, said that damosel, lay down that shield, for wit ye well it falleth not for you, for he must be a better knight than ye that shall wield this shield. Damosel, said Sir Kay, wit ye well I took this shield in my hands by your leave for to behold it, not to that intent. But go wheresomever thou wilt, for I will not go with you. Then the damosel stood still a great while, and beheld many of those knights. Then spake the knight, La Cote Maltai, Fair damosel, I will take the shield and that adventure upon me, so I wist I should know whitherward my journey might be, for because I was this day made knight, I would take this adventure upon me. What is your name, fair young man? said the damosel. My name is, said he, La Cote Maltai. Well mayest thou be called so, said the damosel, the knight with the ill-shapen coat. But an thou be so hardy to take upon thee to bear that shield and to follow me, wit thou well thy skin shall be as well hewn as thy coat. As for that, said La Cote Maltai, when I am so hewn, I will ask you no salve to heal me withal. And forthwithal there came into the court two squires, and brought him great horses, and his armour, and his spears, and anon he was armed, and took his leave. I would not by my will, said the king, that ye took upon you that hard adventure. Sir, said he, this adventure is mine, and the first that ever I took upon me, and that will I follow, whatsoever come of me. Then that damosel departed, and La Cote Maltai fast followed after. And within a while he overtook the damosel, and anon she missaid him in the foulest manner. Chapter 3 How La Cote Maltai overthrew Sir Dagonet, the king's fool, and of the rebuke that he had of the damosel. Then Sir Kay ordained Sir Dagonet, King Arthur's fool, to follow after La Cote Maltai, and there Sir Kay ordained that Sir Dagonet was horsed and armed, and bade him follow La Cote Maltai, and proffer him to joust, and so he did. And when he saw La Cote Maltai, he cried, and bade him make him ready to joust. So Sir La Cote Maltai smote Sir Dagonet over his horse's croup. Then the damosel mocked La Cote Maltai, and said, Fie for shame! Now art thou shamed in Arthur's court, when they send a fool to have ado with thee, and specially at thy first jousts. Thus she rode long, and chid. And within a while there came Sir Bleberis, the good knight, and there he jousted with La Cote Maltai, and there Sir Bleberis smote him so sore, that horse and all fell to the earth. Then La Cote Maltai arose up lightly, and dressed his shield, and drew his sword, and would have done battle to the utterance for he was wood wroth. Not so, said Sir Bleberis de Ganis, as at this time I will not fight upon foot. Then the damosel, Maldisant, rebuked him in the foulest manner, and bade him, Turn again, coward. Ah, damosel, he said, I pray you of mercy to missay me no more. My grief is enough, though ye give me no more. I call myself never the worse knight when a mare's son faileth me, and also I count me never the worse knight for a fall of Sir Bleberis. So thus he rode with her two days, and by fortune there came Sir Palomides, and encountered with him, and he in the same wise served him as did Bleberis to forehand. What dost thou here in my fellowship? said the damosel Maldisant. Thou canst not sit no knight, nor withstand him one buffet, but if it were Sir Dagonet. Ah, fair damosel, I am not the worse to take a fool of Sir Palomides, and yet great disworship have I none, for neither Bleberis nor yet Palomides would not fight with me on foot. As for that, said the damosel, wit thou well they have disdain and scorn to light off their horses to fight with such a lewd knight as thou art. So in the meanwhile there came Sir Mordred, Sir Gawain's brother, and so he fell in the fellowship with the damosel Maldisant. 
and then they came afore the castle Orgulus. And there was such a custom, that there might no knight come by that castle, but either he must joust or be prisoner, or at the least to lose his horse and his harness. And there came out two knights against them, and Sir Mordred jousted with the foremost, and that knight of the castle smote Sir Mordred down off his horse. And then La Corte Maltai jousted with that other, and either of them smote other down, horse and all, to the earth. And when they avoided their horses, then either of them took others' horses. And then La Cote Maltai rode unto that knight that smote down Sir Mordred, and jousted with him. And there Sir La Cote Maltai hurt and wounded him passing sore, and put him from his horse, as he had been dead. So he turned unto him that met him afore, and he took the flight towards the castle, and Sir La Cote Maltai rode after him into the castle Orgulus and there La Cote Maltai slew him. Chapter 4 How La Cote Maltai fought against an hundred knights, and how he escaped by the mean of a lady. And anon there came an hundred knights about him, and assailed him, and when he saw his horse should be slain, he alighted and voided his horse, and put the bridle under his feet, and so put him out of the gate. And when he had so done, he hurled in among them, and dressed his back unto a lady's chamber wall, thinking himself that he had liefer die there with worship than to abide the rebukes of the damoiselle Maldisant. And in the meantime, as he stood and fought, that lady, whose was the chamber, went out slyly at her postern, and without the gates she found La Cote Maltai's horse, and lightly she gat him by the bridle, and tied him to the postern. And then she went unto her chamber slyly again, for to behold how that one knight fought against an hundred knights. And when she had beheld him long, she went to a window behind his back, and said, Thou knight, thou fightest wonderly well, but for all that at the last thou must needs die, but an thou canst through thy mighty prowess win unto yonder postern, for there have I fastened thy horse to abide thee. But wit thou well, thou must think on thy worship, and think not to die, for thou mayst not win unto that postern without thou do nobly and mightily. When La Corte Maltai heard her say so, he gripped his sword in his hands, and put his shield fair afore him, and through the thickest press he thrilled through them. And when he came to the postern, he found there ready four knights, and at two the first strokes he slew two of the knights, and the other fled and so he won his horse, and rode from them. And all as it was, it was rehearsed in King Arthur's court, how he slew twelve knights within the castle Orgulus, and so he rode on his way. And in the meantime the damosel said to Sir Mordred, I ween my foolish knight be either slain or taken prisoner. Then were they where, where he came riding? And when he was come unto them, he told all how he had sped and escaped in despite of them all and some of the best of them will tell no tales. Thou liest falsely, said the damoiselle, that dare I make good. But as a fool and a dastard to all knighthood, they have let thee pass. That may ye prove, said La Cote Maltai. With that she sent a courier of hers, that rode all way with her, for to know the truth of this deed. And so he rode thither lightly, and asked how and in what manner that La Cote Maltai was escaped out of the castle. Then all the knights cursed him, and said that he was a fiend and no man, for he hath slain here twelve of our best knights, and we weened unto this day that it had been too much for Sir Lancelot du Lac, or for Sir Tristram de Lyonnes. And in despite of us all he is departed from us, and maugre our heads. With this answer the courier departed, and came to Maldisant his lady, and told her all how Sir La Cote Maltai had sped at the castle Orgulus. Then she smote down her head, and said little. By my head, said Sir Mordred to the damoiselle, ye are greatly to blame so as to rebuke him, for I warn you plainly, he is a good knight, and I doubt not, but he shall prove a noble knight. But as yet he may not yet sit sure on horseback, for he that shall be a good horseman, it must come of usage and exercise. But when he cometh to the strokes of his sword, he is then noble and mighty. 
and that saw Sir Bleberis and Sir Palamedes, for wit ye well they are wily men of arms, and anon they know when they see a young knight by his riding, how they are sure to give him a fall from his horse, or a great buffet. But for the most part they will not light on foot with young knights, for they are white and strongly armed. For in likewise Sir Launcelot du Lac, when he was first made knight, he was often put to the worse upon horseback, but ever upon foot he recovered his renown, and slew and defoiled many knights of the round table. And therefore the rebukes that Sir Launcelot did unto many knights, causeth them that be men of prowess to beware. For often I have seen the old proved knights rebuked and slain by them that were but young beginners. Thus they rode sure talking by the way together. CHAPTER V how Sir Launcelot came to the court, and heard of La Côte Maltai, and how he followed after him, and how La Côte Maltai was prisoner. Here leave we off a while of this tale, and speak we of Sir Launcelot du Lac, that when he was come to the court of King Arthur, then heard he tell of the young knight La Côte Maltai, how he slew the lion, and how he took upon him the adventure of the black shield, the which was named at that time the hardiest adventure of the world. So God me save, said Sir Launcelot, unto many of his fellows. It was shame to all the noble knights to suffer such a young knight to take such adventure upon him for his destruction. For I will that ye wit, said Sir Launcelot, that that damoiselle Maldisant hath borne that shield many a day for to seek the most proved knights, and that was she that Breurs sans pitié took that shield from her. And after Tristram de Lyonnais rescued that shield from him, and gave it to the damoiselle again, a little afore that time that Sir Tristram fought with my nephew, Sir Blamor de Ganis, for a quarrel that was betwixt the King of Ireland and him. Then many knights were sorry that Sir La Côte Maltai was gone forth to that adventure. Truly, said Sir Launcelot, I cast me to ride after him. And within seven days Sir Launcelot overtook La Côte Maltai, and then he saluted him and the damoiselle Maldisant. And when Sir Mordred saw Sir Launcelot, then he left their fellowship. And so Sir Launcelot rode with them all the day, and ever that damoiselle rebuked La Côte Maltai, and then Sir Launcelot answered for him. Then she left off, and rebuked Sir Launcelot. So this meantime Sir Tristram sent by a damoiselle a letter unto Sir Launcelot, excusing him of the wedding of Isot la Blanche Mince, and said in the letter, as he was a true knight, he had never ado fleshly with Isot la Blanche Mince. And passing courteously and gently, Sir Tristram wrote unto Sir Launcelot, ever beseeching him to be his good friend, and unto la belle Isot of Cornwall, and that Sir Launcelot would excuse him if that ever he saw her. And within short time, by the grace of God, said Sir Tristram, that he would speak with La Belle Isolte, and with him right hastily. Then Sir Launcelot departed from the damoiselle, and from Sir La Côte Maltai, for to oversee that letter, and to write another letter unto Sir Tristram de Lyonnais. And in the meanwhile La Côte Maltai rode with the damoiselle until they came to a castle that hight Pendragon. And there were six knights stood afore him, and one of them proffered to joust with La Côte Maltai. And there La Côte Maltai smote him over his horse's croup. And then the five knights set upon him all at once with their spears, and there they smote La Côte Maltai down, horse and man. And then they alighted suddenly, and set their hands upon him all at once, and took him prisoner, and so led him unto the castle, and kept him as prisoner. And on the morn Sir Launcelot arose, and delivered the damoiselle with letters unto Sir Tristram, and then he took his way after La Côte Maltai. And by the way, upon a bridge, there was a knight proffered Sir Launcelot to joust, and Sir Launcelot smote him down, and then they fought upon foot a noble battle together, and a mighty, and at last Sir Launcelot smote him down, grovelling upon his hands and his knees. And then that knight yielded him, and Sir Launcelot received him fair. Sir, said the knight, I require you tell me your name, for much my heart giveth unto you. Nay, said Sir Launcelot, as at this time I will not tell you my name, unless then that ye tell me your name. Certainly, said the knight, 
My name is Sir Nerovence, that was made knight of my lord Sir Launcelot du Lac. Ah, Nerovence de Lille, said Sir Launcelot, I am right glad that ye are proved a good knight, for now wit ye well my name is Sir Launcelot du Lac. Alas, said Sir Nerovence de Lille, what have I done? And therewithal, flatling, he fell to his feet, and would have kissed them, but Sir Launcelot would not let him, and then either made great joy of other. And then Sir Nerovence told Sir Launcelot that he should not go by the castle of Pendragon, for there is a lord, a mighty knight, and many knights with him, and this knight I heard say that they took a knight prisoner yesterday that rode with a damosel, and they say he is a knight of the round table. End of chapter 5「Section 39 being Book 9, Chapters 6 to 11 of Volume 1 of Le Mort d'Arthur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Le Mort d'Arthur, Volume 1 by Sir Thomas Mallory. Book 9, Chapters 6 to eleven. Chapter six. How Sir Launcelot fought with six knights, and after with Sir Brian, and how he delivered the prisoners. Ah, said Sir Launcelot, that knight is my fellow, and him shall I rescue, or else I shall lose my life therefore. And therewithal he rode fast, till he came before the castle of Pendragon. And anon therewithal there came six knights, and all made them ready to set upon Sir Launcelot at once. Then Sir Launcelot futed his spear, and smote the foremost, that he brake his back in sunder, and three of them hit, and three failed. And then Sir Launcelot passed through them, and lightly he turned in again, and smote another knight through the breast, and throughout the back more than an ell, and therewithal his spear brake. So then all the remnant of the four knights drew their swords and lashed at Sir Launcelot, and at every stroke Sir Launcelot bestowed so his strokes, that at four strokes sundry they avoided their saddles, passing sore wounded, and forth with all he rode hurling into that castle. And anon the lord of the castle, that was that time clept Sir Brian de Les Isles, the which was a noble man and a great enemy unto King Arthur, within a while he was armed and upon horseback. And then they futed their spears, and hurled together so strongly that both their horses rashed to the earth. And then they avoided their saddles, and dressed their shields, and drew their swords, and flang together as wood men. And there were many strokes given in a while. At the last Sir Launcelot gave to Sir Brian such a buffet that he kneeled upon his knees, and then Sir Launcelot rashed upon him, and with great force he pulled off his helm, and when Sir Brian saw that he should be slain, he yielded him, and put him in his mercy and in his grace. Then Sir Launcelot made him to deliver all his prisoners that he had within his castle, and therein Sir Launcelot found of Arthur's knights thirty and forty ladies, and so he delivered them, and then he rode his way. And anon, as La Corte Maltai was delivered, he gat his horse, and his harness, and his damoiselle, Maltisant. The meanwhile Sir Nerovence, that Sir Launcelot had foughten withal afore at the bridge, he sent a damosel after Sir Launcelot, to wit how he sped at the castle of Pendragon. And then they within the castle marvelled what knight he was, when Sir Brian and his knights delivered all those prisoners. "'Have ye no marvel?' said the damosel, "'for the best knight in this world was here, and did this journey, and wit ye well,' she said, "'it was Sir Launcelot.' Then was Sir Brian full glad, and so was his lady and all his knights, that such a man should win them. And when the damoiselle and La Corte Maltai understood that it was Sir Launcelot du Lac that had ridden with them in fellowship, and that she remembered her how she had rebuked him and called him coward, then she was passing heavy. Chapter 7 How Sir Launcelot met with the damoiselle named Maldisante, and named her the damoiselle bien pensante. So then they took their horses, and rode forth apace after Sir Launcelot. And within two mile they overtook him, and saluted him, and thanked him, 
and the damoiselle cried Sir Launcelot mercy of her evil deed, and saying, For now I know the flower of all knighthood is departed even between Sir Tristram and you. For God knoweth, said the damoiselle, that I have sought you, my lord, Sir Launcelot, and Sir Tristram, long, and now I thank God I have met with you. And once at Camelot I met with Sir Tristram, and there he rescued this black shield with the white hand holding a naked sword that Sir Breuse sans pitié had taken from me. Now, fair damoiselle, said Sir Launcelot, who told you my name? Sir, said she, there came a damoiselle from a knight that ye fought withal at the bridge, and she told me your name was Sir Launcelot du Lac. Blame have she then, said Sir Launcelot, but her lord, Sir Nerevents, hath told her. But damoiselle, said Sir Launcelot, upon this covenant I will ride with you, so that ye will not rebuke this knight, Sir La Cote Maltai, no more. For he is a good knight, and I doubt not he shall prove a noble knight. And for his sake, and pity that he should not be destroyed, I followed him to succour him in this great need. Ah, jeez, you thank you, said the demoiselle, for now I will say unto you and to him both, I rebuked him never for no hate that I hated him, but for great love that I had to him. For ever I supposed that he had been too young and too tender to take upon him these adventures. And therefore, by my will, I would have driven him away for jealousy that I had of his life, for it may be no young knight's deed that shall achieve this adventure to the end. Pardieu, said Sir Launcelot, it is well said, and where ye are called the damoiselle maldisante, I will call you the Damoiselle bien pensant. And so they rode forth a great while, until they came to the border of the country of Sourlouse, and there they found a fair village, with a strong bridge like a fortress. And when Sir Launcelot and they were at the bridge, there stirred forth afore them of gentlemen and yeomen many, that said, Fair lords, ye may not pass this bridge and this fortress, because of that black shield that I see one of you bear and therefore there shall not pass but one of you at once. Therefore choose you which of you shall enter within this bridge first. Then Sir Launcelot proffered himself first to enter within this bridge. Sir, said La Cote Maltai, I beseech you, let me enter within this fortress, and if I may speed well, I will send for you. And if it happens that I be slain, there it goeth. And if so be that I am a prisoner taken, then may ye rescue me. I am loath, said Sir Launcelot, to let you pass this passage. Sir, said La Cote Maltais, I pray you let me put my body in this adventure. Now go your way, said Sir Launcelot, and jeez you be your speed. So he entered, and anon there met with him two brethren, the one hight Sir Plan de Force, and the other hight Sir Plan d'Amour. And anon they met with Sir La Cote Maltais, and first La Cote Maltais smote down Plan de Force, and after he smote down Plan d'Amour. And then they dressed them to their shields and swords, and bade La Cote Maltais alight, and so he did. And there was dashing and foining with swords, and so they began to assail full hard La Cote Maltais, and many great wounds they gave him upon his head, and upon his breast, and upon his shoulders. And as he might, ever among, he gave sad strokes again. And then the two brethren traced and traversed, for to be of both hands of Sir La Cote Maltais, but he by fine force and knightly prowess gat them afore him. And then, when he felt himself so wounded, then he doubled his strokes, and gave them so many wounds that he felled them to the earth, and would have slain them had they not yielded them. And right so Sir La Cote Maltais took the best horse that there was of them three, and so rode forth his way to the other fortress and bridge. And there he met with the third brother, whose name was Sir Plenorius, a full noble knight. And there they jousted together, and either smote other down, horse and man, to the earth. And then they avoided their horses, and dressed their shields, and drew their swords, and gave many sad strokes and one while the one knight was afore on the bridge, and another while the other. And thus they fought two hours and more, and never rested, and ever Sir Launcelot and the damoiselle beheld them. Alas, said the damoiselle, my knight fighteth passing sore and over long. Now may ye see, said Sir Launcelot, that he is a noble knight, for to consider his first battle and his grievous wounds, 
and even forthwithal so wounded as he is, it is marvel that he may endure this long battle with that good knight. Chapter 8 How La Côte Maltai was taken prisoner, and after rescued by Sir Lancelot, and how Sir Lancelot overcame four brethren. This meanwhile, Sir La Côte Maltai sank right down upon the earth, what four wounded and what four bled he might not stand. Then the other knight had pity of him, and said, Fair young knight, dismay you not, for had ye been fresh when ye met with me, as I was, I wot well that I should not have endured so long as ye have done. And therefore, for your noble deeds of arms, I shall show to you kindness and gentleness in all that I may. And forthwithal this noble knight, Sir Plenorius, took him up in his arms, and led him into his tower. And then he commanded him the wine, and made to search him, and to stop his bleeding wounds. Sir, said La Côte Maltai, withdraw you from me, and hie you to yonder bridge again, for there will meet with you another manner knight than ever was I. Why, said Sir Plenorius, is there another manner knight behind of your fellowship? Yea, said La Côte Maltai, there is a much better knight than I am. What is his name? said Plenorius. Ye shall not know for me, said La Côte Maltai. Well, said the knight, he shall be encountered with all, whatsoever he be. Then Sir Plenorius heard a knight call that said, Sir Plenorius, where art thou? Either thou must deliver me the prisoner that thou hast led into thy tower, or else come and do battle with me. Then Plenorius gat his horse, and came with the spear in his hand, walloping towards Sir Launcelot and then they began to futter their spears, and came together as thunder, and smote either other so mightily that their horses fell down under them. And then they avoided their horses, and pulled out their swords, and like two bulls they lashed together with great strokes and foins. But ever Sir Launcelot recovered ground upon him, and Sir Plenorius traced to have gone about him, but Sir Launcelot would not suffer that, but bear him backer and backer, till he came nigh his tower gate. And then said Sir Launcelot, I know thee well for a good knight, but wit thou well thy life and death is in my hand, and therefore yield thee to me, and thy prisoner. The other answered no word, but struck mightily upon Sir Launcelot's helm, that the fire sprang out of his eyes. Then Sir Launcelot doubled his stroke so thick, and smote at him so mightily, that he made him kneel upon his knees. And therewith Sir Launcelot leapt upon him, and pulled him grovelling down. Then Sir Plenorius yielded him, and his tower, and all his prisoners at his will. Then Sir Launcelot received him, and took his troth, and then he rode to the other bridge, and there Sir Launcelot jousted with the other three of his brethren, the one height Pilunis, and the other height Pelogris, and the third height Sir Pelandris. And first upon horseback Sir Launcelot smote them down, and afterward he beat them on foot, and made them to yield them unto him. And then he returned unto Sir Plenorius, and there he found in his prison King Carados of Scotland, and many other knights, and all they were delivered. And then Sir La Côte Maltai came to Sir Launcelot, and then Sir Launcelot would have given him all these fortresses and these bridges. Nay, said La Côte Maltai, I will not have Sir Plenorius's livelihood. With that he will grant you, my lord Sir Launcelot, to come unto King Arthur's court, and to be his knight, and all his brethren. I will pray you, my lord, to let him have his livelihood. I will well, said Sir Launcelot, with this that he will come to the court of King Arthur, and become his man, and his brethren five. And as for you, Sir Plenorius, I will undertake, said Sir Launcelot, at the next feast, so there be a place voided, that ye shall be knight of the round table. Sir, said Plenorius, at the next feast of Pentecost I will be at Arthur's court, and at that time I will be guided and ruled as King Arthur, and ye will have me. Then Sir Launcelot and Sir La Côte Maltai reposed them there, unto the time that Sir La Côte Maltai was whole of his wounds, and there they had merry cheer and good rest, and many good games, and there were many fair ladies. CHAPTER Nine, How Sir Launcelot made La Côte Maltai lord of the castle of Pendragon, and after was made knight of the round table. And in the meanwhile came Sir Kay the seneschal, and Sir Brandilis, and anon they fellowshipped with them. 
and then within ten days then departed those knights of Arthur's court from these fortresses. And as Sir Launcelot came by the castle of Pendragon, there he put Sir Brian de Les Isles from his lands, for cause he would never be withhold with King Arthur. And all that castle of Pendragon, and all the lands thereof, he gave to Sir Lacot Maltai. And then Sir Launcelot sent for Nerevents, that he made once knight, and he made him to have all the rule of that castle and of that country under La Cote Maltai. And so they rode to Arthur's court all wholly together. And at Pentecost next following there was Sir Plenorius and Sir La Cote Maltai, called otherwise by right Sir Bruno le Noir, both made knights of the table round, and great lands King Arthur gave them, and there Bruno le Noir wedded that damoiselle Maldisant, and after she was called Beau Vivant, but ever after, for the more part, he was called La Corte Maltai, and he proved a passing noble knight, and mighty, and many worshipful deeds he did after in his life. And Sir Plenorius proved a noble knight, and full of prowess, and all the days of their life for the most part they awaited upon Sir Launcelot, and Sir Plenorius's brethren were ever knights of King Arthur. And also, as the French book maketh mention, Sir La Corte Maltai avenged his father's death. Chapter 10. How La Belle Isoud sent letters to Sir Tristram by her maid Bragwine, and of diverse adventures of Sir Tristram. Now leave we here Sir La Corte Maltai, and turn we unto Sir Tristram de Lyonnais that was in Brittany. When La Belle Isoud understood that he was wedded, she sent to him by her maiden Bragwine as piteous letters as could be thought and made, and her conclusion was that, and it pleased Sir Tristram, that he would come to her and bring with him Isolt la Blanche Masse, and they should be kept as well as she herself. Then Sir Tristram called unto him Sir Cahidius, and asked him whether he would go with him into Cornwall secretly. He answered him that he was ready at all times. And then he let ordain privily a little vessel, and therein they went, Sir Tristram, Cahidius, Dame Bragwine, and Gouvernai, Sir Tristram's squire. So when they were in the sea, a contrarious wind blew them on the coasts of North Wales, nigh the castle Perilous. Then said Sir Tristram, Here shall ye abide me these ten days, and Gouvernai, my squire, with you. And if so be I come not again by that day, take the next way into Cornwall, for in this forest are many strange adventures, as I have heard say, and some of them I cast me to prove, or I depart, and when I may I shall hie me after you. Then Sir Tristram and Cahidius took their horses, and departed from their fellowship. And so they rode within that forest a mile and more, and at the last Sir Tristram saw afore him a likely knight, armed, sitting by a well, and a strong mighty horse passing nigh him tied to an oak, and a man hoving and riding by him leading an horse laden with spears. And this knight that sat at the well seemed by his countenance to be passing heavy. Then Sir Tristram rode near him and said, Fair knight, why sit ye so drooping? Ye seem to be a knight-errant by your arms and harness, and therefore dress you to joust with one of us, or with both. Therewithal the knight made no words, but took his shield and buckled it about his neck, and lightly he took his horse and leapt upon him. And then he took a great spear of his squire, and departed his way a furlong. Sir Cahidius asked leave of Sir Tristram to joust first. "'Do your best,' said Sir Tristram. So they met together, and there Sir Cahidius had a fall, and was sore wounded on high above the paps. Then Sir Tristram said, Knight, that is well jousted, now make you ready unto me. I am ready, said the knight. And then that knight took a greater spear in his hands, and encountered with Sir Tristram. And there, by great force, that knight smote down Sir Tristram from his horse, and had a great fall. Then Sir Tristram was sore ashamed, and lightly he avoided his horse, and put his shield afore his shoulder, and drew his sword. And then Sir Tristram required that knight of his knighthood to alight upon foot and fight with him. I will well, said the knight, and so he alighted upon foot, and avoided his horse, and cast his shield upon his shoulder, and drew his sword, and there they fought a long battle together, full nigh two hours. 
Then Sir Tristram said, Fair knight, hold thine hand, and tell me of whence thou art, and what is thy name. As for that, said the knight, I will be advised. But an thou wilt tell me thy name, peradventure I will tell thee mine. Chapter 11 How Sir Tristram met with Sir Lamorak de Galis, and how they fought, and after accorded never to fight together. Now, fair knight, he said, my name is Sir Tristram de Lyonnais. Sir, said the other knight, and my name is Sir Lamorak de Galis. Ah, Sir Lamorak, said Sir Tristram, well be we met, and bethink thee now of the despite thou didst me of the sending of the horn unto King Mark's court, to the intent to have slain or dishonoured my lady the Queen, La Belle Isolt. And therefore wit thou well, said Sir Tristram, the one of us shall die, or we depart. Sir, said Sir Lamorak, remember that we were together in the Isle of Servage, and at that time ye promised me great friendship. Then Sir Tristram would make no longer delays, but lashed at Sir Lamorak, and thus they fought, till either were weary of other. Then Sir Tristram said to Sir Lamorak, In all my life met I never with such a knight that was so big and well breathed as ye be, Therefore, said Sir Tristram, it were pity that any of us both should here be mischieved. Sir, said Sir Lamorak, for your renown and name I will that ye have the worship of this battle, and therefore I will yield me unto you. And therewith he took the point of his sword to yield him. Nay, said Sir Tristram, ye shall not do so, for well I know your proffers, and more of your gentleness than for any fear or dread ye have of me. And therewithal Sir Tristram proffered him his sword, and said, Sir Lamorak, as an overcome knight, I yield me unto you as to a man of the most noble prowess that ever I met withal. Nay, said Sir Lamorak, I will do you gentleness. I require you, let us be sworn together, that never none of us shall, after this day, have ado with other. And therewithal Sir Tristram and Sir Lamorak swear that never none of them should fight against other, nor for weal, nor for woe. End of chapter 11
I require you, if you hap to meet with Sir Palomides, say him that he shall find me at the same well where I met him, and there I, Sir Tristram, shall prove whether he be better knight than I. And so either departed from other a sundry way. And Sir Tristram rode nigh thereas was Sir Cahidius. And Sir Lamorak rode until he came to a chapel, and there he put his horse unto pasture. And anon there came Sir Meliagaunce, that was King Bagdemagus' son, and he there put his horse to pasture, and was not ware of Sir Lamorak. And then this knight, Sir Meliagaunce, made his moan of the love that he had to Queen Guinevere, and there he made a woeful complaint. All this heard Sir Lamorak, and on the morn Sir Lamorak took his horse and rode unto the forest, and there he met with two knights hoving under the woodshore. Fair knight, said Sir Lamorak, what do ye hoving here and watching? And if ye be knights errant that will joust, lo, I am ready. Nay, Sir Knight, they said, not so. We abide not here to joust with you, but we lie here in a wait of a knight that slew our brother. What knight was that, said Sir Lamorak, that you would fain meet withal? Sir, they said, it is Sir Lancelot that slew our brother, and if ever we may meet with him, he shall not escape, but we shall slay him. Ye take upon you a great charge, said Sir Lamorak, for Sir Lancelot is a noble proved knight. As for that we doubt not, for then is none of us, but we are good enough for him. I will not believe that, said Sir Lamorak, for I heard never yet of no knight the days of my life, but Sir Lancelot was too big for him. Chapter 13 How Sir Lamorak met with Sir Meliagaunce, and fought together for the beauty of Dame Guinevere. Right so, as they stood talking thus, Sir Lamorak was ware how Sir Launcelot came riding straight towards them. Then Sir Lamorak saluted him, and he him again. And then Sir Lamorak asked Sir Launcelot if there were anything that he might do for him in these marches. Nay, said Sir Launcelot, not at this time, I thank you. Then either departed from other, and Sir Lamorak rode again thereas he left the two knights, and then he found them hid in the levered wood. Fie on you, said Sir Lamorak, false cowards! Pity and shame it is that any of you should take the high order of knighthood. So Sir Lamorak departed from them, and within a while he met with Sir Meliagaunce. And then Sir Lamorak asked him why he loved Queen Guinevere as he did. For I was not far from you when ye made your complaint by the chapel. Did ye so? said Sir Meliagaunce. Then will I abide by it. I love Queen Guinevere. What will ye with it? I will prove and make good that she is the fairest lady and most of beauty in the world. As to that, said Sir Lamorak, I say nay thereto. For Queen Morgorse of Orkney, mother to Sir Gawain, and his mother, is the fairest queen and lady that beareth the life. That is not so, said Sir Meliagaunce, and that will I prove with my hands upon thy body. Will ye so? said Sir Lamorak, and in a better quarrel keep I not to fight. Then they departed either from other in great wrath, and then they came riding together as it had been thunder, and either smote other so sore that their horses fell backward to the earth. And then they avoided their horses, and dressed their shields, and drew their swords, and then they hurtled together as wild boars, and thus they fought a great while. For Meliagaunce was a good man, and of great might, but Sir Lamorak was hard big for him, and put him always aback, but either had wounded other sore. And as they stood thus fighting, by fortune came Sir Launcelot and Sir Bleberis riding. And then Sir Launcelot rode betwixt them, and asked them for what cause they fought so together. And ye are both knights of King Arthur! Chapter 14 how Sir Meliagaunce told for what cause they fought, and how Sir Lamorak jousted with King Arthur. Sir, said Meliagaunce, I shall tell you for what cause we do this battle. I praised my lady, Queen Guinevere, and said she was the fairest lady of the world, and Sir Lamorak said nay thereto, for he said Queen Morgorse of Orkney was fairer than she, and more of beauty. Ah, Sir Lamorak, why sayest thou so? 
It is not thy part to dispraise thy princess that thou art under her obeisance, and we all. And therewith he alighted on foot, and said, For this quarrel make thee ready, for I will prove upon thee that Queen Guinevere is the fairest lady, and most of bounty in the world. Sir, said Sir Lamorak, I am loath to have ado with you in this quarrel, for every man thinketh his own lady fairest, and though I praise the lady that I love most, ye should not be wroth, for though my lady Queen Guinevere be fairest in your eye, which ye well Queen Morgorse of Orkney is fairest in mine eye, and so every knight thinketh his own lady fairest. And which ye well, sir, ye are the man in the world except Sir Tristram, that I am most loathest to have ado with all. But, and ye will needs fight with me, I shall endure you as long as I may. Then spake Sir Bleberis, and said, My lord, Sir Launcelot, I wished you never so misadvised as ye are now, for Sir Lamorak saith you but reason and knightly. For I warn you, I have a lady, and me thinketh that she is the fairest lady of the world. Were this a great reason that ye should be wroth with me for such language? And well ye wot, that Sir Lamorak is as noble a knight as I know, and he hath ought you and us ever good will. And therefore I pray you be good friends. Then Sir Launcelot said unto Sir Lamorak, I pray you forgive me mine evil will, and if I was misadvised I will amend it. Sir, said Sir Lamorak, the amends is soon made betwixt you and me. And so Sir Launcelot and Sir Bleberis departed, and Sir Meliagaunt and Sir Lamorak took their horses, and either departed from other. And within a while came King Arthur, and met with Sir Lamorak, and jousted with him, and there he smote down Sir Lamorak, and wounded him sore with a spear, and so he rode from him, wherefore Sir Lamorak was wroth that he would not fight with him on foot, howbeit that Sir Lamorak knew not King Arthur. Chapter 15 How Sir Kay met with Sir Tristram, and after of the shame spoken of the knights of Cornwall, and how they jousted. Now leave we of this tale, and speak we of Sir Tristram, that as he rode he met with Sir Kay the seneschal. And there Sir Kay asked Sir Tristram of what country he was. He answered that he was of the country of Cornwall. It may well be, said Sir Kay, for yet heard I never that ever good knight came out of Cornwall. That is evil spoken, said Sir Tristram, but an it please you to tell me your name, I require you. "'Sir, wit ye well,' said Sir Kay, "'that my name is Sir Kay the Seneschal.' "'Is that your name?' said Sir Tristram. "'Now wit ye well that ye are named "'the shamefullest knight of your tongue that now is living. "'Howbeit ye are called a good knight, "'but ye are called unfortunate, "'and passing overthwart of your tongue.' "'And thus they rode together till they came to a bridge. "'And there was a knight would not let them pass "'till one of them jousted with him.' and so that knight jousted with Sir Kay, and there that knight gave Sir Kay a fall. His name was Sir Tor, Sir Lamorak's half-brother. And then they two rode to their lodging, and there they found Sir Brandilis, and Sir Tor came thither anon after. And as they sat at supper these four knights, three of them spake all shame by Cornish knights. Sir Tristram heard all that they said, and he said but little, but he thought the more, but at that time he discovered not his name. Upon the morn Sir Tristram took his horse, and abode them upon their way, and there Sir Brandilis proffered to joust with Sir Tristram, and Sir Tristram smote him down, horse and all, to the earth. Then Sir Tor le Fils de Vesour encountered with Sir Tristram, and there Sir Tristram smote him down, and then he rode his way, and Sir Kay followed him, but he would not of his fellowship. Then Sir Brandilis came to Sir Kay and said, I would wit fain what is that knight's name. Come on with me, said Sir Kay, and we shall pray him to tell us his name. So they rode together till they came nigh him, and then they were ware where he sat by a well, and had put off his helm to drink at the well. And when he saw them come, he laced on his helm lightly, and took his horse and proffered them to joust. Nay, said Sir Brandilis, we jousted late enough with you, we come not in that intent, but for this we come, to require you of knighthood, to tell us your name. My fair knights, sithen that is your desire, and to please you, 
ye shall wit that my name is Sir Tristram de Lyonesse, nephew under King Mark of Cornwall. In good time, said Sir Brandiles, and well be ye found, and wit ye well that we be right glad that we have found you, and we be of a fellowship that would be right glad of your company. For ye are the knight in the world that the noble fellowship of the round table most desireth to have the company of. God thank them, said Sir Tristram, of their great goodness, but as yet I feel well that I am unable to be of their fellowship, for I was never yet of such deeds of worthiness to be in the company of such a fellowship. Ah, said Sir Kay, an ye be Sir Tristram de Lyonnes, ye are the man called now most of prowess except Sir Lancelot du Lac, for he beareth not the life, Christian nor heathen, that can find such another knight to speak of his prowess, and of his hands, and of his truth withal. For yet could there never creature say of him dishonour, and make it good. Thus they talked a great while, and then they departed, either from other, such ways as them seemed best. CHAPTER Sixteen, How King Arthur was brought into the forest perilous, and how Sir Tristram saved his life. Now shall ye hear what was the cause that King Arthur came into the forest perilous that was in North Wales, by the means of a lady. Her name was Anaur, and this lady came to King Arthur at Cardiff, and she by fair promise and fair behests made King Arthur to ride with her into that forest perilous, and she was a great sorceress, and many days she had loved King Arthur, and because she would have him to lie by her, she came into that country. So when the king was gone with her, many of his knights followed after King Arthur, when they missed him, as Sir Lancelot, Brandiles, and many other. And when she had brought him to her tower, she desired him to lie by her, and then the king remembered him of his lady, and would not lie by her for no craft that she could do. Then every day she would make him ride into that forest with his own knights, to the intent to have had King Arthur slain. For when this lady Anaur saw that she might not have him at her will, then she laboured by false means to have destroyed King Arthur, and slain. Then the lady of the lake, that was always friendly to King Arthur, she understood by her subtle crafts that King Arthur was like to be destroyed. And therefore this lady of the lake, that hight Nimu, came into that forest to seek after Sir Lancelot du Lac, or Sir Tristram, for to help King Arthur, for as that same day this lady of the lake knew well that King Arthur should be slain, unless that he had help of one of these knights. And thus she rode up and down till she met with Sir Tristram, and anon as she saw him she knew him. O oh, my lord Sir Tristram, she said, well be ye met, and blessed be the time that I have met with you, for this same day, and within these two hours, shall be done the foulest deed that ever was done in this land. "'Oh, fair damoiselle,' said Sir Tristram, "'may I amend it?' "'Come on with me,' she said, "'and that in all the haste ye may, "'for ye shall see the most worshipfullest knight of the world hard bestead.' "'Then,' said Sir Tristram, "'I am ready to help such a noble man.' "'He is neither better nor worse,' said the Lady of the Lake, "'but the noble King Arthur himself. "'God defend,' said Sir Tristram, "'that ever he should be in such distress.' Then they rode together a great pace, until they came to a little turret or castle, and underneath that castle they saw a knight standing upon foot, fighting with two knights. And so Sir Tristram beheld them, and at the last the two knights smote down the one knight, and that one of them unlaced his helm to have slain him, and the lady Anaur gat King Arthur's sword in her hand to have stricken off his head. And therewithal came Sir Tristram with all his might, crying, Traitress, traitress, leave that! And anon there Sir Tristram smote the one of the knights through the body, that he fell dead. And then he rashed to the other, and smote his back asunder. And in the meanwhile the Lady of the Lake cried to King Arthur, Let not that false lady escape! Then King Arthur overtook her, and with the same sword he smote off her head. And the Lady of the Lake took up her head, and hung it by the hair of her saddle-bow. And then Sir Tristram horsed King Arthur, and rode forth with him, but he charged the Lady of the Lake not to discover his name, as at that time. When the King was horsed, he thanked heartily Sir Tristram, 
and desired to wit his name, but he would not tell him, but that he was a poor knight adventurous. And so he bare King Arthur fellowship till he met with some of his knights, and within a while he met with Sir Ector de Maris, and he knew not King Arthur nor Sir Tristram, and he desired to joust with one of them. Then Sir Tristram rode unto Sir Ector, and smote him from his horse. And when he had done so, he came again to the king, and said, My lord, yonder is one of your knights, he may bear you fellowship, and another day, that deed that I have done for you, I trust to God ye shall understand that I would do you service. Alas, said King Arthur, let me wit what ye are. Not at this time, said Sir Tristram. So he departed, and left King Arthur and Sir Ector together. Chapter 17 How Sir Tristram came to La Belle Isolte, and how Cahidius began to love Belle Isolte, and of a letter that Tristram found. And then, at a day set, Sir Tristram and Sir Lamorak met at the well, and then they took Cahidius at the forester's house, and so they rode with him to the ship, where they left Dame Bragwine and Gouvernai, and so they sailed into Cornwall all wholly together. And by assent and information of Dame Bragwine, when they were landed, they rode unto Sir Dinas the Seneschal, a trusty friend of Sir Tristram's. And so Dame Bragwine and Sir Dinas rode to the court of King Mark, and told the Queen, La Belle Isolte, that Sir Tristram was nigh her in that country. Then, for very pure joy, La Belle Isolte swooned, and when she might speak, she said, Gentle knight Seneschal, help that I might speak with him, other my heart will brust. Then Sir Dinas and Dame Bragwine brought Sir Tristram and Cahidius privily unto the court, unto a chamber, whereas La Belle Isolte had assigned it, and to tell the joys that were betwixt La Belle Isolte and Sir Tristram, there is no tongue can tell it, nor heart think it, nor pen write it. And as the French book maketh mention, at the first time that ever Sir Cahidius saw La Belle Isolte, he was so enamoured upon her, that for very pure love he might never withdraw it. And at the last, as ye shall hear, or the book be ended, Sir Cahidius died for the love of La Belle Isolte. And then privily he wrote unto her letters and ballads of the most goodliest that were used in those days. And when La Belle Isolte understood his letters, she had pity of his complaint, and unavised she wrote another letter to comfort him withal. And Sir Tristram was all this while in a turret at the commandment of La Belle Isolte, and when she might she came unto Sir Tristram. So on a day King Mark played at the chess under a chamber window, and at that time Sir Tristram and Sir Cahidius were within the chamber over King Mark. And as it mishapped, Sir Tristram found the letter that Cahidius sent unto La Belle Isolte. Also he had found the letter that she wrote unto Cahidius, and at that same time La Belle Isolte was in the same chamber. Then Sir Tristram came unto La Belle Isolte, and said, Madam, here is a letter that was sent unto you, and here is the letter that ye sent unto him that sent you that letter. Alas, madam, the good love that I have loved you, and many lands and riches have I forsaken for your love, and now ye are a traitress to me, the which doth me great pain. But as for thee, Sir Cahidius, I brought thee out of Brittany into this country, and thy father, King Howell, I won his lands, howbeit I wedded thy sister, Isolte la Blanche Mince, for the goodness she did unto me. And yet, as I am true knight, she is a clean maiden for me. But wit thou well, Sir Cahidius, for this falsehood and treason thou hast done me, I will revenge it upon thee. And therewithal Sir Tristram drew out his sword, and said, Sir Cahidius, keep thee! And then La Belle Isolte swooned to the earth. And when Sir Cahidius saw Sir Tristram come upon him, he saw none other boot, but leapt out at a bay window, even over the head where sat King Mark playing at the chess. And when the king saw one come hurling over his head, he said, Fellow, what art thou, and what is the cause thou leapest out at that window? My lord the king, said Cahidius, it fortuned me that I was asleep in the window above your head, and as I slept I slumbered, and so I fell down. And thus Sir Cahidius excused him. End of 
Chapter Seventeen. Section forty one, being Book Nine, Chapters eighteen to twenty two, Volume One of Le Mort d'Arthur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Le Mort d'Arthur, Volume One, by Sir Thomas Mallory. Book Nine, Chapters eighteen. To twenty two. Chapter eighteen. How Sir Tristram departed from Tintagel, and how he sorrowed, and was long in a forest till he was out of his mind. Then Sir Tristram dread sore lest he were discovered unto the king that he was there, wherefore he drew him to the strength of the tower, and armed him in such armour as he had for to fight with them that would withstand him. And so, when Sir Tristram saw there was no resistance against him, he sent Gouvernail for his horse and his spear, and knightly he rode forth out of the castle openly, that was called the Castle of Tintagel. And even at gate he met with Gingalin, Sir Gawain's son. And anon Sir Gingalin put his spear in his rest, and ran upon Sir Tristram, and brake his spear. And Sir Tristram at that time had but a sword, and gave him such a buffet upon the helm, that he fell down from his saddle, and his sword slid adown, and carved asunder his horse's neck. And so Sir Tristram rode his way into the forest, and all this doing saw King Mark. And then he sent a squire unto the hurt knight, and commanded him to come to him, and so he did. And when King Mark wist that it was Sir Gingalin, he welcomed him, and gave him an horse, and asked him what knight it was that had encountered with him. Sir, said Gingalin, I wot not what knight he was, but well I wot that he sigheth and maketh great dole. Then Sir Tristram within a while met with a knight of his own that hight Sir Fergus. And when he had met with him he made great sorrow, insomuch that he fell down off his horse in a swoon, and in such sorrow he was in three days and three nights. Then at the last Sir Tristram sent unto the court by Sir Fergus, for to spear what tidings. And so, as he rode by the way, he met with a damosel that came from Sir Palomides, to know and seek how Sir Tristram did. Then Sir Fergus told her how he was almost out of his mind. Alas, said the damosel, where shall I find him? In such a place, said Sir Fergus. Then Sir Fergus found Queen Isolt sick in her bed, making the greatest dole that ever any earthly woman made. And when the damosel found Sir Tristram, she made great dole, because she might not amend him, for the more she made of him, the more was his pain. And at the last Sir Tristram took his horse and rode away from her. And then was it three days, or that she could find him, and then she brought him meat and drink, but he would none. And then another time Sir Tristram escaped away from the damosel, and it happed him to ride by the same castle, where Sir Palomides and Sir Tristram did battle when La Belle Isolt departed them. And there by fortune the damosel met with Sir Tristram again, making the greatest dole that ever earthly creature made. And she yed to the lady of that castle, and told her of the misadventure of Sir Tristram. Alas, said the lady of that castle, where is my lord, Sir Tristram? Right here by your castle, said the damosel. In good time, said the lady, is he so nigh me? He shall have meat and drink of the best. And an harp I have of his, whereupon he taught me, for of goodly harping he beareth the prize in the world. So this lady and damosel brought him meat and drink, but he ate little thereof. Then upon a night he put his horse from him, and then he unlaced his armour, and then Sir Tristram would go into the wilderness, and brass down the trees and boughs. And other while, when he found the harp that the lady sent him, then would he harp and play thereupon, and weep together. And sometime, when Sir Tristram was in the wood, that the lady wist not where he was, then would she sit down and play upon that harp. Then would Sir Tristram come to that harp, and hearken thereto, and sometime he would harp himself. Thus he there endured a quarter of a year. Then at the last he ran his way, and she wist not where he was become. 
and then was he naked, and waxed lean and poor of flesh, and so he fell in the fellowship of herdmen and shepherds, and daily they would give him some of their meat and drink. And when he did any shrewd deed, they would beat him with rods, and so they clipped him with shears, and made him like a fool. Chapter 19 How Sir Tristram soused Dagonet in a well, and how Palomides sent a damosel to seek Tristram, and how Palomides met with King Mark. And upon a day Dagonet, King Arthur's fool, came into Cornwall, with two squires with him. And as they rode through that forest, they came by a fair well, where Sir Tristram was wont to be. And the weather was hot, and they alighted to drink of that well, and in the meanwhile their horses break loose. Right so Sir Tristram came unto them, and first he soused Sir Dagonet in that well, and after his squires, and thereat laughed the shepherds. And forthwithal he ran after their horses, and brought them again one by one, and right so, wet as they were, he made them leap up and ride their ways. Thus Sir Tristram endured there an half year naked, and would never come in town nor village. The meanwhile the damosel that Sir Palomides sent to seek Sir Tristram, she yed unto Sir Palomides, and told him all the mischief that Sir Tristram endured. Alas, said Sir Palomides, it is great pity that ever so noble a knight should be so mischieved for the love of a lady. But nevertheless I will go and seek him, and comfort him, an I may. Then a little before that time La Belle Isotte had commanded Sir Cahidius out of the country of Cornwall. So Sir Cahidius departed with a dolorous heart, and by adventure he met with Sir Palomides, and they end fellowship together, and either complained to other of their hot love, that they loved La Belle Isolt. Now let us, said Sir Palomides, seek Sir Tristram, that loved her as well as we, and let us prove whether we may recover him. So they rode into that forest, and three days and three nights they would never take their lodging, but ever sought Sir Tristram. And upon a time, by adventure, they met with King Mark, that was ridden from his men all alone. When they saw him, Sir Palomides knew him, but Sir Cahidius knew him not. Ah, false king! said Sir Palomides, it is pity thou hast thy life, for thou art a destroyer of all worshipful knights, and by thy mischief and thy vengeance thou hast destroyed that most noble knight, Sir Tristram de Lyonnes, and therefore defend thee, said Sir Palomides, for thou shalt die this day. That were shame, said King Mark, for ye two are armed, and I am unarmed. As for that, said Sir Palomides, I shall find a remedy therefore. Here is a knight with me, and thou shalt have his harness. Nay, said King Mark, I will not have ado with you, for cause have ye none to me, for all the misses that Sir Tristram hath was for a letter that he found, for as to me I did to him no displeasure, and God knoweth I am full sorry for his disease and malady. So when the king had thus excused him, they were friends, and King Mark would have had them unto Tintagel, but Sir Palomides would not but turned unto the realm of Logris, and Sir Cahidius said that he would go into Brittany. Now turn we unto Sir Dagonet again, that when he and his squires were upon horseback, he deemed that the shepherds had sent that fool to array them so, because that they laughed at them, and so they rode unto the keepers of beasts, and all to beat them. Sir Tristram saw them beat, that were wont to give him meat and drink. Then he ran thither, and gat Sir Dagonet by the head, and gave him such a fall to the earth, that he bruised him sore, so that he lay still. And then he rasped his sword out of his hand, and therewith he ran to one of his squires, and smote off his head, and the other fled. And so Sir Tristram took his way with that sword in his hand, running as he had been wild wood. Then Sir Dagonet rode to King Mark, and told him how he had sped in that forest. And therefore, said Sir Dagonet, beware, King Mark, that thou come not about that well in the forest, for there is a fool naked, and that fool and I fool met together, and he had almost slain me. Ah, said King Mark, that is Sir Matto Le Brun, that fell out of his wit because he lost his lady. For when Sir Gaharis smote down Sir Matto, and won his lady of him, never since was he in his mind, and that was pity, for he was a good knight. Chapter 20 how it was noised how Sir Tristram was dead, and how La Belle Isolte would have slain herself. 
Then Sir Andred, that was cousin unto Sir Tristram, made a lady that was his paramour to say and to noise it that she was with Sir Tristram, or ever he died. And this tale she brought unto King Mark's court, that she buried him by a well, and that, or he died, he besought King Mark to make his cousin, Sir Andred, king of the country of Lyonesse, of the which Sir Tristram was lord of. All this did Sir Andred, because he would have had Sir Tristram's lands. And when King Mark heard tell that Sir Tristram was dead, he wept and made great dole. But when Queen Isolt heard of these tidings, she made such sorrow that she was nigh out of her mind, and so upon a day she thought to slay herself, and never to live after Sir Tristram's death. And so upon a day La Belle Isolt gat a sword privily, and bare it to her garden, and there she piped the sword through a plum-tree up to the hilt, so that it stuck fast, and it stood breast-high. And as she would have run upon the sword, and to have slain herself, all this espied King Mark, how she kneeled down and said, Sweet Lord Jesu, have mercy upon me, for I may not live after the death of Sir Tristram de Lyonesse, for he was my first love, and he shall be the last. And with these words came King Mark, and took her in his arms, and then he took up the sword, and bare her away with him into a tower, and there he made her to be kept, and watched her surely, and after that she lay long sick, nigh at the point of death. This meanwhile ran Sir Tristram naked in the forest, with the sword in his hand, and so he came to an hermitage, and there he laid him down and slept, and in the meanwhile the hermit stole away his sword, and laid meat down by him. Thus was he kept there ten days, and at the last he departed, and came to the herdman again. And there was a giant in that country that hight Taulius, and for fear of Sir Tristram more than seven years he durst never much go at large, but for the most part he kept him in a sure castle of his own. And so this Taulius heard tell that Sir Tristram was dead by the noise of the court of King Mark. Then this Taulius went daily at large, and so he happed upon a day he came to the herdmen, wandering and langering, and there he set him down to rest among them. The meanwhile there came a knight of Cornwall, that led a lady with him, and his name was Sir Dinant. And when the giant saw him, he went from the herdmen, and hid him under a tree, and so the knight came to that well, and there he alighted to repose him. And as soon as he was from his horse, this giant Taulias came betwixt this knight and his horse, and took the horse and leapt upon him. So forthwith he rode unto Sir Dinant, and took him by the collar, and pulled him afore him upon his horse, and there would have stricken off his head. Then the herdman said unto Sir Tristram, Help yonder knight! Help ye him! said Sir Tristram. We dare not! said the herdman. Then Sir Tristram was ware of the sword of the knight, there as it lay, and so thither he ran, and took up the sword, and struck off Sir Taulius's head and so he yed his way to the herdman. Chapter 21 How King Mark found Sir Tristram naked, and made him to be borne home to Tintagel, and how he was there known by a bratchet. Then the knight took up the giant's head, and bare it with him unto King Mark, and told him what adventure betid him in the forest, and how a naked man rescued him from the grimly giant, Taulias. Where had ye this adventure? said King Mark. Forsooth, said Sir Dinant, at the fair fountain in your forest, where many adventurous knights meet, and there is the madman. Well, said King Mark, I will see that wild man. So within a day or two, King Mark commanded his knights and his hunters, that they should be ready on the morn for to hunt. And so upon the morn he went unto that forest. And when the king came to that well, he found there, lying by that well, a fair naked man, and a sword by him. Then King Mark blew and straked, and therewith his knights came to him, and then the king commanded his knights to take that naked man with fairness, and bring him to my castle. So they did, softly and fairly, and cast mantles upon Sir Tristram, and so led him unto Tintagel, and there they bathed him, and washed him, and gave him hot suppings, till they had brought him well to his remembrance. But all this while there was no creature that knew Sir Tristram, nor what man he was. So it fell upon a day that the Queen, La Belle Isolt, 
heard of such a man that ran naked in the forest, and how the king had brought him home to the court. Then La Belle Isolt called unto her dame Bragwine, and said, Come on with me, for we will go see this man that my lord brought from the forest the last day. So they passed forth, and speared where was the sick man. And then a squire told the queen that he was in the garden taking his rest, and reposing him against the sun. So when the queen looked upon Sir Tristram, she was not remembered of him. But ever she said unto Dame Bragwine, Meseemeth I should have seen him heretofore in many places. But as soon as Sir Tristram saw her, he knew her well enough. And then he turned away his visage, and wept. Then the queen had always a little bratchet with her, that Sir Tristram gave her the first time that ever she came into Cornwall, and never would that bratchet depart from her, but if Sir Tristram was nigh, thereas was La Belle Isolte. And this bratchet was sent from the king's daughter of France unto Sir Tristram, for great love. And anon, as this little bratchet felt a savour of Sir Tristram, she leapt upon him, and licked his leers and his ears, and then she whined and quested, and she smelled at his feet and at his hands, and on all parts of his body that she might come to. "'Ah, my lady,' said Dame Bragwine unto La Belle Isolt, "'alas, alas,' said she, "'I see it is mine own lord, Sir Tristram.' And thereupon Isolt fell down in a swoon, and so lay a great while. And when she might speak, she said, "'My lord, Sir Tristram, blessed be God ye have your life, "'and now I am sure ye shall be discovered by this little bratchet, "'for she will never leave you.' and also I am sure as soon as my lord King Mark do know you he will banish you out of the country of Cornwall, or else he will destroy you. For God's sake, mine own lord, grant King Mark his will, and then draw you unto the court of King Arthur, for there are ye beloved, and ever when I may I shall send unto you, and when ye list ye may come to me, and at all times, early and late, I will be at your commandment, to live as poor a life as ever did queen or lady." O oh, madam, said Sir Tristram, go from me, for mickle anger and danger have I escaped for your love. Chapter 22 How King Mark, by the advice of his council, banished Sir Tristram out of Cornwall for the term of ten years. Then the queen departed, but the bratchet would not from him. And therewithal came King Mark, and the bratchet set upon him, and bade at them all. Therewithal Sir Andred spake and said, Sir, this is Sir Tristram, I see by the bratchet. Nay, said the king, I cannot suppose that. Then the king asked him upon his faith what he was, and what was his name. So God me help, said he, my name is Sir Tristram de Lyonnes. Now do by me what ye list. Ah, said King Mark, me repenteth of your recovery. And then he let call his barons to judge Sir Tristram to the death. Then many of his barons would not assent thereto, and in especial Sir Dinas the Seneschal, and Sir Fergus. And so, by the advice of them all, Sir Tristram was banished out of the country for ten year, and thereupon he took his oath upon a book before the king and his barons. And so he was made to depart out of the country of Cornwall, and there were many barons brought him unto his ship, of the which some were his friends, and some his foes. And in the meanwhile there came a knight of King Arthur's, his name was Dinadan, and his coming was for to seek after Sir Tristram. Then they showed him where he was, armed at all points, going to the ship. Now, fair knight, said Sir Dinadan, or ye pass this court, that ye will joust with me, I require thee. With a good will, said Sir Tristram, and these lords will give me leave. Then the barons granted thereto, and so they ran together, and there Sir Tristram gave Sir Dinadan a fall. And then he prayed Sir Tristram to give him leave to go in his fellowship. Ye shall be right welcome, said then Sir Tristram. And so they took their horses, and rode to their ships together. And when Sir Tristram was in the sea, he said, Greet well King Mark and all mine enemies, and say them, I will come again when I may. And well am I rewarded for the fighting with Sir Marhaus, and delivered all this country from servage. And well am I rewarded for the fetching and costs of Queen Isout out of Ireland, and the danger that I was in first and last, 
and by the way coming home what danger I had to bring again Queen Isolt from the castle Pluere, and well am I rewarded when I fought with Sir Bleberis for Sir Seguarides's wife, and well am I rewarded when I fought with Sir Blamor de Ganis for King Anguish, father unto La Belle Isolt. And well am I rewarded when I smote down the good knight Sir Lamorak de Gallis at King Mark's request. And well am I rewarded when I fought with the king with the hundred knights and the king of North Gallis. And both these would have put his land in servage, and by me they were put to a rebuke. And well am I rewarded for the slaying of Taulias the mighty giant, and many other deeds have I done for him, and now have I my warrison and tell King Mark that many noble knights of the table round have spared the barons of this country for my sake. Also am I not well rewarded when I fought with a good knight Sir Palomides, and rescued Queen Isolt from him? And at that time King Mark said afore all his barons I should have been better rewarded. And forthwithal he took the sea. End of chapter 22「Chapters 23 through 26. How a damosel sought help to help Sir Lancelot against thirty knights, and how Sir Tristram fought with them. And at the next landing, fast by the sea, there met with Sir Tristram and with Sir Dinadan, Sir Ector de Maris and Sir Bors de Ganis, and there Sir Ector jousted with Sir Dinadan, and he smote him and his horse down. And then Sir Tristram would have jousted with Sir Bors, and Sir Bors said that he would not joust with no Cornish knights, for they are not called men of worship, and all this was done upon a bridge. And with this came Sir Bleoberis and Sir Driant, and Sir Bleoberis proffered to joust with Sir Tristram, and there Sir Tristram smote down Sir Bleoberis. Then said Sir Bors to Ganis, I wist never Cornish knight of so great valour, nor so valiant as that knight that beareth the trappings embroidered with crowns. And then Sir Tristram and Sir Dinadan departed from them into a forest, and there met them a demoiselle that came for the love of Sir Lancelot, to seek after some noble knights of King Arthur's court for to rescue Sir Lancelot. And so Sir Lancelot was ordained, for by the treason of Queen Morgan le Fay to have slain Sir Lancelot, and for that cause she ordained thirty knights to lie in await for Sir Lancelot, and this damoiselle knew this treason. And for this cause the damoiselle came for to seek noble knights to help Sir Lancelot. For that night, or the day after, Sir Lancelot should come where these thirty knights were. And so this damoiselle met with Sir Bors and Sir Ector and with Sir Driant, and there she told them all four of the treason of Morgan le Fay. And then they promised her that they would be nigh where Sir Lancelot should meet with the thirty knights. And if so be they set upon him, we will do rescues as we can. So the damoiselle departed, and by adventure the damoiselle met with Sir Tristram and with Sir Dinadan, and there the damoiselle told them all the treason that was ordained for Sir Lancelot. Fair damoiselle, said Sir Tristram, bring me to that same place where they should meet with Sir Lancelot. Then said Sir Dinadan, What will you do? It is not for us to fight with thirty knights, and wit you well I will not thereof. As to match one knight, two or three is enough, and they be men, but for to match fifteen knights, that will I never undertake. Fie for shame, said Sir Tristram, but do your part. Nay, said Sir Dinadan, I will not thereof, but if ye will lend me your shield, for ye bear a shield of Cornwall, and for the cowardice that is named to the knights of Cornwall, 
by your shields ye be ever forborne. Nay, said Sir Tristram, I will not depart from my shield for her sake that gave it to me. But one thing, said Sir Tristram, I promise thee, Sir Dinadan, but if thou wilt promise me to abide with me, here I shall slay thee, for I desire no more of thee but answer one night. And if thy heart will not serve thee, stand by and look upon me and them. Sir, said Sir Dinadan, I promise you to look upon and to do what I may to save myself, but I would I had not met with you. So then anon these thirty knights came fast by these four knights, and they were aware of them, and either of other. And so these thirty knights let them pass, for this cause, that they would not wrath them, if case be that they had ado with Sir Lancelot. And the four knights let them pass to this intent, that they would see and behold what they would do with Sir Lancelot. And so the thirty knights passed on, and came by Sir Tristram and by Sir Dinadan. And then Sir Tristram cried on high, Lo, here is a knight against you for the love of Sir Lancelot. And there he slew two with one spear, and ten with his sword. And then came in Sir Dinadan, and he did passing well. And so of the thirty knights there were but ten away, and they fled. All this battle saw Sir Bors de Ganis and his three fellows, and then they saw well it was the same knight that jousted with them at the bridge. Then they took their horses and rode unto Sir Tristram, and praised him, and thanked him of his good deeds, and they all desired Sir Tristram to go with them to their lodging. And he said, Nay, he would not go to no lodging. Then they all four knights prayed him to tell them his name. Fair lords, said Sir Tristram, as at this time I will not tell you my name. Chapter 24 How Sir Tristram and Sir Dinadan came to a lodging where they must joust with two knights. Then Sir Tristram and Sir Dinadan rode forth their way, till they came to the shepherds and to the herdsmen, and there they asked them if they knew any lodging or harbour there nigh hand. Forsooth, sirs, said the herdman, hereby is good lodging in a castle. But there is such a custom that there shall no knight be harboured, but if he joust with two knights, and if he be but one knight, he must joust with two. And as ye be therein, soon shall ye be matched. There is shrewd harbour, said Sir Dinadan, lodge where ye will, but I will not lodge there. Fie for shame, said Sir Tristram. Are ye not a knight of the table round? Wherefore ye may not, with your worship, refuse your lodging? Not so, said the herdman, for an ye be beaten, and have the worse, ye shall not be lodged there. And if ye beat them, ye shall be well harboured. Ah, said Sir Dinadan, there are two sure knights. Then Sir Dinadan would not lodge there in no manner, but as Sir Tristram required him of his knighthood. And so they rode thither. And to make short tale, Sir Tristram and Sir Dinadan smote them down both, and so they entered into the castle, and had good cheer, as they could think or devise. And when they were unarmed, and thought to be merry and in good rest, there came in at the gates Sir Palamides and Sir Gaheris, requiring to have the custom of the castle. "'What array is this?' said Sir Dinadan. "'I would have my rest.' That may not be, said Sir Tristram. Now must we needs defend the custom of this castle, insomuch as we have the better of the lords of this castle. And therefore, said Sir Tristram, needs must ye make you ready. In the devil's name, said Sir Dinadan, came I into your company. And so they made them ready, and Sir Gaheris encountered with Sir Tristram, and Sir Gaheris had a fall and Sir Palamides encountered with Sir Dinadan, and Sir Dinadan had a fall. Then it was fall for fall. So then must they fight on foot. That would not Sir Dinadan, for he was so sore bruised of the fall that Sir Palamides gave him. Then Sir Tristram unlaced Sir Dinadan's helm, and prayed him to help him. I will not, said Sir Dinadan, for I am sore wounded of the thirty knights that we had but late ago to do with all. But ye fair, 
said Sir Dinadan unto Sir Tristram, as a madman, and as a man that is out of his mind, that would cast himself away, and I may curse the time that ever I saw you. For in all the world are not two such knights that be so wood as is Sir Lancelot, and ye, Sir Tristram? For once I fell in the fellowship of Sir Lancelot, as I have done now with you, and he set me a work that a quarter of a year I kept my bed. Yesu defend me, said Sir Dinadin, from such two knights, and specially from your fellowship. Then, said Sir Tristram, I will fight with them both. Then Sir Tristram bade them come forth both, for I will fight with you. Then Sir Palamides and Sir Gaheris dressed them, and smote at them both. Then Dinadan smote at Sir Gaheris a stroke or two, and turned from him. Nay, said Sir Palamides, it is too much shame for us two knights to fight with one. And then he did bid Sir Gaheris stand aside with that knight that hath no list to fight. Then they rode together, and fought long, and at the last Sir Tristram doubled his strokes, and drove Sir Palamides aback more than three strides. And then by one ascent Sir Gaheris and Sir Dinadin went betwixt them, and departed them in sunder. And then by ascent of Sir Tristram they would have lodged together. But Sir Dinadin would not lodge in that castle, and then he cursed the time that ever he came in their fellowship, and so he took his horse, and his harness, and departed. Then Sir Tristram prayed the lords of that castle to lend him a man to bring him to a lodging, and so they did, and overtook Sir Dinadin, and rode to their lodging two mile thence with a good man in a priory, and there they were well at ease. And that same night Sir Bors and Sir Bleoberis, and Sir Ector and Sir Driant, abode still in the same place thereas Sir Tristram fought with the thirty knights, and there they met with Sir Lancelot the same night, and had made promise to lodge with Sir Colgravance the same night. How Sir Tristram jousted with Sir Kay and Sir Sagramore the Lud Desirous, and how Sir Gawain turned Sir Tristram from Morgan le Fay. But anon is the noble knight Sir Lancelot, heard of the shield of Cornwall, then wist he well that it was Sir Tristram that fought with his enemies. And then Sir Lancelot praised Sir Tristram, and called him the man of most worship in the world. So there was a knight in that priory that hight Pellinore, and he desired to wit the name of Sir Tristram. But in no wise he could not, and so Sir Tristram departed and left Sir Dinadin in the priory, for he was so weary and so sore bruised that he might not ride. Then this knight, Sir Pellinore, said to Sir Dinadin, Sithen that ye will not tell me that knight's name, I will ride after him, and make him to tell me his name, for he shall die therefore. Beware, Sir Knight, said Sir Dinadin, for an ye follow him ye shall repent it. So that knight, Sir Pellinore, rode after Sir Tristram, and required him of jousts. Then Sir Tristram smote him down, and wounded him through the shoulder, and so he passed on his way. And on the next day following Sir Tristram met with Persuivants, and they told him that there was made a great cry of tournament between King Caradus of Scotland and the King of North Wales, and either should joust against other at the Castle of Maidens. And these Persuivants sought all the country after the good knights, and in especial King Caradus let make seeking for Sir Lancelot du Lac, and the king of North Gallus let seek after Sir Tristram de Leonis. And at that time Sir Tristram thought to be at that joust, and so by adventure they met with Sir Kay the Seneschal, and Sir Sagramore le Desirous, and Sir Kay required Sir Tristram to joust, and Sir Tristram in a manner refused him because he would not be hurt nor bruised against the great joust that should be before the castle of maidens, and therefore thought to repose him and to rest him. And always Sir Kay cried, Sir Knight of Cornwall, joust with me, or else yield thee to me as recreant. When Sir Tristram heard him say so, he turned to him, and then Sir Kay refused him and turned his back. Then Sir Tristram said, as I find thee, I shall take thee. 
Then Sir Kay turned with evil will, and Sir Tristram smote Sir Kay down, and so he rode forth. Then Sir Sagramor le Desirous rode after Sir Tristram, and made him to joust with him, and there Sir Tristram smote down Sir Sagramor le Desirous from his horse, and rode his way. And the same day he met with a damosel that told him that he should win great worship of a knight adventurous, that did much harm in all that country. When Sir Tristram heard her say so, he was glad to go with her to win worship. So Sir Tristram rode with that damosel a six mile, and then met him Sir Gawain, and therewithal Sir Gawain knew the damosel, and that she was a damosel of Queen Morgan le Fay. Then Sir Gawain understood that she led that knight to some mischief. Fair knight, said Sir Gawain, whither ride you now with that damosel? Sir, said Sir Tristram, I wot not whither I shall ride, but as the damosel will lead me. Sir, said Sir Gawain, ye shall not ride with her, for she and her lady did never good, but ill. And then Sir Gawain pulled out his sword, and said, Damosel, if thou tell me anon, for what cause thou leadest this knight with thee, thou shalt die for it right anon. I know all your lady's treason, and yours. Mercy, Sir Gawain, she said, and if ye will save my life I will tell you. Say on, said Sir Gawain, and thou shalt have thy life. Sir, she said, Queen Morgan le Fay, my lady, hath ordained a thirty ladies to seek and espy after Sir Lancelot or Sir Tristram, and by the trains of these ladies, who that may first meet any of these two knights, they should turn them unto Morgan le Fay's castle saying that they should do deeds of worship, and if any of the two knights came there, there be thirty knights lying and watching in a tower to wait upon Sir Lancelot, or upon Sir Tristram. Fie for shame, said Sir Gawain, that ever such false treason should be wrought or used in a queen, and a king's sister, and a king and queen's daughter. CHAPTER Twenty Six. How Sir Tristram and Sir Gawain rode to have foughten with the thirty knights, but they durst not come out. Sir, said Sir Gawain, will you stand with me, and we will see the malice of these thirty knights? Sir, said Sir Tristram, go ye to them, and it please you, and ye shall see I will not fail you, for it is not long ago since I and a fellow met with thirty knights of that queen's fellowship and God speed us so that we may win worship. So then Sir Gawain and Sir Twistrum rode toward the castle where Morgan le Fay was, and ever Sir Gawain deemed well that he was Sir Tristram de Leonis, because he heard that two knights had slain and beaten thirty knights. And when they came before the castle Sir Gawain spake on high, and said, Queen Morgan le Fay, Send out your knights that ye have laid in a watch for Sir Lancelot and for Sir Tristram. Now, said Sir Gawain, I know your false treason, and through all places where that I ride men shall know of your false treason. And now let's see, said Sir Gawain, whether ye dare come out of your castle, ye thirty knights. Then the queen spake, and all the thirty knights at once, and said, Sir Gawain, Full well wottest thou what thou dost and sayest, for by God we know thee passing well, but all that thou speakest and dost, thou sayest it upon pride of that good knight that is there with thee. For there be some of us that know full well the hands of that knight over all well. And wit thou well, Sir Gawain, it is more for his sake than for thine that we will not come out of this castle. For wit ye well, Sir Gawain, the knight that beareth the arms of Cornwall, we know him, and what he is. Then Sir Gawain and Sir Tristram departed, and rode on their ways a day or two together, and there by adventure they met with Sir Kay and Sir Sagramor le Desirous. And then they were glad of Sir Gawain, and he of them, but they wist not that he was with the shield of Cornwall, but by deeming. And thus they rode together a day or two. And then they were aware of Sir Bruce sans pitié chasing a lady for to have slain her, for he had slain her paramour afore. 
"'Hold you all still,' said Sir Gawain, "'and show none of you forth, "'and ye shall see me reward yonder false knight, "'for an he espy you he is so well horsed "'that he will escape away.' "'And then Sir Gawain rode betwixt Sir Breuse and the lady, "'and said, "'False knight, leave her, and have ado with me.' When Sir Breuse saw no more but Sir Gawain, he furted his spear, and Sir Gawain against him, and there Sir Breuse overthrew Sir Gawain, and then he rode over him, and overthwart him twenty times to have destroyed him. And when Sir Tristram saw him do so villainous a deed, he hurled out against him. And when Sir Breuse saw him with the shield of Cornwall, he knew him well that it was Sir Tristram, and that he fled and Sir Tristram followed after him, and Sir Breuse sans pitié was so hoarse that he went his way quite, and Sir Tristram followed him long, for he would fain have been avenged upon him. And so, when he had long chased him, he saw a fair well, and thither he rode to repose him, and hide his horse till a tree. End of chapters 23-26 through 26. Chapters 27 to 31, Book 9, Volume 1 of Le Mort d'Arthur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kerry Ford of Paikakariki, New Zealand. Le Mort d'Arthur, Volume 1 by Sir Thomas Mallory. Book 9. Chapters 27 to 31 Chapter 27 How Damosel Bregwain found Tristram sleeping by a well, and how she delivered letters to him from La Bille Le Sud. And then he pulled off his helm and washed his visage, and his hands, and so he fell asleep. In the meanwhile came a damosel that had sought Sir Tristram many ways and days within this land, and when she came to the well, she looked upon him, and had forgotten him as in remembrance of Sir Tristram. But by his horse she knew him, that height past Pruel, that had been Sir Tristram's horse many years. For when he was mad in the forest, Sir Fergus kept him, so this lady, Dame Bregwain, abode still till he was awake. So when she saw him wake, she saluted him, and he her again, for either knew other of old acquaintance. Then she told him how she had sought him long and broad, and there she told him how she had letters from Queen La Belle Sud. Then anon Sir Tristram read them, and wit ye well he was glad, for therein was many a piteous complaint. Then Sir Tristram said, Lady Bregwain, Ye shall ride with me till the tournament be done at the castle of maidens, and then shall be a letters and tidings with you. And then Sir Tristram took his horse and sought lodging, and there he met with a good ancient knight and prayed him to lodge with him. Right so came Sir Gouvernail unto Sir Tristram, that was glad of that lady. So this old knight's name was Sir Polonies, and he told of the great tournament, that should be at the castle of maidens, and there Sir Lancelot and thirty-two knights of his blood had ordained shields of Cornwall, and right so there came one unto Sir Polonies. She told him that Sir Poseides de Blois was come home. Then that knight held up his hands and thanked God of his coming home, and there Sir Polonies told Sir Tristram that in two years he had not seen his son Sir Poseides. Sir, said Sir Tristram, I know your son well enough for a good knight. So on a time Sir Tristram and Sir Poseides came to their lodgings both at once, and so they unarmed them, and put upon them their clothing. And then these two knights each welcomed other. When Sir Poseides understood that Sir Tristram was of Cornwall, he said, He was once in Cornwall, and there I jousted a four King Mark, and so it happed me at that time to overthrow ten knights. 
and then came to me Sir Tristram de Leon, and overthrew me, and took my lady away from me, and that shall I never forget. But I shall remember me, and ever I see my time. Ah, said Sir Tristram, now I understand that ye hate Sir Tristram. What deem ye, ween ye that Sir Tristram is not able to withstand your malice? Yes, said Sir Poseidings. I know well that Sir Tristram is a noble knight, and a much better knight than I, yet shall I not owe him my good will. Right as they stood thus talking at a bay window of that castle, they saw many knights riding to and fro toward the tournament, and then was Sir Tristram ware of a likely knight riding upon a great black horse and a black covered shield. What knight is that, said Sir Tristram, with the black horse and the black shield? He seemeth a good knight. I know him well, said Sir Poseides. He is one of the best knights of the world. Then is it Sir Lancelot, said Tristram? Nay, said Sir Poseides, it is Sir Palamides that is yet unchristened. Chapter 28 How Sir Tristram had a fall with Sir Palamides, and how Lancelot overthrew two knights. Then they saw much people of the country salute Sir Palamides, and within a while after there came a squire of the castle, that told Sir Polonius that was lord of that castle, that a knight with a black shield had smitten down thirteen knights. Fair brother, said Sir Tristram upon Sir Poseides, let us cast upon us cloaks, and let us go see the play. Not so, said Sir Poseides, we will not go like knaves thither, but we will ride like men and good knights to withstand our enemies. So they armed, and took their horses and great spears, and thither they went there as many knights assayed themselves before the tournament. And anon Sir Palamides saw Sir Poseides, and then he sent a squire unto him, and said, Go thou to the yonder knight with the green shield, and therein a lion of gold, and say him, I require him to joust with me, and tell him that my name is Sir Palamides. When Sir Poseides understood the request of Sir Palamides, he made him ready, and there anon they met together. But Sir Poseides had a fall. Then Sir Tristram dressed him to be revenged upon Sir Palamides, and that Sir Palamides that was ready, and so was not Sir Tristram, and took him at an advantage, and smote him over his horse's tail, when he had no spear in his rest. Then stout up Sir Tristram, and took his horse lightly, and was wroth out of measure, and sore ashamed of that fall. Then Sir Tristram sent unto Sir Palamides by Gouvernail, and prayed him to joust with him at his request. Nay, said Sir Palamides, as at this time I will not joust with that knight, for I know him better than he weeneth, and if he be wroth, he may write it to morn at the castle of maidens, where he may see me and many other knights. With that came Sir Dinadan, and when he sir saw Tristram wroth, he list not to jape. Lo, said Sir Dinadan, here may a man prove, be a man never so good, yet may he have a fall. And he was never so wise, but he might be overseen, and he rideth well that never fell. So Sir Tristram was passing wroth, and said to Sir Poseides and to Sir Dinadan, I will revenge me. Right so as they stood talking there, there came by Sir Tristram a likely knight, riding passing soberly and heavily with a black shield. What knight is that? said Sir Tristram unto Sir Poseides. I know him well, said Sir Poseides, for his name is Sir Bryant of North Wales. So he passed on among other knights of North Wales, and there came in Sir Lancelot de Lake with the shield of arms of Cornwall, and he sent a squire unto Sir Bryant, and required him to joust with him. Well, said Sir Bryant, sither I am required to joust, I will do what I may. And there Sir Lancelot smote down Sir Bryant from his horse a great fall. And then Sir Tristram marvelled what knight he was that bare the shield of Cornwall. Whatever he be, said Sir Dinadan, I warrant you he is of King Ban's blood, the which be knights of the most noble prowess in the world. 
for to account so many for so many. Then there came two knights of North Gallus, the one hight Hugh de la Montaigne, the other Sir Madoc de la Montaigne, and they challenged Sir Lancelot foot hot. Sir Lancelot not refusing them, but made him ready. With one spear he smote them down both over their horses' croups, and so Sir Lancelot rode his way. By the good lord, said Sir Tristram, he is a good knight that beareth the shield of Cornwall, and to me seemeth he rideth in the best manner that ever I saw knight ride. Then the king of Northgallus rode unto Sir Palamides, and prayed him heartily for his sake to joust with that knight that hath done us of Northgallus despite. Sir, said Sir Palamides, I am for loath to have ado with that knight, and cause why is, for as to morn the great tournament shall be, and therefore I will keep myself fresh by my will. Nay, said the king of Northgallus, I pray you require him of jousts. Sir, said Sir Palamides, I will joust at your request, and require that knight to joust with me, and often have I seen a man have a fall at his own request. Chapter 29 How Sir Lancelot jousted with Palamides and overthrew him, and after he was assailed with twelve knights. Then Sir Palamides sent unto Sir Lancelot a squire, and required him of jousts. Fair fellow, said Sir Lancelot, tell me thy lord's name. Sir, said the squire, my lord's name is Sir Palamides the good knight. In good hour, said Sir Lancelot, for there is no knight that I saw the seven years that I had liefer ado with all than with him. And so either knights made them ready with two great spears. Nay, said Sir Dinadan, you shall see that Sir Palamides will quit him right well. It may be so, said Sir Tristram, but I undertake that that knight with the shield of Cornwall shall give him a fall. I believe it not, said Sir Dinadan. Right so they spurred their horses and futured their spears, and either hit other, and Sir Palamides brake a spear upon Sir Lancelot, and he sat and moved not. But Sir Lancelot smote him so lightly that he made his horse to avoid the saddle, and the stroke brake his shield and the hauberk, and had he not fallen he had been slain. How now, said Sir Tristram, I wist well by the manner of their riding, both that Sir Palamides should have a fall. Right so Sir Lancelot rode his way, and rode to a well to drink and to repose him, and they of North Gallus espied him whither he rode. And then there followed him twelve knights to have mischieved him, for this cause that upon the morn at the tournament of the Castle of Maidens that he should not win the victory. So they came upon Sir Lancelot suddenly, and aneath he might put upon him his helm and take his horse. But they were in hands with him, and then Sir Lancelot gat his spear, and rode through them, and there he slew a knight and brake a spear in his body. Then he drew his sword and smote upon the right hand and upon the left hand, so that within a few strokes he had slain other three knights. In the remnant that abode he wounded them sore all that did abide. Thus Sir Lancelot escaped from his enemies of North Wales, and then Sir Lancelot rode his way to a friend, and lodged him till on the morn, for he would not the first day have ado in the tournament because of his great labour. And on the first day he was with King Arthur thereas, he was set on high upon a scaffold to discern who was best worthy of his deeds. So Sir Lancelot was with King Arthur, and jousted not the first day. Chapter 30 How Sir Tristram behaved him the first day of the tournament, and there he had the prize. Now turn we unto Sir Tristram to Leon, the commanded governor, his servant, to ordain him a black shield with none other remembrance therein. And so Sir Poseides and Sir Tristram departed from their host Sir Polonis, and they rode early toward the tournament, and then they drew them to King Carados's side of Scotland, and anon knights began the field what of King Northgallus's part, and what of King Carados's part, and there began great party. Then there was hurling and rashing, 
Right so came in Sir Poseides and Sir Tristram, and so they did fear that they put the king of North Gallus aback. Then came in Sir Bleoberus de Gerus and Sir Gaharis with them of North Gallus, and then was Sir Poseides smitten down and almost slain, for more than forty horsemen went over him. For Sir Bleoberus did great deeds of arms, and Sir Gaharis failed him not. When Sir Tristram beheld them, and saw them do such deeds of arms, he marvelled what they were. Also Sir Tristram thought shame that Sir Poseides was so done to, and then he gat a great spear in his hand, and then he rode to Sir Gaharis and smote him down from his horse. And then was Sir Bleoberus wroth, and gat a spear and rode against Sir Tristram in great ire. And there Sir Tristram met with him, and smote Sir Bleoberus from his horse. So then the king with the hundred knights was wroth, and he horsed Sir Bleoberus and Sir Gaharis again. And there began a great medley, and ever Sir Tristram held them passing short, and ever Sir Bleoberus was passing busy upon Sir Tristram, and there came Sir Dinadan against Sir Tristram, and Sir Tristram gave him such a buffet that he swooned in his saddle. Then and on Sir Dinadan came to Sir Tristram and said, Sir, I know thee better than thou weenest, but here I promise thee my troth, I will never come against thee more, for I promise thee that sword of thine shall never come on mine helm. With that came Sir Bleoberus, and Sir Tristram gave him such a buffet that down he laid his head, and then he caught him so sore by the helm that he pulled him under his horse's feet, and then King Arthur blew to lodging. Then Sir Tristram departed to his pavilion, and Sir Dinadan rode with him, and Sir Poseides and King Arthur then, and the kings upon both parties marvelled what knight that was with the black shield. Many said their advice, and some knew him for Sir Tristram, and held their peace, and would naught say. So that first day King Arthur, and all the kings and lords that were judges, gave Sir Tristram the prize, howbeit they knew him not, but named him the knight with the black shield. Chapter 31 How Sir Tristram returned against King Arthur's party, because he saw Sir Palamides on that party. Then upon the morn Sir Palamides returned from the king of North Gallus, and rode to King Arthur's side, where was King Carados and the king of Ireland, and Sir Lancelot's kin, and Sir Gawain's kin. So Sir Palamides sent the damsel unto Sir Tristram, that he sent to seek him when he was out of his mind in the forest. And this damsel asked Sir Tristram what he was, and what was his name. And for that, said Sir Tristram, Tell Sir Palamides, ye shall not wit as at this time, unto the time I have broken two spears upon him. But let him wit this much, said Sir Tristram, that I am the same knight that he smote down in over evening at the tournament, and tell him plainly on what party that Sir Palamides be, I will be of the contrary party. Sir, said the damsel, ye shall understand that Sir Palamides will be on King Arthur's side where the most noble knights of the world be. In the name of God, said Sir Tristram, then will I be with the king of North Gallus, because Sir Palamides will be on King Arthur's side, and else I would not but for his sake. So when King Arthur was come, they blew unto the field, and then there began a great party, and so King Carados jousted with the king of the hundred knights, and there King Carados had a fall, then there was hurling and rashing, and right so came in knights of King Arthur's, and they bear aback the king of North Gallus's knights. Then Sir Tristram came in, and began so roughly and so bigly, that there was none might withstand him, and thus Sir Tristram jured long. And at last Sir Tristram fell among the fellowship of King Ban, and there fell upon him Sir Bor de Ganis, and Sir Ector de Maris, and Sir Blanmore de Ganis, and many other knights. And then Sir Tristram smote on the right hand and on the left hand, that all lords and ladies spake of his noble deeds. But at the last Sir Tristram should have had the worst had not the king with the hundred knights been. And then he came with his fellowship and rescued Sir Tristram, and brought him away from those knights that bear the shield of Cornwall. And then Sir Tristram saw another fellowship by themselves, and there were a forty knights together, 
and Sir Kay the seneschal was their governor. Then Sir Tristram rode in amongst them, and there he smote down Sir Kay from his horse, and there he feared among those knights like a greyhound among conies. Then Sir Lancelot found a knight that was sore wounded upon the head. Sir, said Sir Lancelot, who wounded you so sore? Sir, he said, a knight that beareth a black shield, and I may curse the time that ever I met with him, for he is a devil and no man. So Sir Lancelot departed from him, and thought to meet with Sir Tristram, and so he rode with his sword drawn in his hand, to seek Sir Tristram, and then he espied him how he hurled here and there, and at every stroke Sir Tristram well nigh smote down a knight. Oh, mercy, Jesu, said the king, Sith the time I bear arms, saw I never no knight do so marvellous deeds of arms. And if I should set upon this knight, said Sir Lancelot to himself, I did shame to myself. And therewithal Sir Lancelot put up his sword, and then the king with the hundred knights, and an hundred more of North Wales, set upon the twenty of Sir Lancelot's kin. And they twenty knights held them ever together as wild swine, and none would fail other. And so, when Sir Tristram beheld the noblesse of these twenty knights, he marvelled of their good deeds, for he saw by their fear and by their rule that they had liefer die than avoid the field. Now Jesu, said Sir Tristram, well may he be valiant and full of prowess that had such a sort of noble knights unto his kin, and full like is he to be a noble man that is their leader and governor. He meant it by Sir Lancelot du Lake. So when Sir Tristram had beholden them long, he thought shame to see two hundred knights battering upon twenty knights. Then Sir Tristram rode unto the king with the hundred knights, and said, Sir, leave your fighting with those twenty knights, for ye win no worship of them. Ye be so many, and they so few. And wit ye well, they will not out of field, I see by their cheer and countenance, and worship get ye none, and ye slay them. Therefore, leave your fighting with them, for I, to increase my worship, I will ride to the twenty knights and help them with all my might and power. Nay, said the king with the hundred knights, ye shall not do so. Now I see your courage and courtesy, I will withdraw my knights for your pleasure, for evermore a good knight will favour another, and like will draw to like. End of Book 9, Chapters 27-31 to 31. Book Nine, Chapters Thirty Two through Thirty Five, Volume One of Le Morte d'Arthur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Le Morte d'Arthur, Volume One, by Sir Thomas Mallory. Book Nine, Chapters Thirty Two through Thirty Five. Chapter Thirty Two. Then the King, with the hundred knights, withdrew his knights. And all this while, and long to fore, Sir Lancelot had watched upon Sir Tristram, with a very purpose to have fellowshipped with him. And then suddenly Sir Tristram, Sir Dinadan, and Gurneval, his man, rode their way into the forest, that no man perceived where they went. So then King Arthur blew into lodging, and gave the king of North Gaulis the prize, because Sir Tristram was upon his side. Then Sir Lancelot rode here and there, so wood as lion that fought at his fill, because he had lost Sir Tristram, and so he returned unto King Arthur. And then in all the field was a noise, that with the wind it might be heard two miles thence, how the lords and ladies cried, The knight with the black shield hath won the field. Alas, said King Arthur, where is that knight become? It is shame to all those in the field so to let him escape away from you, but with gentleness and courtesy you might have brought him unto me to the castle of maidens." Then the noble King Arthur went unto his knights, and comforted them in the best wise that he could, and said, My fair fellows, be not dismayed, howbeit you have lost the field this day. And many were hurt, and sore wounded, and many were whole. My fellows, said King Arthur, look, that ye be of good cheer, for to-morrow morn I will in the field with you, and revenge you of your enemies. So that night King Arthur and his knights reposed themselves. The demoiselle that came from La Belle Isson unto Sir Tristram, all the while the tournament was a-doing, she was with Queen Guinevere, and ever the queen asked her for what cause she came into that country. 
Madam, she answered, I come for none other cause but from my lady, la belle Isode, to wit of your welfare. For in no wise would she not tell the queen that she came for Sir Tristram's sake. So this lady, Dame Brigwain, took her leave of Queen Guinevere, and she rode after Sir Tristram. And as she rode through the forest she heard a great cry. Then she commanded her squire to go into the forest to wit what was that noise. And so he came to a well, and there he found a knight bounden till a tree, crying as he had been wood, and his horse and his harness standing by him. And when he espied that squire, therewith he upbraid, and brake himself loose, and took his sword in his hand, and ran to have slain the squire. Then he took his horse, and fled all that ever he might unto Dame Brigwen, and told her of his adventure. Then she rode unto Sir Tristram's pavilion, and told Sir Tristram what adventure she had found in the forest. Alas, said Sir Tristram, upon my head there is some good knight at mischief. Then Sir Tristram took his horse and his sword, and rode thither, and there he heard how the knight complained unto himself, and said, I, woeful knight Sir Palamedes, what misadventure befalleth me, that I am thus defoiled with falsehood and treason, through Sir Bors and Sir Ector? Alas, he said, why live I so long? And then he got his sword in his hands, and made many strange signs and tokens, so that through his raging he threw his sword into that fountain. Then Sir Palamides wailed and wrang his hands, and at the last, for pure sorrow, he ran into that fountain, over his belly, and sought after his sword. Then Sir Tristram saw that, and ran upon Sir Palamides, and held him in his arms fast. "'What art thou,' said Palamides, "'that holdeth me so? I am a man of this forest that would thee none harm.' Alas, said Sir Palamides, I may never win worship where Sir Tristram is, for wherever he is, and I be there, then I get no worship, and if he be away for the most part I have the gree, unless that Sir Lancelot be there, or Sir Lamorac. Then Sir Palamides said, Once in Ireland Sir Tristram put me to the worse, and another time in Cornwall, and in other places in this land. What would ye do, said Sir Tristram, and ye had Sir Tristram? I would fight with him, said Sir Palamides, and ease my heart upon him, and yet to say thee sooth, Sir Tristram is the gentlest knight in this world living. What will you do, said Sir Tristram, will you go with me to your lodging? Nay, said he, I will go to the king with the hundred knights, for he rescued me from Sir Borst Aganis and Sir Ector, and else I had been slain traitorly. Sir Tristram said to him such kind words that Sir Palamides went with him to his lodging. Then Gournevale went to fore, and charged Dame Brigwain to go out of the way to her lodging, and bid ye Sir Persides that he make him no quarrels. And so they rode together till they came to Sir Tristram's pavilion, and there Sir Palamides had all the cheer that might be had all that night. But in no wise Sir Palamides might not know what was Sir Tristram, and so after supper they yet to rest, and Sir Tristram for great travail slept till it was day and Sir Palamides might not sleep for anguish, and in the dawning of the day he took his horse privily, and rode his way unto Sir Geharis and unto Sir Sangramor le Desirous, where they were in their pavilions, for they three were fellows at the beginning of the tournament. And then upon the morn the king blew unto the tournament upon the third day. CHAPTER Thirty Three. So the king of North Gallus and the king with the hundred knights, they two encountered with the king Caradoss and with the king of Ireland, and there the king with the hundred knights smote down King Caradoss, and the king of North Gallus smote down the king of Ireland. With that came in Sir Palamides, and when he came he made great work, for by his indented shield he was well known. So came in King Arthur, did great deeds of arms together, and put the king of North Gallus and the king with the hundred knights to the worse. With this came in Sir Tristram with his black shield, and anon he jousted with Sir Palamides, and there, by fine force, Sir Tristram smote Sir Palamides over his horse's croup. Then King Arthur cried, Knight with the black shield, make thee ready to me, and in the same wise Sir Tristram smote King Arthur. And then by force of King Arthur's knights the king and Sir Palamides were horsed again. Then King Arthur, with a great eager heart, he got a spear in his hand, and thereupon the one side he smote Sir Tristram over his horse. Then foot-hot Sir Palamides came upon Sir Tristram, as he was upon foot, to have overridden him. Then Sir Tristram was ware of him, and there he stooped aside, and with great ire he got him by the arm, and pulled him down from his horse. Then Sir Palamides lightly arose, and then they dashed together mightily with their swords, 
and many kings, queens, and lords stood and beheld them. And at the last Sir Tristram smote Sir Palamides upon the helm three mighty strokes, and at every stroke that he gave him he said, This is for Sir Tristram's sake. With that Sir Palamides fell to the earth, grovelling. Then came the king with a hundred knights, and brought Sir Tristram an horse, and so he was horsed again. By then was Sir Palamides horsed, and with great ire he jousted upon Sir Tristram with his spear as it was in the rest, and gave him a great dash with his sword. Then Sir Tristram avoided his spear, and got him by the neck with both his hands, and pulled him clean out of his saddle, and so he bare him afore the length of ten spears, and then in the presence of them all he let him fall at his adventure. Then Sir Tristram was ware of King Arthur with a naked sword in his hand, and with his spear Sir Tristram ran upon King Arthur, and then King Arthur boldly abode him, and with his sword he smote a two his spear, and wherewithal Sir Tristram stonied. And so King Arthur gave him three or four strokes, or he might get out his sword, and at the last Sir Tristram drew his sword, and either assailed passing hard. With that the great press departed them. Sir Tristram rode here and there, and did his great pain, that eleven of the good knights of the blood of King Ban, that was of Sir Lancelot's kin, that day Sir Tristram smote down, that all the estates marvelled of his great deeds, and all cried upon the knight with the black shield. CHAPTER Thirty Four. Then this cry was so large that Sir Lancelot heard it, and then he got a great spear in his hand, and came towards the cry. Then Sir Lancelot cried, The knight with the black shield, make thee ready to joust with me. When Sir Tristram heard him say so, he got his spear in his hand, and either abashed down their heads, and came together as thunder, and Sir Tristram's spear brake in pieces, and Sir Lancelot by malfortune struck Sir Tristram on the side a deep wound nigh to the death, but yet Sir Tristram avoided not his saddle, and so the spear brake. Therewithal Sir Tristram that was wounded got out his sword, and he rushed to Sir Lancelot. Therewithal Sir Tristram that was wounded got out his sword, and he rushed to Sir Lancelot, and gave him three great strokes upon the helm, that the fire sprang thereout, and Sir Lancelot abashed his head lowly toward his saddle-bow. And therewithal Sir Tristram departed from the field, for he felt him so wounded that he weened he should have died, and Sir Dinadon espied him and followed him into the forest. Then Sir Lancelot abode, and did many marvellous deeds." So when Sir Tristram was departed by the forest's side, he alighted, and unlaced his harness, and freshed his wound, then weaned Sir Dinadan that he should have died. Nay, nay, said Sir Tristram, Dinadan never dread thee, for I am whole-hearted, and of this wound I shall soon be whole by the mercy of God. By that Sir Dinadan was where, where came Palamides riding straight upon him. And then Sir Tristram was where that Sir Palamides came to have destroyed him. And so Sir Dinadan gave him warning, and said, Sir Tristram, my lord, ye are now so sore wounded that ye may not have ado with him. Therefore I will ride against him, and do to him what I may. And if I be slain, ye may pray for my soul. And in the meanwhile ye may withdraw, and ye go into the castle, or in the forest, that he shall not meet with you. Sir Tristram smiled, and said, Thank you, Sir Dinadan, of your good will, but ye shall wit that I am able to handle him. And then anon hastily he armed, and took his horse, and a great spear in his hand, and said to Sir Dinadan, Adieu, and rode towards Sir Palamides a soft pace. Then when Sir Palamides saw that, he made countenance to amend his horse, but he did it for this cause, for he abode Sir Geheris that came after him. And when he was come, he rode towards Sir Tristram. Then Sir Tristram sent unto Sir Palamides, and required him to joust with him, and if he smote down Sir Palamides he would do no more to him, and if it so happened that Sir Palamides smote down Sir Tristram, he bade him do his utterance. So they were accorded. Then they met together, and Sir Tristram smote down Sir Palamides that he had a grievous fall, so that he lay still as he had been dead. And then Sir Tristram ran upon Sir Geheris, and he would not have jousted, but whether he would or not, Sir Tristram smote him over his horse's croup, that he lay still as though he had been dead. And then Sir Tristram rode his way, and left Sir Persides' squire within the pavilions, and Sir Tristram and Sir Dinadan rode to an old knight's place to lodge them. And that old knight had five sons at the tournament, for whom he prayed God heartily for their coming home. And so, as the French book saith, they came home, all five well beaten. And when Sir Tristram departed into the forest, Sir Lancelot held away the stour like hard, as a man arraged that took no heed to himself, and wit ye well there was many a noble knight against him. 
and when King Arthur saw Sir Launcelot do so marvellous deeds of arms, he then armed him, and took his horse and his armour, and rode into the field to help Sir Launcelot, and so many knights came in with King Arthur. And to make short tale in conclusion, the King of Northgallus and the King of the Hundred Knights were put to the worse, and because Sir Launcelot abode, and was the last in the field, the prize was given him. But Sir Launcelot would neither for king, queen, nor knight have the prize, but where the cry was heard through the field, Sir Launcelot, Sir Launcelot, hath won the field this day, Sir Launcelot let make another cry contrary, Sir Tristram hath won the field, for he began first, and last he hath endured, and so hath he done the first day, the second, and the third day. CHAPTER Thirty Five. Then all the estates and degrees high and low said of Sir Launcelot great worship, for the honour that he did unto Sir Tristram, and for that honour doing to Sir Tristram he was at that time more praised and renowned than and he had overthrown five hundred knights, and all the people wholly for this gentleness, first the estates both high and low, and after the commonality cried at once, Sir Launcelot hath won the field, whosoever say nay. Then was Sir Launcelot wroth and ashamed, and so therewithal he rode to King Arthur. Alas, said the king, we are all dismayed that Sir Tristram is thus departed from us. By God, said King Arthur, he is one of the noblest knights that I ever saw hold spear in sword or hand, and the most courteous knight in his fighting. For full hard I saw him, said King Arthur, when he smote Sir Palamides upon the helm thrice, that he abashed his helm with his strokes, and also he said, here is a stroke for Sir Tristram, and thus thrice he said. Then King Arthur, Sir Launcelot, and Sir Dinadas le Savage took their horses to seek Sir Tristram, and by the means of Sir Persides he had told King Arthur where Sir Tristram was in his pavilion. But when they came there, Sir Tristram and Sir Dinadon were gone. Then King Arthur and Sir Launcelot were heavy, and returned again to the Castle of Maidens, making great dole for the herd of Sir Tristram, and his sudden departing. So God help me, said King Arthur, I am more heavy that I cannot meet with him than for all the hurts that all my knights have had at the tournament. Right so came Sir Gerharis, and told King Arthur how Sir Tristram had smitten down Sir Palamides, and it was at Sir Palamides's own request. Alas, said King Arthur, that was great dishonour to Sir Palamides, inasmuch as Sir Tristram was sore wounded, and now may we all, kings and knights and men of worship, say that Sir Tristram may be called a noble knight and one of the best knights that I ever saw the days of my life. For I will that ye all, kings and knights, know, said King Arthur, that I never saw knight do so marvellously as he hath done these three days, for he was the first that began, and the longest held on, save this last day. And though he was hurt, it was a manly adventure of two noble knights, and when two noble men encounter, needs must the one have the worst, like as God will suffer at that time. As for me, said Sir Launcelot, for all the lands that ever my father left me, I would not have hurt Sir Tristram, and I had known him at that time. That I hurt him was not for I saw his shield. For and had I seen his black shield, I would not have meddled with him for many causes. For late he did as much for me as ever did knight, and that is well known that he had ado with thirty knights, and no help save Sir Dinadon. And one thing shall I promise, said Sir Launcelot, Sir Palamide shall repent it, as in his unkindly dealing, for to follow that noble knight that I, by mishap, herded thus. Sir Launcelot said all the worship that might be said by Sir Tristram. Then King Arthur made a great feast to all that would come. And thus we let pass King Arthur, and a little while we will turn unto Sir Palamides. After that he had a fall of Sir Tristram. He was nigh hand arraged out of his wit for despite of Sir Tristram. And so he followed him by adventure. And as he came by a river, in his woodness he would have made his horse to have leapt over, and the horse failed footing and fell in the river. Wherefore Sir Palamides was adread lest he should have been drowned, and then he avoided his horse, and swam to the land, and let his horse go down by adventure. End of Book Nine, Chapters Thirty Two through Thirty Five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tamaril from Godbox Café. Le Mort d'Arthur, Volume 1, by Sir Thomas Mallory, Book 9, Chapters 36-39. to 39. Chapter 36 
And when he came to the land, he took off his harness and sat roaring and crying as a man out of his mind. Right so came a damsel, even by Sir Palamedes, that was sent from Sir Gawain and his brother unto Sir Mordred, that lay sick in the same place with that old knight where Sir Tristram was. For as the French book saith, Sir Persides hurt so Sir Mordred at ten days afore, and had it not been for the love of Sir Gawain and his brother, Sir Persides had slain Sir Mordred. And so this damsel came by Sir Palamedes, and she and he had language together, the which pleased neither of them. And so the damsel rode her ways till she came to the old knight's place, and there she told that old knight how she met with the woodest knight by adventure that ever she met withal. What bare he in his shield? said Sir Tristram. It was indented with white and black, said the damsel. Ah, said Sir Tristram, that was Sir Palamides the good knight. For well I know him, said Sir Tristram, for one of the best knights living in this realm. Then that old knight took a little hackney, and rode for Sir Palamides, and brought him unto his own manor, and full well knew Sir Tristram Sir Palamides, but he said but little, for at that time Sir Tristram was walking upon his feet, and well amended of his hurts. And always when Sir Palamides saw Sir Tristram, he would behold him full marvellously, and ever him seemed that he had seen him. Then would he say unto Sir Dinadan, and ever I may meet with Sir Tristram, he shall not escape mine hands. I marvel, said Sir Dinadan, that ye boast behind Sir Tristram, for it is but late that he was in your hands, and ye in his hands. Why would ye not hold him when ye had him? For I saw myself twice or thrice that ye gat but little worship of Sir Tristram. Then was Sir Palamedes ashamed. So leave we them a little while in the old castle with the old knight Sir Darras. Now shall we speak of King Arthur that said to Sir Launcelot, Had not ye been, we had not lost Sir Tristram, for he was here daily unto the time ye met with him. And in an evil time, said Arthur, ye encountered with him. My lord Arthur, said Launcelot, ye put upon me that I should be cause of his departition, God knoweth it was against my will. But when men be hot in deeds of arms, oft they hurt their friends as well as their foes. And my lord, said Sir Lancelot, ye shall understand that Sir Tristram is a man that I am loath to offend, for he hath done for me more than ever I did for him as yet. But then Sir Lancelot made bring forth a book, and then Sir Lancelot said, here we are ten knights that will swear upon a book never to rest one night, where we rest another this twelve month until we find Sir Tristram. And as for me, said Sir Launcelot, I promise you upon this book that an I may meet with him, either with fairness or foulness I shall bring him to this court, or else I shall die therefore. And the names of these ten knights that had undertaken this quest were these following. First was Sir Launcelot, Sir Hector de Maris, Sir Bors de Ganis, and Bleoberis, and Sir Blamor de Ganis, and Lucan the butler, Sir Uwain, Sir Galahad Lionel, and Galliodin. So these ten noble knights departed from the court of King Arthur, and so they rode upon their quest together, until they came to a cross where departed four ways, and there departed the fellowship in four, to seek Sir Tristram. And as Sir Lancelot rode by adventure, he met with Dame Bragwaine, that was sent into that country to seek Sir Tristram, and she fled as fast as her palfrey might go. So Sir Lancelot met with her, and asked her why she fled. Ah, fair knight, said Dame Bragwaine, I flee for dread of my life. For here followeth me Sir Bruce sans pitié to slay me. Hold you nigh me, said Sir Launcelot. Then when Sir Launcelot saw Sir Bruce sans pitié, Sir Launcelot cried unto him and said, False knight, destroyer of ladies and damsels, now thy last days be come. When Sir Bruce sans pitié saw Sir Launcelot's shield, he knew it well, for at that time he bare not the arms of Cornwall, but he bare his own shield. And then Sir Bruce fled, and Sir Launcelot followed after him. 
But Sir Bruce was so well horsed, that when him list to flee, he might well flee, and also abide when him list. And then Sir Launcelot returned unto Dame Bregwain, and she thanked him of his great labor. Chapter 37 Now will we speak of Sir Lucan the butler, that by fortune he came riding to the same place thereas was Sir Tristram, and in he came in none other intent but to ask harbor. Then the porter asked what was his name. Tell your lord that my name is Sir Lucan the butler, a knight of the round table. So the porter went unto Sir Darras, lord of the place, and told him who was there to ask harbor. Nay, nay, said Sir Danham, that was nephew to Sir Darras. Say him that he shall not be lodged here, but let him wit that I, Sir Danham, will meet with him anon, and bid him make him ready. So Sir Danham came forth on horseback, and there they met together with spears. And Sir Lucan smote down Sir Danaim over his horse's croup. And then he fled into that place, and Sir Lucan rode after him, and asked after him many times. Then Sir Dinadan said to Sir Tristram, It is shame to see the lord's cousin of this place defoiled. Abide, said Sir Tristram, and I shall redress it. And in the meanwhile Sir Dinadan was on horseback, and he jousted with Lucan the butler, and there Sir Lucan smote Dinadan through the thick of the thigh, and so he rode his way. And Sir Tristram was wroth that Sir Dinadan was hurt, and followed after, and thought to avenge him. And within a while he overtook Sir Lucan, and bade him turn. And so they met together, so that Sir Tristram hurt Sir Lucan passing sore, and gave him a fall. With that came Sir Uwain, a gentle knight, and when he saw Sir Lucan so hurt, he called Sir Tristram to joust with him. Fair knight, said Sir Tristram, tell me your name, I require you. Sir knight, wit ye well, my name is Sir Uwain, le fils de Roy Uraine. Ah, said Sir Tristram, by my will I would not have ado with you at no time. Ye shall not so, said Sir Uwain, but ye shall have ado with me. And then Sir Tristram saw none other boat, but rode against him, and overthrew Sir Uwain, and hurt him in the side. And so he departed unto his lodging again. And when Sir Dinadan understood that Sir Tristram had hurt Sir Lucan, he would have ridden after Sir Lucan for to have slain him, but Sir Tristram would not suffer him. Then Sir Uwain let ordain an horse litter, and brought Sir Lucan to the Abbey of Ganis, and the castle thereby hight the castle of Ganis, of the which Sir Blorbis was lord. And at that castle Sir Launcelot promised all his fellows to meet in the quest of Sir Tristram. So when Sir Tristram was come to his lodging, there came a damsel that told Sir Darras that three of his sons were slain at that tournament, and two grievously wounded, that they were never like to help themselves. And all this was done by a noble knight that bare the black shield, and that was he that bare the prize. Then came there one, and told Sir Darras that the same knight was within, him that bare the black shield. Then Sir Darras yede unto Sir Tristram's chamber, and there he found his shield, and showed it to the damsel. Ah, sir, said the damsel, that same is he that slew your three sons. Then without any tarrying, Sir Darras put Sir Tristram and Sir Palamides, and Sir Dinadan within a strong prison, and there Sir Tristram was like to have died of great sickness, and every day Sir Palamides would reprove Sir Tristram of old hate betwixt them. And even Sir Tristram spake fair and said little, but when Sir Palamides saw the falling of sickness of Sir Tristram, then was he heavy for him, and comforted him in all the best wise he could. And as the French book saith, there came forty knights to Sir Darras that were of his own kin, and they would have slain Sir Tristram and his two fellows, but Sir Darras would not suffer that, but kept them in prison, and meat and drink they had. So Sir Tristram endured their great pain, for sickness had undertaken him, and that is the greatest pain a prisoner may have. For all the while a prisoner may have his health of body, he may endure under the mercy of God and in hope of good deliverance, but when sickness toucheth a prisoner's body, then may a prisoner say all wealth is him bereft, and then he hath cause to wail and to weep. Right so did Sir Tristram when sickness had undertaken him, for then he took such sorrow, 
that he had almost slain himself. Chapter 38 Now will we speak and leave Sir Tristram, Sir Palamides, and Sir Dinadan in prison, and speak we of other knights that sought after Sir Tristram many diverse parts of this land, and some yed into Cornwall, and by adventure Sir Gaheris, nephew unto King Arthur, came unto King Mark, and there he was well received, and sat at King Mark's own table, and ate of his own mess. Then King Mark asked Sir Gaheris what tidings there were in the realm of Logris. Sir, said Sir Gaheris, the king reigneth as a noble knight, and now but late there was a great jousts and tournament as ever I saw any in the realm of Logris. And the most noble knights were at that jousts, but there was one knight that did marvellously three days, and he bare a black shield, and of all knights that ever I saw he proved the best knight. Then, said King Mark, that was Sir Launcelot or Sir Palomides the Paynim. Not so, said Sir Gaheris, for both Sir Launcelot and Sir Palomides were on the contrary party against the knight with the black shield. Then it was Sir Tristram, said the king. Yea, said Sir Gaheris, and therewithal the king smote down his head, and in his heart he feared sore that Sir Tristram should get him such worship in the realm of Logris, where through that he himself should not be able to withstand him. Thus Sir Gaheris had great cheer with King Mark, and with Queen Labil Isud, the which was glad of Sir Gaheris' words, for well she wist by his deeds and manners that it was Sir Tristram. And then the king made a feast royal, and to that feast came Sir Uwain, le fils de Roy Urene, and some called him Uwain le Blanchemain. And this Sir Uwain challenged all the knights of Cornwall. Then was the king wood wroth that he had no knights to answer him. Then Sir Andred, nephew unto King Mark, leapt up and said, I will encounter with Sir Uwain. Then he yed and armed him and horsed him in the best manner. And there Sir Uwain met with Sir Andred and smote him down that he swooned on the earth. Then was King Mark sorry, and wroth out of measure, that he had no knight to revenge his nephew, Sir Andred. So the king called unto him Sir Dinis, the seneschal, and prayed him for his sake to take upon him to joust with Sir Uwain. Sir, said Sir Dinis, I am full loath to have ado with any knight of the round table. Yet, said the king, for my love take upon thee to joust. So Sir Dinis made him ready, and anon they encountered together with great spears, but Sir Dinis was overthrown horse and man a great fall, who was wroth but King Mark. Alas, he said, have I no knight that will encounter with yonder knight? Sir, said Sir Gaheris, for your sake I will joust. So Sir Gaheris made him ready, and when he was armed, he rode into the field. And when Sir Uwain saw Sir Gaheris' shield, he rode to him and said, Sir, ye do not your part, for, sir, the first time ye were made knight of the round table, ye swear that you should not have ado with your fellowship wittingly. And pardy, Sir Gaheris, ye knew me well enough by my shield, and so do I know you by your shield, and though ye would break your oath, I would not break mine, for there is not one here, nor ye, that shall think I am afeard of you, but I durst right well have ado with you, and yet we be sisters' sons. Then was Sir Gaheris ashamed, and so therewithal every knight went their way, and Sir Uwain rode into the country. Then King Mark armed him and took his horse and his spear with a squire with him, and then he rode afore Sir Uwain, and suddenly at a gap he ran upon him as he that was not ware of him, and there he smote him almost through the body, and there left him. So within a while there came Sir Kay and found Sir Uwain, and asked him how he was hurt. I wot not, said Sir Uwain, why nor wherefore, but by treason I am sure I got this hurt. For here came a knight suddenly upon me, or that I was ware and suddenly hurt me. Then there was come Sir Andred to seek King Mark, Thou traitor knight, said Sir Kay, 
and I wist it were thou that thus traitorly hast hurt this noble knight, thou shouldst never pass my hands. Sir, said Sir Andred, I did never hurt him, and that I will report me to himself. Fie on you, false knight, said Sir Kay, for ye of Cornwall are not worth. So Sir Kay made carry Sir Uwaine to the Abbey of the Black Cross, and there he was healed. And then Sir Gaheris took his leave of King Mark, but, or he departed, he said, Sir King, ye did a foul shame unto you and your court, when ye banished Sir Tristram out of this country, for ye needed not to have doubted no knight, and he had been here. And so he departed. Chapter 39 Then there came Sir Kay the Seneschal unto King Mark, and there he had good cheer showing outward, now, fair lords, said he, will ye prove any adventure in the forest of Morris, in the which I know well is as hard an adventure as I know any? Sir, said Sir Kay, I will prove it. And Sir Gaheris said he would be advised, for King Mark was ever full of treason, and therewithal Sir Gaheris departed and rode his way, and by the same way that Sir Kay should ride he laid him down to rest, charging his squire to wait upon Sir Kay, and warn me when he cometh. So within a while Sir Kay came riding that way, and then Sir Gaheris took his horse, and met him, and said, Sir Kay, ye are not wise to ride at the request of King Mark, for he dealeth all with treason. Then said Sir Kay, I require you let us prove this adventure. I shall not fail you, said Sir Gaheris. And so they rode that time till a lake that was that time called the Perilous Lake, and there they abode under the shaw of the wood. The meanwhile, King Mark, within the castle of Tintagel, avoided all his barons, and all other, save such as were privy with him, were avoided out of his chamber. And then he let call his nephew Sir Andred, and bade arm him and horse him lightly, and by that time it was midnight. And so King Mark was armed in black, horse and all, and so at a privy postern, they two issued out with their varlets with them, and rode till they came to that lake. Then Sir Kay espied them first, and gat his spear, and proffered to joust. And King Mark rode against him, and smote each other full hard, for the moon shone as the bright day. And there at that jousts Sir Kay's horse fell down, for his horse was not so big as the king's horse, and Sir Kay's horse bruised him full sore. Then Sir Gaheris was wroth that Sir Kay had a fall. Then he cried, Knight, sit thou fast in thy saddle, for I will revenge my fellow. Then King Mark was afeard of Sir Gaheris. And so with evil will King Mark rode against him, and Sir Gaheris gave him such a stroke that he fell down. So then for withal Sir Gaheris ran unto Sir Andred, and smote him from his horse quite, that his helm smote in the earth, and nigh had broken his neck. And there with all Sir Gaheris alighted and gat up Sir Kay, and then they yode both on foot to them, and bade them yield them, and tell their names, other they should die. Then with great pain Sir Andred spake first and said, It is King Mark of Cornwall. Therefore be ye ware what ye do, and I am Sir Andred his cousin. Fie on you both, said Sir Gaheris, for a false traitor and false treason hast thou wrought, and he both under the feigned cheer that ye made us. It were pity, said Sir Gaheris, that thou shouldst live any longer. Save my life, said King Mark, and I will make amends and consider that I am a king anointed. It were more the shame, said Sir Gaheris, to save thy life. Thou art a king anointed with cream, and therefore thou shouldst hold with all men of worship, and therefore thou art worthy to die. With that he lashed at King Mark without saying any more, and covered him with his shield, and defended him as he might. And then Sir Kay lashed at Sir Andred, and therewithal King Mark yielded him unto Sir Gaheris, and then he kneeled adown and made his oath upon the cross of the sword, that never while he lived he would be against errant knights. And also he sware to be good friend unto Sir Tristram, 
if ever he came into Cornwall. By then Sir Andred was on the earth, and Sir Kay would have slain him. Let be, said Sir Gaheris. Slay him not, I pray you. It were a pity, said Sir Kay, that he should live any longer, for this is nigh cousin unto Sir Tristram, and ever he hath been a traitor unto him, and by him he was exiled out of Cornwall, and therefore I will slay him, said Sir Kay. Ye shall not, said Sir Gaheris. Sith and I have given the king his life, I pray you give him his life, and therewithal Sir Kay let him go. And so Sir Kay and Sir Gaheris rode their way unto Dinas the seneschal, for because they heard say that he loved well Sir Tristram, so they reposed them there, and soon after they rode under the realm of Logris. And so within a little while they met with Sir Launcelot, that always had Dame Bragwaine with him. To that intent he weened to have met the sooner with Sir Tristram, and Sir Launcelot asked what tidings in Cornwall, and whether they heard of Sir Tristram or not. Sir Kay and Sir Gaheris answered and said that they heard not of him. Then they told Sir Launcelot word by word of their adventure. Then Sir Launcelot smiled and said, <laughs> Hard it is to take out of the flesh that is bred in the bone, and so made them merry together. End of Book 9, Chapters 36 to 39 Recording by Tamaro from Godbox Cafe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tamaril from GodboxCafe.com Le Mort d'Arthur, Volume 1, by Sir Thomas Mallory, Book 9, Chapters 40 to 44. Now leave we off this tale, and speak we of Sir Dinis, that had within the castle a paramour, and she loved another knight better than him. And so when Sir Dinis went out a-hunting, she slipped down by a towel, and took with her two brackets. And so she yede to the knight that she loved, and he her again. And when Sir Dinis came home and missed his paramour and his brackets, then was he the more rother for his brackets than for the lady. So then he rode after the knight that had his paramour, and bade him turn and joust. So Sir Dinis smote him down, that with the fall he brake his leg and his arm, and then his lady and paramour cried, Sir Dinis, mercy! and said she would love him better than ever she did. Nay, said Sir Dinis, I shall never trust them that once betrayed me, and therefore, as ye have begun, so end, for I will never meddle with you. And so Sir Dinis departed, and took his brackets with him, and so rode to his castle. Now will we turn unto Sir Launcelot, that was right heavy that he could never hear no tidings of Sir Tristram, for all this while he was in prison with Sir Darius, Palomides, and Dinadin. Then Dame Bragwaine took her leave to go into Cornwall, and Sir Launcelot, Sir Kay, and Sir Gaheris rode to see Sir Tristram in the country of Sir Luce. Now speaketh this tale of Sir Tristram and of his two fellows, for every day Sir Palomides brawled and said language against Sir Tristram. I marvel, said Sir Dinadin, of thee, Sir Palamedes, and thou hadst Sir Tristram here, thou wouldst do no harm, for an a wolf and a sheep were together in a prison, the wolf would suffer the sheep to be in peace. And wit thou well, said Sir Dinadin, the sheep to be in peace. And wit thou well, said Sir Dinadin, this same is Sir Tristram at a word, and now must do thy best with him, and let see now if ye can skift it with your hands. Then was Sir Palamides abashed, and said little. Sir Palamides, then said Sir Tristram, I have heard much of your maugre against me, but I will not meddle with you, as at this time by my will, because I dread the lord of this place that hath us in governance. For an I dread him not more than I do thee, soon it should be skift. So they peaced themselves. Right so came in a damsel, and said, Knights! 
be of good cheer, for ye are sure of your lives, and that I heard say my lord Sir Darius. Then were they glad all three, for daily they weened they should have died. Then soon after this Sir Tristram fell sick that he weened to have died. Then Sir Dinadan wept, and so did Sir Palamides under them both making great sorrow. So a damsel came in to them and found them mourning. Then she went unto Sir Darius and told him how that mighty knight that bare the black shield was likely to die. That shall not be, said Sir Darius, for God defend when knights come to me for succor, that I should suffer them to die within my prison. Therefore, said Sir Darius to the damsel, fetch that knight and his fellows afore me. And then anon Sir Darius saw Sir Tristram brought afore him. He said, Sir Knight, me repenteth of thy sickness, for thou art called a full noble knight, and so it seemeth by thee. And wit ye well, it shall never be said, that Sir Darius shall destroy such a noble knight as thou art in prison. How be it that thou hast slain three of my sons, whereby I was greatly aggrieved? But now shalt thou go and thy fellows, and your harness and horses have been fair and clean kept, and ye shall go where it liketh you, upon this covenant that thou, knight, wilt promise me to be good friend to my sons too that be now alive, and also that thou tell me thy name. Sir, said he, as for me, my name is Sir Tristram de Leones, and in Cornwall was I born, and nephew I am unto King Mark. And as for the death of your sons, I might not do with all, for an they had been the next kin that I have, I might have done none otherwise. And if I had slain them by treason or treachery, I had been worthy to have died. All this I consider, said Sir Darius, that all that ye did was by force of knighthood, and that was the cause I would not put you to death. But sith ye be, Sir Tristram, the good knight, I pray you heartily to be my good friend and to my sons. Sir, said Sir Tristram, I promise you by the faith of my body, ever while I live I will do your service, for ye have done to us but as a natural knight ought to do. Then Sir Tristram reposed him there till that he was amended of his sickness, and when he was big and strong, they took their leave, and every knight took their horses, and so departed, and rode together till they came to a crossway. Now, fellows, said Sir Tristram, here will we depart in sundry ways. And because Sir Dinadan had the first adventure, of him I will begin. Chapter 41 So as Sir Dinadan rode by a well, he found a lady making great dole. What aileth you? said Sir Dinadan. Sir Knight, said the lady, I am the woefulest lady of the world. For within these five days, here came a knight called Sir Bruce Saint Pite, and he slew mine own brother. And ever since he hath kept me at his own will, and of all men in the world I hate him most, and therefore I require you of knighthood to avenge me, for he will not tarry, but be here anon. Let him come, said Sir Dinadan, and because of honor of all women, I will do my part. With this came Sir Bruce, and when he saw a knight with his lady, he was wood wroth. And then he said, Sir knight, keep thee from me. So they hurtled together as thunder, and either smote other passing sore. But Sir Dinadan put him through the shoulder a grievous wound, and or even Sir Dinadan might turn him, Sir Bruce was gone and fled. Then the lady prayed him to bring her to a castle there beside but four mile fence. And so Sir Dinadan brought her there, and she was welcome, for the lord of that castle was her uncle, and so Sir Dinadan rode his way upon his adventure. Now turn we this tale unto Sir Tristram, that by adventure he came to a castle to ask lodging, wherein was Queen Morgan le Fay. And so when Sir Tristram was let into that castle he had good cheer all that night. And upon the morn, when he would have departed, the queen said, Wit ye well ye shall not depart lightly, for ye are here as a prisoner. Jesu defend, said Sir Tristram, for I was but late a prisoner. Fair knight, said the queen, ye shall abide with me till that I wit what ye are and from whence ye come. And ever the queen would set Sir Tristram on her own side 
and her paramour on the other side. And ever Queen Morgan would behold Sir Tristram, and thereat the knight was jealous, and was in will suddenly to have run upon Sir Tristram with a sword, but he left it for shame. Then the queen said to Sir Tristram, Tell me thy name, and I shall suffer you to depart when ye will. Upon that covenant, I tell you my name is Sir Tristram de Leonis. Ah, said Morgan le Fay, and I had wist that. Thou shouldst not have departed so soon as thou shalt, but sithen, I have made a promise I will hold it. With that thou wilt promise me to bear upon thee a shield that I shall deliver thee under the castle of the hard rock, where King Arthur had cried a great tournament. And there I pray you that ye will be, and to do for me as much needs of arms as ye may do. For at the castle of maidens, Sir Tristram, ye did marvellous deeds of arms as ever I heard knight do. Madam, said Sir Tristram, let me see the shield that I shall bear. Then the shield was brought forth, and the field was goldish, with a king and a queen therein painted, and a knight standing above them, one foot upon the king's head and the other upon the queen's. Madam, said Sir Tristram, this is a fair shield and a mighty, but what signifieth this king and this queen and the knights standing upon both their heads? I shall tell you, said Morgan le Fay. It signifieth King Arthur and Queen Guinevere and a knight who holdeth them both in bondage and in servage. Who is that knight? said Sir Tristram. That shall ye not wit at this time, said the queen. But as the French book saith, Queen Morgan loved Sir Launcelot best, and ever she desired him, and he would never love her nor do nothing at her request, and therefore she held many knights together for to have taken him by strength. And because she deemed that Sir Launcelot loved Queen Guinevere paramour, and she him again, therefore Queen Morgan le Fay ordained that shield to put Sir Launcelot to a rebuke, to that intent that King Arthur might understand the love between them. Then Sir Tristram took that shield and promised her to bear it at the tournament at the castle of the Hard Rock. But Sir Tristram knew not that that shield was ordained against Sir Launcelot, but afterward he knew it. Chapter 42 so then Sir Tristram took his leave of the queen and took the shield with him. Then came the knight that held Queen Morgan le Fay. His name was Sir Hemison, and he made him ready to follow Sir Tristram. Fair friend, said Morgan, ride not after that knight, for ye shall not win no worship of him. Fie on him, coward, said Sir Hemison, for I wist never good knight come out of Cornwall but if it were Sir Tristram de Leona's. What an that be he, said she. Nay, <laughs> nay, said he. He's with La Belle Isoud, and this is but a daffish knight. Alas, my fair friend, ye shall find him the best knight that ever ye met withal, for I know him better than ye do. For your sake, said Sir Hemison, I shall slay him. Ah, fair friend, said the queen. Me repenteth that ye will follow that knight, for I fear me sore of your again coming. With this, this knight rode his way wood wroth, and he rode after Sir Tristram as fast as he had been chased with knights. When Sir Tristram heard a knight come after him so fast, he returned about, and saw a knight come against him. And when he came nigh to Sir Tristram, he cried on high, Sir Knight, keep thee from me. Then they rushed together as it had been thunder, and Sir Hemison brised his spear upon Sir Tristram, but his harness was so good that he might not hurt him, and Sir Tristram smote him harder and bare him through the body, and he fell over his horse's croup. Then Sir Tristram turned to have done more with his sword, but he saw so much blood go from him that him seemed he was likely to die, and so he departed from him, and came to a fair manor to an old knight. And there Sir Tristram lodged. Chapter 43 Now leave to speak of Sir Tristram, and speak we of the knight that was wounded to the death. Then his varlet alighted, and took off his helm, and then he asked his lord whether there were any life in him. There is in me life, said the knight, but 
but it is but little. And therefore, leap thou up behind me when thou hast hold me up, and hold me fast that I fall not, and bring me to Queen Morgan Le Fay, for deep draughts of death draw to my heart that I may not live, for I would fain speak with her or I die, for else my soul will be in great peril and I die. Forthwith, with great pain, his varlet brought him to the castle, and there Sir Hemison fell down dead. When Morgan Le Fay saw him dead, she made great sorrow out of reason, and then she let despoil him unto his shirt, and so she let him put into a tomb. And about the tomb she let write, Here lieth Sir Hemison, slain by the hands of Sir Tristram de Leones. Now turn we unto Sir Tristram, that asked the knight his host if he saw late any knights adventurous. Sir, he said, the last night here lodged with me Hector de Maris, and a damsel with him, and that damsel told me that he was one of the best knights of the world. That's not so, said Sir Tristram, for I know four better knights of his own blood, and the first is Sir Launcelot du Lac, call him the best knight, and Sir Bors de Ganis, Sir Bleoberis, Sir Blamor de Ganis, and Sir Gaheris. Nay, said his host, Sir Gawain is a better knight than he. This is not so, said Sir Tristram, for I have met with them both, and I felt Sir Gaheris for the better knight, and Sir Lamorak I call him as good as any of them except Sir Launcelot. Why name ye not Sir Tristram, said his host, for I account him as good as any of them. I know not, Sir Tristram, said Sir Tristram. Thus they talked and boarded as long as them list, and then went to rest, and on the morn Sir Tristram departed, and took his leave of his host, and rode toward the Roche d'Our. And none adventure had Sir Tristram but that, and so he rested not till he came to the castle, where he saw five hundred tents. Chapter 44 Then the king of Scots and the king of Ireland held against King Arthur's knights, and there began a great medley. So came in Sir Tristram and did marvellous deeds of arms, for there he smote down many knights. And ever he was afore King Arthur with that shield. And when King Arthur saw that shield, he marveled greatly in what intent it was made. But Queen Guinevere deemed as it was, wherefore she was heavy. Then was there a damsel of Queen Morgan in a chamber by King Arthur. And when she heard King Arthur speak of that shield, then she spake openly unto King Arthur. Sir King, wit ye well this shield was ordained for you, to warn you of your shame and dishonor, and that longeth to you and your queen. And then anon that damsel picked her away privily, that no man wist where she was become. Then was King Arthur sad and wroth, and asked from whence came that damsel. There was not one that knew her nor wist where she was become. Then Queen Guinevere called to her Sir Ector de Maris, and there she made her complaint to him and said, I wot well this shield was made by Morgan le Fay in despite of me and of Sir Launcelot, wherefore I dread me sore lest I should be destroyed. And ever the king beheld Sir Tristram, that did so marvellous deeds of arms that he wondered sore what knight he might be, and well he wist it was not Sir Launcelot, and it was told him that Sir Tristram was in Petit Britain with Isoude la Blanchemain, for he deemed, as he had been in the realm of Logris, Sir Launcelot or some of his fellows that were in the quest of Sir Tristram, that they should have found him or that time. So King Arthur had marvel what knight he might be, and ever Sir Arthur's eye was on that shield. All that espied the queen, and that made her sore afeard. Then ever Sir Tristram smote down knights wonderly to behold, what upon the right hand and upon the left hand, that uneth no knight might withstand him. And the king of Scots and the king of Ireland began to withdraw them. When Arthur espied that, he thought that that knight with the strange shield should not escape him. Then he called unto him Sir Uwain le Blanchemin, and bade him arm him and make him ready. So anon King Arthur and Sir Uwain dressed them before Sir Tristram, and required him to tell them where he had that shield. Sir, he said, I had it of Queen Morgan le Fay, sister unto King Arthur. 
So here endeth this history of this book, for it is the first book of Sir Tristram de Leonis, and the second book of Sir Tristram followeth. End of Book 9, Chapters 40 to 44. End of Le Mort d'Arthur, Volume 1, by Sir Thomas Mallory. Recording by Tamaril from GodboxCafe.com.